Chapter One, Part One of the Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter One. How Tom Brangwen married a Polish lady. Part One. The Brangwens had lived for generations on the marsh farm, in the meadows where the air wash twisted sluggishly through alder trees, separating Derbyshire from Nottinghamshire. Two miles away a church tower stood on a hill, the houses of the little country town climbing assiduously up to it. Whenever one of the Brangwens in the fields lifted his head from his work, he saw the church tower at Ilkeston in the empty sky, so that, as he turned again to the horizontal land, he was aware of something standing above him and beyond him in the distance. There was a look in the eyes of the Brangwens, as if they were expecting something unknown, about which they were eager. They had that air of readiness for what would come to them, a kind of surety, an expectancy, the look of an inheritor. They were fresh, blonde, slow-speaking people, revealing themselves plainly but slowly, so that one could watch the change in their eyes from laughter to anger, blue, lit-up laughter to a hard, blue-staring anger, through all the irresolute stages of the sky when the weather is changing. Living on rich land, on their own land, near to a growing town, they had forgotten what it was to be in straitened circumstances. They had never become rich, because there were always children, and the patrimony was divided every time, but always at the marsh there was ample. So the Brangwens came and went without fear of necessity, working hard because of the life that was in them, not for want of the money. Neither were they thriftless. They were aware of the last half-penny, and instinct made them not waste the peeling of their apple, for it would help to feed the cattle. But heaven and earth was teeming around them, and how should this cease? They felt the rush of the sap in spring, they knew the wave which cannot halt, but every year throws forward the seed to begetting, and falling back leaves the young born on the earth. They knew the intercourse between heaven and earth sunshine drawn into the breast and bowels, the rain sucked up in the daytime, nakedness that comes under the wind in autumn, showing the birds' nests no longer worth hiding. Their life and interrelations were such, feeling the pulse and body of the soil that opened to their furrow for the grain, and became smooth and supple after their ploughing, and clung to their feet with a weight that pulled like desire, lying hard and unresponsive when the crops were to be shorn away. The young corn waved and was silken, and the luster slid along the limbs of the men who saw it. They took the udder of the cows, the cows yielded milk, and pulse against the hands of the men. The pulse of the blood of the teats of the cows beat into the pulse of the hands of the men. They mounted their horses and held life between the grip of their knees, they harnessed their horses at the wagon, and with hand on the bridle rings drew the heaving of the horses after their will. In autumn the partridges whirred up. Birds in flocks blew like spray across the fallow. Rooks appeared on the gray, watery heavens and flew cawing into the winter. Then the men sat by the fire in the house where the women moved about with surety, and the limbs and the body of the men were impregnated with the day, cattle and earth and vegetation and the sky. The men sat by the fire, and their brains were inert, as their blood flowed heavy with the accumulation from the living day. The women were different. On them, too, was the drowse of blood intimacy— calves sucking and hens running together in droves and young geese palpitating in the hand while the food was pushed down their throttle. But the women looked out from the heated, blind intercourse of farm life to the spoken world beyond. They were aware of the lips and the mind of the world speaking and giving utterance. They heard the sound in the distance, and they strained to listen. It was enough for the men that the earth heaved and opened its furrow to them, 
that the wind blew to dry the wet wheat, and set the young ears of corn wheeling freshly round about. It was enough that they helped the cow in labour, or ferreted the rats from under the barn, or broke the back of a rabbit with a sharp knock of the hand. So much warmth and generating and pain and death did they know in their blood, earth and sky and beast and green plants, so much exchange and interchange they had with these, that they lived full and surcharged, their senses full fed, their faces always turned to the heat of the blood, staring into the sun, dazed with looking towards the source of generation, unable to turn round. But the woman wanted another form of life than this, something that was not blood intimacy. Her house faced out from the farm buildings and fields, looked out to the road and the village with church and hall and the world beyond. She stood to see the far-off world of cities and governments, and the active scope of man, the magic land to her, where secrets were made known and desires fulfilled. She faced outwards to where men moved dominant and creative, having turned their back on the pulsing heat of creation, and with this behind them were set out to discover what was beyond, to enlarge their own scope and range and freedom, whereas the Brangwen men faced inwards to the teeming life of creation, which poured unresolved into their veins. Looking out, as she must, from the front of her house towards the activity of man in the world at large, whilst her husband looked out to the back at sky and harvest and beast and land, she strained her eyes to see what man had done in fighting outwards to knowledge. She strained to hear how he uttered himself in his conquest. Her deepest desire hung on the battle that she heard, far off, being waged on the edge of the unknown. She also wanted to know, and to be of the fighting host. At home, even so near as Cassette, was the vicar who spoke the other magic language, and had the other finer bearing, both of which she could perceive, but could never attain to. The vicar moved in worlds beyond where her own menfolk existed. Did she not know her own menfolk? Fresh, slow, full-built men, masterful enough, but easy, native to the earth, lacking outwardness and range of motion. Whereas the vicar, dark and dry and small beside her husband, had yet a quickness and a range of being that made Brangwen, in his large geniality, seem dull and local. She knew her husband, but in the vicar's nature was that which passed beyond her knowledge. As Brangwen had power over the cattle, so the vicar had power over her husband. What was it in the vicar that raised him above the common men, as man is raised above the beast? She craved to know, she craved to achieve this higher being, if not in herself, then in her children. That which makes a man strong, even if he be little and frail in body, just as any man is little and frail beside a bull, and yet stronger than the bull, what was it? It was not money, nor power, nor position. What power had the vicar over Tom Brangwen? None. Yet stripped them and set them on a desert island, and the vicar was the master. His soul was master of the other man's. And why? Why? She decided it was a question of knowledge. The curate was poor enough, and not very efficacious as a man, either. Yet he took rank with those others, the superior. She watched his children being born. She saw them running as tiny things beside their mother, and already they were separate from her own children, distinct. Why were her own children marked below the others? Why should the curate's children inevitably take precedence over her children? Why should dominance be given them from the start? It was not money, nor even class. It was education and experience, she decided. It was this— this education, this higher form of being, that the mother wished to give to her children, so that they, too, could live the supreme life on earth. For her children, at least the children of her heart, had the complete nature that should take place in equality with the living, vital people in the land, not be left behind, obscure among the laborers. Why must they remain obscured and stifled all their lives? Why should they suffer from lack of freedom to move? 
How should they learn the entry into the finer, more vivid circle of life? Her imagination was fired by the squire's lady at Shelley Hall, who came to church at Cosset Hay with her little children, girls in tidy capes of beaver fur and smart little hats, herself like a winter rose, so fair and delicate, so fair, so fine in mould, so luminous. What was it that Mrs. Hardy felt which she, Mrs. Brangwen, did not feel? How was Mrs. Hardy's nature different from that of the common women of Cosset Hay? In what was it beyond them? All the women of Cossette talked eagerly about Mrs. Hardy, of her husband, her children, her guests, her dress, of her servants and her housekeeping. The lady of the hall was the living dream of their lives. Her life was the epic that inspired their lives. In her they lived imaginatively, and in gossiping of her husband who drank, of her scandalous brother, of Lord William Bentley, her friend, member of Parliament for the division, they had their own odyssey enacting itself. Penelope and Ulysses before them, and Circe and the swine and the endless web. So the women of the village were fortunate. They saw themselves in the lady of the manor. Each of them lived her own fulfillment of the life of Mrs. Hardy, and the Brangwen wife of the marsh aspired beyond herself, towards the further life of the finer woman towards the extended being she revealed, as a traveller, in his self-contained manner reveals far-off countries present in himself. But why should a knowledge of far-off countries make a man's life a different thing, finer, bigger? And why is a man more than the beast and the cattle that serve him? It is the same thing. The male part of the poem was filled in by such men as the vicar and Lord William, lean, eager men with strange movements, men who had command of the further fields, whose lives ranged over a great extent. Ah, it was something very desirable to know, this touch of the wonderful men who had the power of thought and comprehension. The women of the village might be much fonder of Tom Brangwen, and more at their ease with him. Yet, if their lives had been robbed of the vicar and of Lord William, the leading shoot would have been cut away from them. They would have been heavy and uninspired and inclined to hate. So long as the wonder of the beyond was before them, they could get along, whatever their lot. And Mrs. Hardy and the vicar and Lord William, these moved in the wonder of the beyond, and were visible to the eyes of Cassette in their motion. About 1840 a canal was constructed across the meadows of the Marsh Farm, connecting the newly opened collieries of the Airwash Valley. A high embankment travelled along the fields to carry the canal, which passed close to the homestead, and reaching the road went over in a heavy bridge. So the marsh was shut off from Ilkeston, and enclosed in the small valley bed which ended in a bushy hill in the village spire of Cossette. The Brangwens received a fair sum of money from this trespass across their land. Then, a short time afterwards, a colliery was sunk on the other side of the canal, and in a while the Midland Railway came down the valley at the foot of the Ilkston Hill, and the invasion was complete. The town grew rapidly. The Brangwens were kept busy producing supplies. They became richer. They were almost tradesmen. Still, the marsh remained remote and original on the old, quiet side of the canal embankment. In the sunny valley, where slow water wound along in company of stiff alders, and the road went under ash-trees past the Brangwen's garden gate. But looking from the garden gate down the road to the right, there, through the dark archway of the canal's square aqueduct, was a colliery spinning away in the near distance and further red crude houses plastered on the valley in masses, and beyond all the dim smoking hill of the town. The homestead was just on the safe side of civilization, outside the gate. The house stood bare from the road, approached by a straight garden path, along which at spring the daffodils were thick in green and yellow. At the sides of the house were bushes of lilac and Gulder Rose and Privet, entirely hiding the farm buildings behind. 
At the back a confusion of sheds spread into the home, close from out of two or three indistinct yards. The duck pond lay beyond the furthest wall, littering its white feathers on the padded earthen banks, blowing its stray soiled feathers into the grass and the gorse bushes below the canal embankment, which rose like a high rampart near at hand, so that occasionally a man's figure passed in silhouette, or a man and a towing horse traversed the sky. At first the Brangwens were astonished by all this commotion around them. The building of a canal across their land made them strangers in their own place. This raw bank of earth shutting them off disconcerted them. As they worked in the fields from beyond the now familiar embankment came the rhythmic run of the winding engines, startling at first, but afterwards a narcotic to the brain. Then the shrill whistle of the trains re-echoed through the heart with fearsome pleasure, announcing the far-off come near and imminent. As they drove home from town, the farmers of the land met the blackened colliers trooping from the pit-mouth. As they gathered the harvest, the west wind brought a faint sulphurous smell of pit-refuse burning. As they pulled the turnips in November, the sharp clink-clink-clink-clink-clink of empty trucks shunting on the line vibrated in their hearts with the fact of other activity going on beyond them. The Alfred Brangwen of this period had married a woman from Hienor, a daughter of the Black Horse. She was a slim, pretty, dark woman, quaint in her speech, whimsical so that the sharp things she said did not hurt. She was oddly a thing to herself, rather querulous in her manner, but intrinsically separate and indifferent, so that her long lamentable complaints, when she raised her voice against her husband in particular, and against everybody else after him, only made those who heard her wonder and feel affectionately towards her, even while they were irritated and impatient with her. She railed long and loud about her husband, but always with a balanced, easy-flying voice and a quaint manner of speech that warmed his belly with pride and male triumph while he scowled with mortification at the things she said. Consequently, Brangwen himself had a humorous puckering at the eyes, a sort of fat laugh, very quiet and full, and he was spoilt like a lord of creation. He calmly did as he liked, laughed at their railing, excused himself in a teasing tone that she loved, followed his natural inclinations, and sometimes, pricked too near the quick, frightened and broke her by a deep, tense fury which seemed to fix on him and hold him for days, and which she would give anything to placate in him. They were two very separate beings, vitally connected, knowing nothing of each other, yet living in their separate ways from one root. There were four sons and two daughters. The eldest boy ran away early to sea and did not come back. After this the mother was more the node and centre of attraction in the home. The second boy, Alfred, whom the mother admired most, was the most reserved. He was sent to school in Ilkeston and made some progress. But in spite of his dogged yearning effort he could not get beyond the rudiments of anything save of drawing. At this, in which he had some power, he worked as if it were his hope. After much grumbling and savage rebellion against everything, after much trying and shifting about, when his father was incensed against him and his mother almost despairing, he became a draughtsman in a lace factory in Nottingham. He remained heavy and somewhat uncouth, speaking with broad Derbyshire accent, adhering with all his tenacity to his work and to his town position, making good designs, and becoming fairly well off. But at drawing his hand swung naturally in big, bold lines, rather lax, so that it was cruel for him to ped Gill away at the lace designing, working from the tiny squares of his paper, counting and plotting and niggling. He did it stubbornly, with anguish, crushing the bowels within him, adhering to his chosen lot whatever it should cost, and he came back into life set and rigid, a rare-spoken, almost surly man. He married the daughter of a chemist, who affected some social superiority, and he became something of a snob in his dogged fashion, 
with a passion for outward refinement in the household, mad when anything clumsy or gross occurred. Later, when his three children were growing up, and he seemed a staid, almost middle-aged man, he turned after strange women, and became a silent, inscrutable follower of forbidden pleasure, neglecting his indignant bourgeois wife without a qualm. Frank, the third son, refused from the first to have anything to do with learning. From the first he hung round the slaughter-house, which stood away in the third yard at the back of the farm. The Brangwens had always killed their own meat, and supplied the neighbourhood. Out of this grew a regular butcher's business, in connection with the farm. As a child, Frank had been drawn by the trickle of dark blood that ran across the pavement from the slaughter-house to the crew-yard, by the sight of the man carrying across to the meat-shed a huge side of beef with the kidneys showing, embedded in their heavy laps of fat. He was a handsome lad, with soft brown hair and regular features, something like a later Roman youth. He was more easily excitable, more readily carried away than the rest, weaker in character. At eighteen he married a little factory girl, a pale, plump, quiet thing with sly eyes and a wheedling voice, who insinuated herself into him, and bore him a child every year, and made a fool of him. When he had taken over the butchery business, already a growing callousness to it, and a sort of contempt made him neglectful of it. He drank, and was often to be found in his public house, blathering away as if he knew everything, when in reality he was a noisy fool. Of the daughters, Alice the elder married a collier, and lived for a time stormily in Ilkeston, before moving away to Yorkshire with her numerous young family. Effie the younger remained at home. The last child, Tom, was considerably younger than his brothers, so had belonged rather to the company of his sisters. He was his mother's favourite. She roused herself to determination and sent him forcibly away to a grammar school in Derby when he was twelve years old. He did not want to go, and his father would have given way. But Mrs. Brangwen had set her heart on it. Her slender, pretty, tightly covered body with full skirts was now the centre of resolution in the house, and when she had once set upon anything, which was often, the family failed before her. So Tom went to school, an unwilling failure from the first. He believed his mother was right in decreeing school for him, but he knew she was only right because she would not acknowledge his constitution. He knew, with a child's deep instinctive foreknowledge of what is going to happen to him, that he would cut a sorry figure at school, but he took the infliction as inevitable, as if he were guilty of his own nature, as if his being were wrong, and his mother's conception right. If he could have been what he liked, he would have been that which his mother fondly but deludedly hoped he was. He would have been clever, and capable of becoming a gentleman. It was her aspiration for him. Therefore he knew it as the true aspiration for any boy. But you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear, as he told his mother very early with regard to himself, much to her mortification and chagrin. When he got to school he made a violent struggle against his physical inability to study. He sat gripped, making himself pale and ghastly in his effort to concentrate on the book, to take in what he had to learn but it was no good. If he beat down his first repulsion, and got like a suicide to the stuff, he went very little further. He could not learn deliberately. His mind simply did not work. In feeling he was developed, sensitive to the atmosphere around him, brutal perhaps, but at the same time delicate, very delicate. So he had a low opinion of himself. He knew his own limitation. He knew that his brain was a slow, hopeless, good-for-nothing, so he was humble. But at the same time his feelings were more discriminating than those of most of the boys, and he was confused. He was more sensuously developed, more refined in instinct than they. For their mechanical stupidity he hated them, and suffered cruel contempt for them. But when it came to mental things, then he was at a disadvantage. He was at their mercy. He was a fool. 
he had not the power to controvert even the most stupid argument, so that he was forced to admit things he did not in the least believe. And having admitted them, he did not know whether he believed them or not. He rather thought he did. But he loved any one who could convey enlightenment to him through feeling. He sat betrayed with emotion when the teacher of literature read, in a moving fashion, Tennyson's Ulysses, or Shelley's Ode to the West Wind. His lips parted, his eyes filled with a strained, almost suffering light, and the teacher read on, fired by his power over the boy. Tom Brangwen was moved by this experience beyond all calculation. He almost dreaded it. It was so deep. But when, almost secretly and shamefully, he came to take the book himself, and began the words, O wild west wind, thou breath of autumn's being, the very fact of the print caused a prickly sensation of repulsion to go over his skin. The blood came to his face, his heart filled with the bursting passion of rage and incompetence. He threw the book down and walked over it and went out to the cricket field. And he hated books as if they were his enemies. He hated them worse than ever he hated any person. He could not voluntarily control his attention. His mind had no fixed habits to go by. He had nothing to get hold of, nowhere to start from. For him there was nothing palpable, nothing known in himself that he could apply to learning. He did not know how to begin. Therefore he was helpless when it came to deliberate understanding or deliberate learning. He had an instinct for mathematics, but if this failed him he was helpless as an idiot, so that he felt that the ground was never sure under his feet. He was nowhere. His final downfall was his complete inability to attend to a question put without suggestion. If he had to write a formal composition on the army, he did at last learn to repeat the few facts he knew. You can join the army at eighteen. You have to be over five foot eight. But he had all the time a living conviction that this was a dodge, and that his commonplaces were beneath contempt. Then he reddened furiously, felt his bowels sink with shame, scratched out what he had written, made an agonized effort to think of something in the real composition style, failed, became sullen with rage and humiliation, put the pen down, and would have been torn to pieces rather than attempt to write another word. He soon got used to the grammar school, and the grammar school got used to him, setting him down as a hopeless duffer at learning, but respecting him for a generous, honest nature. Only one narrow, domineering fellow, the Latin master, bullied him, and made the blue eyes mad with shame and rage. There was a horrid scene when the boy laid open the master's head with a slate, and then things went on as before. The teacher got little sympathy, but Brangwen winced and could not bear to think of the deed, not even long after, when he was a grown man. He was glad to leave school. It had not been unpleasant. He had enjoyed the companionship of the other youths, or had thought he enjoyed it. The time had passed very quickly in endless activity, but he knew all the time that he was in an ignominious position, in this place of learning. He was aware of failure all the while, of incapacity. But he was too healthy and sanguine to be wretched. He was too much alive. Yet his soul was wretched almost to hopelessness. He had loved one warm, clever boy who was frail in body, a consumptive type. The two had had an almost classic friendship, David and Jonathan, wherein Brangwen was a Jonathan, the server. But he had never felt equal with his friend, because the other's mind outpaced his and left him ashamed, far in the rear. So the two boys went at once apart on leaving school, but Brangwen always remembered his friend that had been, kept him as a sort of light, a fine experience to remember. Tom Brangwen was glad to get back to the farm, where he was in his own again. "'I have got a turnip on my shoulders. Let me stick to the fallow,' he said to his exasperated mother. He had too low an opinion of himself, but he went about at his work on the farm gladly enough glad of the active labor and the smell of the land again, having youth and vigor and humor and a comic wit, 
having the will and the power to forget his own shortcomings, finding himself violent with occasional rages, but usually on good terms with everybody and everything. When he was seventeen, his father fell from a stack and broke his neck. Then the mother and son and daughter lived on at the farm, interrupted by occasional loud-mouthed, lamenting, jealous-spirited visitations from the butcher Frank, who had a grievance against the world, which he felt was always giving him less than his dues. Frank was particularly against the young Tom, whom he called a Marty baby, and Tom returned the hatred violently, his face growing red and his blue eyes staring. Effie sided with Tom against Frank, but when Alfred came from Nottingham, heavy-jowled and lowering, speaking very little but treating those at home with some contempt, Effie and the mother sided with him and put Tom into the shade. It irritated the youth that his elder brother should be made something of a hero by the women just because he didn't live at home and was a lace designer and almost a gentleman. But Alfred was something of a Prometheus bound, so the women loved him. Tom came later to understand his brother better. As youngest son, Tom felt some importance when the care of the farm devolved on to him. He was only eighteen, but he was quite capable of doing everything his father had done. And, of course, his mother remained as centre to the house. The young man grew up very fresh and alert, with zest for every moment of life. He worked and rode and drove to market. He went out with companions and got tipsy occasionally and played skittles and went to the little travelling theatres. Once, when he was drunk at a public house, he went upstairs with a prostitute who seduced him. He was then nineteen. The thing was something of a shock to him. In the close intimacy of the farm kitchen, the woman occupied the supreme position. The men deferred to her in the house, on all household points, on all points of morality and behavior. The woman was the symbol for that further life which comprised religion and love and morality. The men placed in her hands their own conscience. They said to her, Be my conscience-keeper, be the angel at the doorway guarding my outgoing and my incoming. And the woman fulfilled her trust. The men rested implicitly in her, receiving her praise or her blame with pleasure or with anger, rebelling and storming, but never for a moment really escaping in their own souls from her prerogative. They depended on her for their stability. Without her they would have felt like straws in the wind, to be blown hither and thither at random. She was the anchor and the security. She was the restraining hand of God, at times highly to be execrated. Now, when Tom Brangwen, at nineteen, a youth, fresh like a plant, rooted in his mother and his sister, found that he had lain with a prostitute woman in a common public-house, he was very much startled. For him there was, until that time, only one kind of woman, his mother and sister. But now? He did not know what to feel. There was a slight wonder, a pang of anger, of disappointment, a first taste of ash and of cold fear, lest this was all that would happen, lest his relations with woman were going to be no more than this nothingness. There was a slight sense of shame before the prostitute, fear that she would despise him for his inefficiency. There was a cold distaste for her, and a fear of her. There was a moment of paralyzed horror when he felt he might have taken a disease from her, and upon all this startled tumult of emotion was laid the steadying hand of common sense, which said it did not matter very much, so long as he had no disease. He soon recovered balance, and really it did not matter so very much. But it had shocked him, and put a mistrust into his heart, and emphasized his fear of what was within himself. He was, however, in a few days going about again in his own careless, happy-go-lucky fashion, his blue eyes just as clear and honest as ever, his face just as fresh, his appetite just as keen. Or apparently so. He had, in fact, lost some of his buoyant confidence, and doubt hindered his outgoing. End of Chapter 1, Part 1
Chapter One, Part Two of the Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter One, Part Two. For some time after this, he was quieter. "'more conscious when he drank, more backward from companionship. "'The disillusion of his first carnal contact with woman, "'strengthened by his innate desire to find in a woman "'the embodiment of all his inarticulate, powerful religious impulses, "'put a bit in his mouth. "'He had something to lose which he was afraid of losing, "'which he was not sure even of possessing. "'This first affair did not matter much, but the business of love was, at the bottom of his soul, the most serious and terrifying of all to him. He was tormented now with sex desire. His imagination reverted always to lustful scenes. But what really prevented his returning to a loose woman over and above the natural squeamishness was the recollection of the paucity of the last experience. It had been so nothing— so dribbling and functional that he was ashamed to expose himself to the risk of a repetition of it. He made a strong, instinctive fight to retain his native cheerfulness unimpaired. He had, naturally, a plentiful stream of life and humor, a sense of sufficiency and exuberance, giving ease, but now it tended to cause tension. A strained light came into his eyes. He had a slight knitting of the brows. His boisterous humor gave place to lowering silences, and days passed by in a sort of suspense. He did not know there was any difference in him, exactly. For the most part he was filled with slow anger and resentment. But he knew he was always thinking of women, or a woman, day in, day out, and that infuriated him. He could not get free, and he was ashamed. He had one or two sweethearts— starting with them in the hope of speedy development, but when he had a nice girl he found that he was incapable of pushing the desired development. The very presence of the girl beside him made it impossible. He could not think of her like that. He could not think of her actual nakedness. She was a girl, and he liked her, and dreaded violently even the thought of uncovering her. He knew that in these last issues of nakedness he did not exist to her nor she to him. Again, if he had a loose girl, and things began to develop, she offended him so deeply all the time that he never knew whether he was going to get away from her as quickly as possible, or whether he were going to take her out of inflamed necessity. Again, he learned his lesson. If he took her, it was a paucity which he was forced to despise. He did not despise himself nor the girl, but he despised the net result in him of the experience. He despised it deeply and bitterly. Then, when he was twenty-three, his mother died, and he was left at home with Effie. His mother's death was another blow out of the dark. He could not understand it. He knew it was no good his trying. One had to submit to these unforeseen blows that come unawares and leave a bruise that remains and hurts whenever it is touched. He began to be afraid of all that which was up against him. He had loved his mother. After this, Effie and he quarreled fiercely. They meant a very great deal to each other, but they were both under a strange, unnatural tension. He stayed out of the house as much as possible. He got a special corner for himself at the Red Lion at Cossete, and became a usual figure by the fire, a fresh, fair young fellow with heavy limbs and head held back, mostly silent, though alert and attentive, very hearty in his greeting of everybody he knew, shy of strangers. He teased all the women who liked him extremely, and he was very attentive to the talk of the men, very respectful. To drink made him quickly flush very red in the face, and brought out the look of self-consciousness and unsureness, almost bewilderment, in his blue eyes. When he came home in this state of tipsy confusion, his sister hated him and abused him, and he went off his head like a mad bull with rage. He had still another turn with a light o' love. One Whitsuntide he went a jaunt with two other young fellows on horseback, to Matlock and thence to Bakewell. Matlock was at that time just becoming a famous beauty spot, 
visited from Manchester and from the Staffordshire towns. In the hotel where the young men took lunch were two girls, and the party struck up a friendship. The miss who made up to Tom Brangwen, then twenty-four years old, was a handsome, reckless girl neglected for an afternoon by the man who had brought her out. She saw Brangwen and liked him, as all women did, for his warmth and his generous nature, and for the innate delicacy in him. But she saw he was one who would have to be brought to the scratch. However, she was roused and unsatisfied and made mischievous, so she dared anything. It would be an easy interlude restoring her pride. She was a handsome girl with a bosom and dark hair and blue eyes, a girl full of easy laughter, flushed from the sun, inclined to wipe her laughing face in a very natural and taking manner. Brangwen was in a state of wonder. He treated her with his chaffing deference, roused but very unsure of himself, afraid to death of being too forward, ashamed lest he might be thought backward, mad with desire, yet restrained by instinctive regard for women for making any definite approach, feeling all the while that his attitude was ridiculous, and flushing deep with confusion. She, however, became hard and daring as he became confused. It amused her to see him come on. "'When must you get back?' she asked. "'I'm not particular,' he said. There the conversation again broke down. Brangwen's companions were ready to go on. "'Art comin', Tom?' they called, or art for stoppin'? "'Eh, hey, I'm comin', he replied, rising reluctantly, an angry sense of futility and disappointment spreading over him. He met the full, almost taunting look of the girl, and he trembled with unusedness. "'Shall you come and have a look at my mare?' he said to her with his hearty kindliness that was now shaken with trepidation. "'Oh, I should like to,' she said, rising. And she followed him, his rather sloping shoulders, and his cloth riding gaiters out of the room. The young men got their own horses out of the stable. "'Can you ride?' Brandquin asked her. "'I should like to if I could. I have never tried,' she said. "'Come, then, and have a try,' he said. And he lifted her, he blushing, she laughing, into the saddle. "'I shall slip off. It's not a lady's saddle,' she cried. "'Hold your tight,' he said, and he led her out of the hotel gate. The girl sat very insecurely, clinging fast. He put a hand on her waist to support her, and he held her closely. He clasped her as in an embrace. He was weak with desire as he strode beside her. The horse walked by the river. "'You want to sit straddle-leg,' he said to her. "'I know I do,' she said. "'It was the time of very full skirts. "'She managed to get astride the horse quite decently, "'showing an intent concern for covering her pretty leg. "'It's a lot's better this road,' she said, looking down at him. "'Aye, it is,' he said, "'feeling the marrow melt in his bones from the look in her eyes. "'I don't know why they have that side-saddle business, "'twisting a woman in two. "'Should us leave you, then? You seem to be fixed up there,' called Brangwen's companions from the road. He went red with anger. "'Aye, don't worry,' he called back. "'How long are you stopping?' they asked. "'Not after Christmas,' he said, and the girl gave a tinkling peal of laughter. "'All right, bye-bye,' called his friends, and they cantered off, leaving him very flushed, trying to be quite normal with the girl." But presently he had gone back to the hotel and given his horse into the charge of an ostler, and had gone off with the girl into the woods, not quite knowing where he was or what he was doing. His heart thumped, and he thought it the most glorious adventure, and was mad with desire for the girl. Afterwards he glowed with pleasure. By Jove, but that was something like. He stayed the afternoon with the girl, and wanted to stay the night. She, however, told him this was impossible. Her own man would be back by dark, and she must be with him. He, Brangwen, must not let on that there had been anything between them. She gave him an intimate smile, which made him feel confused and gratified. He could not tear himself away, though he had promised not to interfere with the girl. He stayed on at the hotel overnight. He saw the other fellow at the evening meal— a small middle-aged man with iron-gray hair and a curious face like a monkey's, but interesting. 
in its way almost beautiful. Brangwen guessed that he was a foreigner. He was in company with another, an Englishman, dry and hard. The four sat at table, two men and two women. Brangwen watched with all his eyes. He saw how the foreigner treated the women with courteous contempt, as if they were pleasing animals. Brangwen's girl had put on a ladylike manner, but her voice betrayed her. She wanted to win back her man. When dessert came on, however, the little foreigner turned round from his table and calmly surveyed the room like one unoccupied. Brangwen marvelled over the cold animal intelligence of the face. The brown eyes were round, showing all the brown pupil, like a monkey's, and just calmly looking, perceiving the other person without referring to him at all. They rested on Brangwen. The latter marvelled at the old face turned round on him, looking at him without considering it necessary to know him at all. The eyebrows of the round, perceiving but unconcerned eyes were rather high up, with slight wrinkles above them, just as a monkey's had. It was an old, ageless face. The man was most amazingly a gentleman all the time, an aristocrat. Brangwen stared fascinated. The girl was pushing her crumbs about on the cloth uneasily, flushed and angry. As Brangwen sat motionless in the hall afterwards, too much moved and lost to know what to do, the little stranger came up to him with a beautiful smile and manner, offering a cigarette and saying, "'Will you smoke?' Brangwen never smoked cigarettes, yet he took the one offered, fumbling painfully with thick fingers, blushing to the roots of his hair. Then he looked with his warm blue eyes at the almost sardonic lidded eyes of the foreigner. The latter sat down beside him, and they began to talk, chiefly of horses. Brangwen loved the other man for his exquisite graciousness, for his tact and reserve, and for his ageless monkey-like self-surety. They talked of horses, and of Derbyshire, and of farming. The stranger warmed to the young fellow with real warmth, and Brangwen was excited. He was transported at meeting this odd, middle-aged, dry-skinned man personally. The talk was pleasant, but that did not matter so much. It was the gracious manner, the fine contact, that was all. They talked a long while together, Brangwen flushing like a girl when the other did not understand his idiom. Then they said good night and shook hands. Again the foreigner bowed and repeated his good night. Good night and bon voyage. Then he turned to the stairs. Brangwen went up to his room and lay staring out at the stars of the summer night, his whole being in a whirl. What was it all? There was a life so different from what he knew it. What was there outside his knowledge? How much? What was this that he had touched? What was he in this new influence? What did everything mean? Where was life, in that which he knew, or all outside him? He fell asleep, and in the morning had ridden away before any other visitors were awake. He shrank from seeing any of them again in the morning. His mind was one big excitement, the girl and the foreigner. He knew neither of their names. Yet they had set fire to the homestead of his nature, and he would be burned out of cover. Of the two experiences, perhaps the meeting with the foreigner was the more significant. But the girl, he had not settled about the girl. He did not know. He had to leave it there as it was. He could not sum up his experiences. The result of these encounters was that he dreamed day and night absorbedly of a voluptuous woman and of the meeting with a small withered foreigner of ancient breeding. No sooner was his mind free, no sooner had he left his own companions, than he began to imagine an intimacy with fine-textured, subtle-mannered people such as the foreigner at Matlock, and amidst this subtle intimacy was always the satisfaction of a voluptuous woman. He went about absorbed in the interest and the actuality of this dream. His eyes glowed. He walked with his head up, full of the exquisite pleasure of aristocratic subtlety and grace, tormented with the desire for the girl. Then gradually the glow began to fade, and the cold material of his customary life to show through. He resented it. Was he cheated in his illusion? He balked the mean enclosure of reality, 
stood stubbornly like a bull at a gate, refusing to re-enter the well-known round of his own life. He drank more than usual to keep up the glow, but it faded more and more for all that. He set his teeth at the commonplace to which he would not submit. It resolved itself starkly before him for all that. He wanted to marry, to get settled somehow, to get out of the quandary he found himself in. But how? He felt unable to move his limbs. He had seen a little creature caught in bird lime, and the sight was a nightmare to him. He began to feel mad with the rage of impotency. He wanted something to get hold of, to pull himself out. But there was nothing. Steadfastly he looked at the young women to find a one he could marry, but not one of them did he want, and he knew that the idea of a life among such people as the foreigner was ridiculous. Yet he dreamed of it, and stuck to his dreams, and would not have the reality of Cassate and Ilkston. There he sat stubbornly in his corner at the Red Lion, smoking and musing and occasionally lifting his beer-pot, and saying nothing for all the world like a gorping farm laborer, as he said himself. Then a fever of restless anger came upon him. He wanted to go away, right away. He dreamed of foreign parts, but somehow he had no contact with them, and it was a very strong root which held him to the marsh, to his own house and land. Then Effie got married, and he was left in the house with only Tilly, the cross-eyed woman-servant who had been with them for fifteen years. He felt things coming to a close. All the time he had held himself stubbornly resistant to the action of the commonplace unreality which wanted to absorb him, but now he had to do something. He was by nature temperate. Being sensitive and emotional, his nausea prevented him from drinking too much. But in futile anger, with the greatest of determination and apparent good humor, he began to drink in order to get drunk. "'Damn it,' he said to himself, "'you must have it one road or another. You can't hitch your horse to the shadow of a gate-post. If you've got legs, you've got to rise off your backside some time or other.' So he rose and went down to Ilkston, rather awkwardly took his place among a gang of young bloods, stood drinks to the company, and discovered he could carry it off quite well. He had an idea that everybody in the room was a man after his own heart, that everything was glorious, everything was perfect. When somebody, in alarm, told him his coat pocket was on fire, he could only beam from a red, blissful face and say, "'It's all right, it's all right, it's all right, let it be, let it be.' And he laughed with pleasure, and was rather indignant that the others should think it unnatural for his coat pocket to burn. It was the happiest and most natural thing in the world, what? He went home talking to himself and to the moon that was very high and small, stumbling at the flashes of moonlight from the puddles at his feet, wondering what the Hanover, then laughing confidently to the moon, assuring her this was first class, this was. In the morning he woke up and thought about it, and for the first time in his life knew what it was to feel really acutely irritable, in a misery of real bad temper. After bawling and snarling at Tilly, he took himself off for very shame to be alone, and looking at the ashen fields and the putty roads, he wondered what in the name of hell he could do to get out of this prickly sense of disgust and physical repulsion, and he knew that this was the result of his glorious evening. And his stomach did not want any more brandy. He went doggedly across the fields with his terrier, and looked at everything with a jaundiced eye. The next evening found him back again in his place at the Red Lion, moderate and decent. There he sat and stubbornly waited for what would happen next. Did he, or did he not, believe that he belonged to this world of Cassate and Ilkeston? There was nothing in it he wanted, yet could he ever get out of it? Was there anything in himself that would carry him out of it? Or was he a dunder-headed baby, not man enough to be like the other young fellows who drank a good deal and wenched a little without any question, and were satisfied? He went on stubbornly for a time, then the strain became too great for him. A hot, accumulated consciousness was always awake in his chest. His wrists felt swelled and quivering. His mind became full of lustful images. His eyes seemed blood-flushed. He fought with himself furiously to remain normal. 
He did not seek any woman. He just went on as if he were normal, till he must either take some action or beat his head against the wall. Then he went deliberately to Ilkeston in silence, intent and beaten. He drank to get drunk. He gulped down the brandy and more brandy, till his face became pale, his eyes burning, and still he could not get free. He went to sleep in drunken unconsciousness, woke up at four o'clock in the morning, and continued drinking. He would get free. Gradually the tension in him began to relax. He began to feel happy. His riveted silence was unfastened. He began to talk and babble. He was happy and at one with all the world. He was united with all flesh in a hot blood relationship. So after three days of incessant brandy drinking, he had burned out the youth from his blood. He had achieved this kindled state of oneness with all the world, which is the end of youth's most passionate desire. But he had achieved his satisfaction by obliterating his own individuality, that which it depended on his manhood to preserve and develop. So he became a bout drinker, having at intervals these bouts of three or four days of brandy drinking when he was drunk for the whole time. He did not think about it. A deep resentment burned in him. He kept aloof from any women, antagonistic. When he was twenty-eight, a thick-limbed, stiff, fair man with fresh complexion and blue eyes staring very straight ahead, he was coming one day down from Cossethay with a load of seed out of Nottingham. It was a time when he was getting ready for another bout of drinking, so he stared fixedly before him, watchful yet absorbed, seeing everything and aware of nothing, coiled in himself. It was early in the year. He walked steadily beside the horse. The load clanked behind as the hill descended steeper. The road curved downhill before him, under banks and hedges, seen only for a few yards ahead. Slowly turning the curve at the steepest part of the slope, his horse bridging between the shafts, he saw a woman approaching. But he was thinking for the moment of the horse. Then he turned to look at her. She was dressed in black, was apparently rather small and slight beneath her long black cloak, and she wore a black bonnet. She walked hastily, as if unseeing, her head rather forward. It was her curious, absorbed, flitting motion, as if she were passing unseen by everybody, that first arrested him. She had heard the cart and looked up. Her face was pale and clear. She had thick, dark eyebrows and a wide mouth, curiously held. He saw her face clearly, as if by a light in the air. He saw her face so distinctly that he ceased to coil on himself and was suspended. "'That's her!' he said involuntarily. As the cart passed by, splashing through the thin mud, she stood back against the bank. Then, as he walked still beside his bridging horse, his eyes met hers. He looked quickly away, pressing back his head, a pain of joy running through him. He could not bear to think of anything. He turned round at the last moment. He saw her bonnet, her shape in the black cloak, the movement as she walked. Then she was gone round the bend. She had passed by. He felt as if he were walking again in a far world, not Cossethe, a far world, the fragile reality. He went on, quiet, suspended, rarefied. He could not bear to think or to speak, nor make any sound or sign, nor change his fixed motion. He could scarcely bear to think of her face. He moved within the knowledge of her, in the world that was beyond reality. The feeling that they had exchanged recognition possessed him like a madness, like a torment. How could he be sure? What confirmation had he? The doubt was like a sense of infinite space, a nothingness, annihilating. He kept within his breast the will to surety. They had exchanged recognition. He walked about in this state for the next few days, and then again, like a mist, it began to break to let through the common barren world. He was very gentle with man and beast, but he dreaded the starkness of disillusion cropping through again. As he was standing with his back to the fire after dinner a few days later, he saw the woman passing. He wanted to know that she knew him, that she was aware. 
He wanted it said that there was something between them. So he stood anxiously watching, looking at her as she went down the road. He called to Tilly. "'Who might that be?' he asked. Tilly, the cross-eyed woman of forty who adored him, ran gladly to the window to look. She was glad when he asked her for anything. She craned her head over the short curtain, the little tight knob of her black hair sticking out pathetically as she bobbed about. "'Oh, why!' she lifted her head and peered with her twisted keen brown eyes. "'Why, you know who it is. It's her from the vicarage, you know.' "'How do I know, you hen-bird?' he shouted. Tilly blushed and drew her neck in and looked at him with her squinting, sharp, almost reproachful look. "'Why, you do. It's the new housekeeper.' "'Eh, and what by that?' "'Well, and what by that?' rejoined the indignant Tilly. "'She's a woman, isn't she? Housekeeper or no housekeeper? She's got more to her than that. Who is she? She's got a name.' "'Well, if she has, I don't know,' retorted Tilly not to be badgered by this lad who had grown up into a man. "'What's her name?' he asked more gently. "'I'm sure I couldn't tell you,' replied Tilly, on her dignity. "'And as that all as you've gathered, as she's housekeeping at the vicarage?' "'I've heard mention of her name, but I couldn't remember it for my life. "'Why, you riddle-skulled woman of nonsense, what have you got a head for?' "'For what other folks has got theirs for,' retorted Tilly.' who loved nothing more than these tilts when he would call her names. There was a lull. "'I don't believe as anybody could keep it in their head,' the woman-servant continued tentatively. "'What?' he asked. "'Why, her name. How's that? She's for some foreign parts or other. Who told you that? That's all I do know is she is. And where do you reckon she's from, then?' "'I don't know.' "'They do say as she hails for the pole. I don't know,' Tilly hastened to add, knowing he would attack her. "'For the pole? Why do you hail from the pole? Who set up that menagerie confabulation?' "'That's what they say. I don't know. Who says?' "'Mrs. Bentley says as she's for the pole. Else she is a pole, or summit.' Tilly was only afraid she was landing herself deeper now. "'Who says she's a pole?' They all say so. Then what's brought her to these parts? I couldn't tell you. She's got a little girl with her. Got a little girl with her? Of three or four with a head like a fuzzball. Black? White. Fair as can be and all of a fuzz. Is there a father, then? Not to my knowledge. I don't know. What brought her here? I couldn't say without the vicar axed her. "'Is the child her child?' "'I should think so. They say so.' "'Who told you about her?' "'Why, Lizzie, a Monday we seed her going past. "'You'd have to be rattling your tongues if anything went past.' "'Brangwen stood musing. "'That evening he went up to Cossete to the Red Lion, "'half with the intention of hearing more. "'She was the widow of a Polish doctor,' he gathered. "'Her husband had died, a refugee, in London.' She spoke a bit foreign-like, but you could easily make out what she said. She had one little girl named Anna. Lensky was the woman's name, Mrs. Lensky. Brangwen felt that here was the unreality established at last. He felt also a curious certainty about her, as if she were destined to him. It was to him a profound satisfaction that she was a foreigner. A swift change had taken place on the earth for him— as if a new creation were fulfilled, in which he had real existence. Things had all been stark, unreal, barren, mere nullities before. Now they were actualities that he could handle. He dared scarcely think of the woman. He was afraid. Only all the time he was aware of her presence not far off. He lived in her, but he dared not know her, even acquaint himself with her by thinking of her. End of chapter 1, part 2
Chapter One, Part Three of the Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence, Chapter One, Part Three. One day he met her walking along the road with her little girl. It was a child with a face like a bud of apple blossom, and glistening fair hair like thistle down, sticking out in straight, wild, flamy pieces, and very dark eyes. The child clung jealously to her mother's side when he looked at her, staring with resentful black eyes, but the mother glanced at him again almost vacantly, and the very vacancy of her look inflamed him. She had wide, grey-brown eyes with very dark, fathomless pupils. He felt the fine flame running under his skin as if all his veins had caught fire on the surface, and he went on walking without knowledge. It was coming, he knew, his fate. The world was submitting to its transformation. He made no move. It would come what would come. When his sister Effie came to the marsh for a week, he went with her for once to church. In the tiny place, with its mere dozen pews, he sat not far from the stranger. There was a fineness about her, a poignancy about the way she sat and held her head lifted. She was strange, from far off, yet so intimate. She was from far away, a presence, so close to his soul. She was not really there, sitting in Casate Church beside her little girl. She was not living the apparent life of her days. She belonged to somewhere else. He felt it poignantly, as something real and natural. But a pang of fear for his own concrete life that was only Cossette hurt him and gave him misgiving. Her thick dark brows almost met above her irregular nose. She had a wide, rather thick mouth, but her face was lifted to another world of life, not to heaven or death. But to some place where she still lived in spite of her body's absence. The child beside her watched everything with wide black eyes. She had an odd little defiant look. Her little red mouth was pinched shut. She seemed to be jealously guarding something, to be always on the alert for defence. She met Brangwen's near vacant intimate gaze, and a palpitating hostility, almost like a flame of pain, came into the wide, overconscious dark eyes. The old clergyman droned on. Cossette sat unmoved as usual, and there was the foreign woman with a foreign air about her, in violet, and the strange child, also foreign, jealously guarding something. When the service was over, he walked in the way of another existence out of the church. As he went down the church path with his sister, behind the woman and child, the little girl suddenly broke from her mother's hand and slipped back with quick, almost invisible movement, and was picking at something almost under Brangwen's feet. Her tiny fingers were fine and quick, but they missed the red button. Have you found something? said Brangwen to her. And he also stooped for the button, but she had got it, and she stood back with it pressed against her little coat, her black eyes flaring at him as if to forbid him to notice her. Then, having silenced him, she turned with a swift, Mother, and was gone down the path. The mother had stood watching, impassive, looking not at the child, but at Brangwen. He became aware of the woman looking at him, standing there, isolated, yet for him dominant in her foreign existence. He did not know what to do, and turned to his sister, but the wide grey eyes, almost vacant yet so moving, held him beyond himself. "'Mother, I may have it, mayn't I?' came the child's proud silvery tones. "'Mother?' She seemed always to be calling her mother to remember her. "'Mother?' And she had nothing to continue. Now her mother had replied, "'Yes, my child.' But with ready invention the child stumbled and ran on. "'What are those people's names?' Brangwen heard the abstract, I don't know, dear. He went on down the road as if he were not living inside himself, but somewhere outside. Who was that person? his sister Effie asked. I couldn't tell you, he answered, unknowing. 
"'She's somebody very funny,' said Effie, almost in condemnation. "'That child's like one bewitched.' "'Bewitched? How bewitched?' he repeated. "'You can see for yourself. The mother's plain, I must say, but the child is like a changeling. She'd be about thirty-five. But he took no notice. His sister talked on. "'There's your woman for you,' she continued. "'You'd better marry her.' but still he took no notice. Things were as they were. Another day at tea-time, as he sat alone at table, there came a knock at the front door. It startled him like a portent. No one ever knocked at the front door. He rose and began slotting back the bolts, turning the big key. When he had opened the door, the strange woman stood on the threshold. "'Can you give me a pound of butter?' she asked, in a curious, detached way of one speaking a foreign language. He tried to attend to her question. She was looking at him questioningly, but underneath the question, what was there, in her very standing motionless, which affected him? He stepped aside, and she at once entered the house, as if the door had been opened to admit her. That startled him. It was the custom for everybody to wait on the doorstep till asked inside. He went into the kitchen, and she followed. His tea-things were spread on the scrubbed deal-table. A big fire was burning. A dog rose from the hearth and went to her. She stood motionless just inside the kitchen. "'Tilly!' he called loudly. "'Have we got any butter?' The stranger stood there like a silence in her black cloak. "'Eh?' came the shrill cry from the distance. He shouted his question again. "'We've got what's on the table,' answered Tilly's shrill voice out of the dairy. Brangwen looked at the table. There was a large pat of butter on a plate, almost a pound. It was round and stamped with acorns and oak leaves. "'Can't you come when you're wanted?' he shouted. "'Why, what do you want?' Tilly protested as she came peeking inquisitively through the other door. She saw the strange woman, stared at her with cross eyes, but said nothing. "'Haven't we any butter?' asked Brangwen again, impatiently, as if he could command some by his question. "'I tell you there's what's on the table,' said Tilly, impatient that she was unable to create any to his demand. "'We haven't a morsel besides.' There was a moment's silence. The stranger spoke in her curiously distinct detached manner of one who must think her speech first. "'Oh, then thank you very much. I am sorry that I have come to trouble you.' She could not understand the entire lack of manners, was slightly puzzled. Any politeness would have made the situation quite impersonal, but here it was a case of wills in confusion. Brangwen flushed at her polite speech. Still, he did not let her go. "'Get summoned and wrap that up for her,' he said to Tilly looking at the butter on the table, and taking a clean knife, he cut off that side of the butter where it was touched. His speech, the for her, penetrated slowly into the foreign woman and angered Tilly. "'Vicar has his butter for browns, by rights,' said the insuppressible servant woman. "'We shall be churning to-morrow morning, first thing.' "'Yes,' the long-drawn foreign, yes. "'Yes,' said the Polish woman. I went to Mrs. Brown's. She hasn't any more. Tilly bridled her head, bursting to say that according to the etiquette of people who bought butter, it was no sort of manners whatever coming to a place cool as you like, and knocking at the front door asking for a pound as a stop-gap while your other people were short. If you go to Brown's, you go to Brown's, and my butter isn't just to make shift when Brown's has got none. Brangwen understood perfectly this unspoken speech of Tilly's. The Polish lady did not. And as she wanted butter for the vicar, and as Tilly was churning in the morning, she waited. "'Slother up now,' said Brangwen loudly, after the silence had resolved itself out, and Tilly disappeared through the inner door. "'I am afraid that I should not come so,' said the stranger, looking at him inquiringly, as if referring to him for what it was usual to do. He felt confused. "'How's that?' he said, trying to be genial, and being only protective. "'Do you—' she began deliberately, but she was not sure of her ground, 
and the conversation came to an end. Her eyes looked at him all the while because she could not speak the language. They stood facing each other. The dog walked away from her to him. He bent down to it. "'And how's your little girl?' he asked. "'Yes. Thank you. She is very well,' was the reply. A phrase of polite speech in a foreign language, merely. "'Sit you down,' he said. And she sat in a chair, her slim arms coming through the slits of her cloak, resting on her lap. "'You're not used to these parts,' he said, still standing on the hearth rug with his back to the fire, coatless, looking with curious directness at the woman. Her self-possession pleased him and inspired him, set him curiously free. It seemed to him almost brutal to feel so master of himself and of the situation. Her eyes rested on him for a moment, questioning as she thought of the meaning of his speech. No, she said, understanding. No, it is strange. You find it middlin' rough, he said. Her eyes waited on him so that he should say it again. Our ways are rough to you, he repeated. Yes, yes, I understand. Yes, it is different. It is strange. But I was in Yorkshire. Oh, well, then, he said. It's no worse here than what they are up there. She did not quite understand. His protective manner and his sureness and his intimacy puzzled her. What did he mean? If he was her equal, why did he behave so without formality? No, she said vaguely, her eyes resting on him. She saw him fresh and naive, uncouth, almost entirely beyond relationship with her. Yet he was good-looking, with his fair hair and blue eyes full of energy, and with his healthy body that seemed to take equality with her. She watched him steadily. He was difficult for her to understand. Warm, uncouth, and confident as he was, sure on his feet as if he did not know what it was to be unsure. What then was it that gave him this curious stability? She did not know. She wondered. She looked round the room he lived in. It had a close intimacy that fascinated and almost frightened her. The furniture was old and familiar as old people. The whole place seemed so kin to him, as if it partook of his being, that she was uneasy. "'It is already a long time that you have lived in this house, yes?' she asked. "'I've always lived here,' he said. "'Yes, but your people, your family?' "'We've been here above two hundred years,' he said. Her eyes were on him all the time, wide open and trying to grasp him. He felt that he was there for her. "'It is your own place, the house, the farm?' "'Yes,' he said. He looked down at her and met her look. It disturbed her. She did not know him. He was a foreigner. They had nothing to do with each other. Yet his look disturbed her to knowledge of him. He was so strangely confident and direct. "'You live quite alone?' "'Yes, if you call it alone.' She did not understand. It seemed unusual to her. What was the meaning of it? And whenever her eyes, after watching him for some time, inevitably met his, she was aware of a heat beating up over her consciousness. She sat motionless and in conflict. Who was this strange man who was at once so near to her? What was happening to her? Something in his young, warm, twinkling eyes seemed to assume a right to her, to speak to her, to extend her his protection. But how? Why did he speak to her? Why were his eyes so certain, so full of light and confident, waiting for no permission nor signal? Tilly returned with a large leaf and found the two silent. At once he felt it incumbent on him to speak, now the serving-woman had come back. "'How old is your little girl?' he asked. Four years,' she replied. "'Her father hasn't been dead long, then,' he asked. "'She was one year when he died. Three years. "'Yes, three years that he is dead, yes.' Curiously quiet she was, almost abstracted, answering these questions. She looked at him again with some maidenhood opening in her eyes. 
he felt he could not move, neither towards her nor away from her. Something about her presence hurt him, till he was almost rigid before her. He saw the girl's wondering look rise in her eyes. Tilly handed her the butter, and she rose. "'Thank you very much,' she said. "'How much is it?' "'We'll make the vicar a present of it,' he said. "'It'll do for me going to church.' "'It would look better of you if you went to church and took the money for your butter,' said Tilly, persistent in her claim to him. "'You'd have to put in, shouldn't you?' he said. "'How much, please?' said the Polish woman to Tilly. Grandwin stood by and let be. "'Then thank you very much,' she said. "'Bring your little girl down some time to look at the fowls and horses,' he said. "'If she'd like it.' "'Yes, she would like it,' said the stranger. And she went. Grandwin stood dimmed by her departure. He could not notice Tilly, who was looking at him uneasily, wanting to be reassured. He could not think of anything. He felt that he had made some invisible connection with the strange woman. A daze had come over his mind. He had another centre of consciousness. In his breast or in his bowels, somewhere in his body, there had started another activity. It was as if a strong light were burning there, and he was blind within it, unable to know anything, except that this transfiguration burned between him and her, connecting them like a secret power. Since she had come to the house, he went about in a daze, scarcely seeing even the things he handled, drifting, quiescent, in a state of metamorphosis. He submitted to that which was happening to him, letting go his will, suffering the loss of himself, dormant always on the brink of ecstasy, like a creature evolving to a new birth. She came twice with her child to the farm, but there was this lull between them, an intense calm and passivity like a torpor upon them, so that there was no active change took place. He was almost unaware of the child, yet by his native good humour he gained her confidence, even her affection, setting her on a horse to ride, giving her corn for the fowls. Once he drove the mother and child from Ilkston, picking them up on the road, the child huddled close to him as if for love. The mother sat very still. There was a vagueness, like a soft mist over all of them, and a silence as if their wills were suspended. Only he saw her hands, ungloved, folded in her lap, and he noticed the wedding ring on her finger. It excluded him. It was a closed circle. It bound her life, the wedding ring. It stood for her life in which he could have no part. Nevertheless, beyond all this, there was herself and himself, which should meet. As he helped her down from the trap, almost lifting her, he felt he had some right to take her thus between his hands. She belonged as yet to that other, to that which was behind. But he must care for her also. She was too living to be neglected. Sometimes her vagueness, in which he was lost, made him angry, made him rage, but he held himself still as yet. She had no response, no being towards him. It puzzled and enraged him, but he submitted for a long time. Then, from the accumulated troubling of her ignoring him, gradually a fury broke out, destructive, and he wanted to go away to escape her. It happened she came down to the marsh with the child whilst he was in this state. Then he stood over against her, strong and heavy in his revolt, and though he said nothing, still she felt his anger and heavy impatience grip hold of her. She was shaken again as out of a torpor. Again her heart stirred with a quick, outrunning impulse. She looked at him, at the stranger who was not a gentleman, yet who insisted on coming into her life, and the pain of a new birth in herself strung all her veins to a new form. She would have to begin again, to find a new being, a new form, to respond to that blind, insistent figure standing over against her. A shiver, a sickness of new birth passed over her. The flame leaped up him, under his skin. She wanted it, this new life from him, with him. Yet she must defend herself against it, for it was a destruction. As he worked alone on the land, 
or sat up with his ewes at lambing time, the facts and material of his daily life fell away, leaving the kernel of his purpose clean, and then it came upon him that he would marry her, and she would be his life. Gradually, even without seeing her, he came to know her. He would have liked to think of her as something given into his protection, like a child without parents, but it was forbidden him. He had to come down from this pleasant view of the case. She might refuse him, and besides he was afraid of her. But during the long February nights, with the ewes in labor, looking out from the shelter into the flashing stars, he knew he did not belong to himself. He must admit that he was only fragmentary, something incomplete and subject. There were the stars in the dark heaven travelling, the whole host passing by on some eternal voyage. So he sat small and submissive to the greater ordering. Unless she would come to him, he must remain as a nothingness. It was a hard experience. But after her repeated obliviousness to him, after he had seen so often that he did not exist for her, after he had raged and tried to escape— and said he was good enough by himself, he was a man and could stand alone, he must, in the starry multiplicity of the night, humble himself, and admit and know that without her he was nothing. He was nothing, but with her he would be real. If she were now walking across the frosty grass near the sheep shelter, through the fretful bleeding of the ewes and lambs, she would bring him completeness and perfection, and if it should be so, that she should come to him, it should be so. It was ordained so. He was a long time resolving definitely to ask her to marry him, and he knew if he asked her she must really acquiesce. She must. It could not be otherwise. He had learned a little of her. She was poor, quite alone, and had had a hard time in London, both before and after her husband died. But in Poland she was a lady well-born, a landowner's daughter. All these things were only words to him. The fact of her superior birth, the fact that her husband had been a brilliant doctor, the fact that he himself was her inferior in almost every way of distinction. There was an inner reality, a logic of the soul, which connected her with him. One evening in March, when the wind was roaring outside, came the moment to ask her. He had sat with his hands before him, leaning to the fire, and as he watched the fire he knew, almost without thinking, that he was going this evening. "'Have you got a clean shirt?' he asked Tilly. "'You know you've got clean shirts,' she said. "'Hey, bring me a white one.' Tilly brought down one of the linen shirts he had inherited from his father, putting it before him to air at the fire." She loved him with a dumb, aching love as he sat leaning with his arms on his knees, still and absorbed, unaware of her. Lately a quivering inclination to cry had come over her when she did anything for him in his presence. Now her hands trembled as she spread the shirt. He was never shouting and teasing now. The deep stillness there was in the house made her tremble. He went to wash himself. Queer little breaks of consciousness seemed to rise and burst like bubbles out of the depths of his stillness. "'It's got to be done,' he said, as he stooped to take the shirt out of the fender. "'It's got to be done, so why balk it?' And as he combed his hair before the mirror on the wall, he retorted to himself superficially, "'The woman's not speechless dumb. She's not cluttering at the nipple. She's got the right to please herself and displease whosoever she likes.' This streak of common sense carried him a little further. "'Did you want anything?' asked Tilly, suddenly appearing, having heard him speak. She stood watching him comb his fair beard. His eyes were calm and uninterrupted. "'Eh,' hey, he said, "'where have you put the scissors?' She brought them to him and stood watching as, chin forward, he trimmed his beard. "'Don't go and crop yourself as if you was at a shearing contest,' she said anxiously. He blew the fine curled hair quickly off his lips. He put on all clean clothes, folded his stock carefully, and donned his best coat. Then, being ready, 
As grey twilight was falling, he went across to the orchard to gather the daffodils. The wind was roaring in the apple trees, the yellow flowers swayed violently up and down. He heard even the fine whisper of their spears as he stooped to break the flattened, brittle stems of the flowers. "'What's to do?' shouted a friend who met him as he left the garden gate. "'Bit of courtin' like said Brangwen. And Tilly, in a great state of trepidation and excitement, let the wind whisk her over the field to the big gate, whence she could watch him go. He went up the hill and on towards the vicarage, the wind roaring through the hedges, whilst he tried to shelter his bunch of daffodils by his side. He did not think of anything, only knew that the wind was blowing. Night was falling. The bare trees drummed and whistled. The vicar, he knew, would be in his study. The Polish woman in the kitchen. A comfortable room with her child. In the darkest of twilight he went through the gate and down the path where a few daffodils stooped in the wind and shattered crocuses made a pale, colourless ravel. There was a light streaming on to the bushes at the back from the kitchen window. He began to hesitate. How could he do this? Looking through the window, he saw her seated in the rocking-chair with the child, already in its night-dress, sitting on her knee. The fair head, with its wild, fierce hair, was drooping towards the fire-warmth, which reflected on the bright cheeks and clear skin of the child, who seemed to be musing, almost like a grown-up person. The mother's face was dark and still, and he saw with a pang that she was away back in the life that had been. The child's hair gleamed like spun glass. Her face was illuminated till it seemed like wax lit up from the inside. The wind boomed strongly. Mother and child sat motionless, silent. The child staring with vacant dark eyes into the fire, the mother looking into space. The little girl was almost asleep. It was her will which kept her eyes so wide. Suddenly she looked round, troubled, as the wind shook the house, and Brangwen saw the small lips move. The mother began to rock. He heard the slight crunch of the rockers of the chair. Then he heard the low, monotonous murmur of a song in a foreign language. Then a great burst of wind. The mother seemed to have drifted away. The child's eyes were black and dilated. Brangwen looked up at the clouds, which packed in great alarming haste across the dark sky. Then there came the child's high, complaining, yet imperative voice, "'Don't sing that stuff, mother. I don't want to hear it.' The singing died away. "'You will go to bed,' said the mother. He saw the clinging protest of the child, the unmoved far-awayness of the mother, the clinging, grasping effort of the child, then suddenly the clear, childish challenge, "'I want you to tell me a story.' The wind blew, the story began. The child nestled against the mother. Rangwin waited outside, suspended, looking at the wild waving of the trees and the wind, and the gathering darkness. He had his fate to follow. He lingered there at the threshold. The child crouched, distinct and motionless, curled in against her mother, the eyes dark and unblinking among the keen wisps of hair, like a curled-up animal asleep but for the eyes. The mother sat as if in shadow. The story went on as if by itself. Brangwen stood outside, seeing the night fall. He did not notice the passage of time. The hand that held the daffodils was fixed and cold. The story came to an end. The mother rose at last, with the child clinging round her neck. She must be strong to carry so large a child so easily. The little Anna clung round her mother's neck. The fair, strange face of the child looked over the shoulder of the mother, all asleep but the eyes, and these, wide and dark, kept up the resistance and the fight with something unseen. When they were gone, Brangwen stirred for the first time from the place where he stood, and looked round at the night. He wished it were really as beautiful and familiar as it seemed in these few moments of release. Along with the child he felt a curious strain on him, a suffering like a fate. The mother came down again and began folding the child's clothes. He knocked. 
She opened, wondering, a little bit at bay, like a foreigner, uneasy. "'Good evening,' he said. "'I'll just come in a minute.' A change went quickly over her face. She was unprepared. She looked down at him as he stood in the light from the window, holding the daffodils, the darkness behind. In his black clothes she again did not know him. She was almost afraid. But he was already stepping on to the threshold and closing the door behind him. She turned into the kitchen, startled out of herself by this invasion from the night. He took off his hat and came towards her. Then he stood in the light, in his black clothes and his black stock, hat in one hand and yellow flowers in the other. She stood away at his mercy, snatched out of herself. She did not know him, only she knew he was a man come for her. She could only see the dark-clad man's figure standing there upon her, and the gripped fist of flowers. She could not see the face and the living eyes. He was watching her without knowing her only aware underneath of her presence. "'I come to have a word with you,' he said, striding forward to the table, laying down his hat and the flowers which tumbled apart and lay in a loose heap. She had flinched from his advance. She had no will, no being. The wind boomed in the chimney, and he waited. He had disembarrassed his hands. Now he shut his fists. He was aware of her standing there unknown, dread, yet related to him. "'I came up,' he said, speaking curiously matter-of-fact and level, "'to ask if you'd marry me. "'You are free, aren't you?' "'There was a long silence whilst his blue eyes, strangely impersonal, "'looked into her eyes to seek an answer to the truth. "'He was looking for the truth out of her, "'and she, as if hypnotized, must answer at length. "'Yes, I am free to marry.' The expression of his eyes changed, became less impersonal, as if he were looking almost at her for the truth of her. Steady and intent and eternal they were, as if they would never change. They seemed to fix and to resolve her. She quivered, feeling herself created, willless, lapsing into him, into a common will with him. "'You want me?' she said. A pallor came over his face. "'Yes,' he said. "'Still there was no response and silence. "'No,' she said, not of herself. "'No, I don't know.' "'He felt the tension breaking up in him. "'His fists slackened. He was unable to move. "'He stood there looking at her, helpless in his vague collapse. "'For the moment she had become unreal to him. "'Then he saw her come to him, curiously direct, and as if without movement, in a sudden flow, she put her hand to his coat. "'Yes, I want to,' she said, impersonally, looking at him with wide, candid, newly opened eyes, opened now with supreme truth. He went very white as he stood, and did not move. Only his eyes were held by hers, and he suffered. She seemed to see him with her newly opened wide eyes, almost of a child, and with a strange movement. There was agony to him. She reached slowly forward her dark face and her breast to him, with a slow insinuation of a kiss that made something break in his brain, and it was darkness over him for a few moments. He had her in his arms, and obliterated was kissing her, and it was sheer bleached agony to him to break away from himself. She was there, so small and light and accepting in his arms like a child, and yet with such an insinuation of embrace, of infinite embrace, that he could not bear it, he could not stand. He turned and looked for a chair, and keeping her still in his arms, sat down with her close to him, to his breast. Then for a few seconds he went utterly to sleep, a sleep and sealed in the darkest sleep, utter extreme oblivion from which he came to gradually, always holding her warm and close upon him, and she, as utterly silent as he, involved in the same oblivion, the fecund darkness. He returned gradually, but newly created, as after a gestation, a new birth in the womb of darkness. Aerial and light everything was, new as a morning, fresh and newly begun, 
like a dawn, the newness and the bliss filled in, and she sat utterly still with him, as if in the same. Then she looked up at him, the wide young eyes blazing with light, and he bent down and kissed her on the lips, and the dawn blazed in them. Their new life came to pass. It was beyond all conceiving good. It was so good that it was almost like a passing away, a trespass. He drew her suddenly closer to him. For soon the light began to fade in her gradually, and as she was in his arms her head sank. She leaned it against him and lay still, with sunk head, a little tired, effaced because she was tired, and in her tiredness was a certain negation of him. "'There is the child,' she said, out of the long silence. He did not understand. It was a long time since he had heard a voice. Now also he heard the wind roaring as if it had just begun again. "'Yes,' he said, not understanding. There was a slight contraction of pain at his heart, a slight tension on his brows, something he wanted to grasp and could not. "'You will love her?' she said. The quick contraction, like pain, went over him again. "'I love her now,' he said. She lay still against him, taking his physical warmth without heed. It was great confirmation for him to feel her there, absorbing the warmth from him, giving him back her weight and her strange confidence. But where was she that she seemed so absent? His mind was open with wonder. He did not know her. "'But I am much older than you,' she said. "'How old?' he asked. "'I am thirty-four, she said. "'I am twenty-eight,' he said, Six years. "'She was oddly concerned, even as if it pleased her a little. "'He sat and listened and wondered. "'It was rather splendid to be so ignored by her whilst she lay against him, "'and he lifted her with his breathing and felt her weight upon his living, "'so he had a completeness and an inviolable power. "'He did not interfere with her. "'He did not even know her. It was so strange that she lay there with her weight abandoned upon him. He was silent with delight. He felt strong, physically, carrying her on his breathing. The strange, inviolable completeness of the two of them made him feel as sure and as stable as God. Amused, he wondered what the vicar would say if he knew. "'You needn't stop here much longer, housekeeping,' he said. "'I like it also here.' she said. When one has been in many places, it is very nice here. He was silent again at this. So close on him she lay, and yet she answered him from so far away. But he did not mind. What was your own home like when you were little? he asked. My father was a landowner, she replied. It was near a river. This did not convey much to him. All was as vague as before. But he did not care whilst she was so close. "'I am a landowner, a little one,' he said. "'Yes,' she said. He had not dared to move. He sat there with his arms round her, her lying motionless on his breathing, and for a long time he did not stir. Then softly, timidly, his hand settled on the roundness of her arm, on the unknown. She seemed to lie a little closer. A hot flame licked up from his belly to his chest. But it was too soon. She rose and went across the room to a drawer, taking out a little tray cloth. There was something quiet and professional about her. She had been a nurse beside her husband, both in Warsaw and in the rebellion afterwards. She proceeded to set a tray. It was as if she ignored Brangwen. He sat up, unable to bear a contradiction in her. She moved about inscrutably. Then, as he sat there, all mused and wondering, she came near to him, looking at him with wide grey eyes that almost smiled with a low light. But her ugly, beautiful mouth was still unmoved and sad. He was afraid. His eyes, strained and roused with unusedness, quailed a little before her. He felt himself quailing, and yet he rose as if obedient to her. He bent and kissed her heavy, sad, wide mouth that was kissed, and did not alter. Fear was too strong in him. 
Again, he had not got her. She turned away. The vicarage kitchen was untidy, and yet, to him, beautiful with the untidiness of her and her child. Such a wonderful remoteness there was about her. And then something in touch with him that made his heart knock in his chest. He stood there and waited, suspended. Again she came to him, as he stood in his black clothes, with blue eyes very bright and puzzled for her, his face tensely alive, his hair dishevelled. She came close up to him, to his intent black-clothed body, and laid her hand on his arm. He remained unmoved. Her eyes, with a blackness of memory struggling with passion, primitive and electric, away at the back of them, rejected him and absorbed him at once. But he remained himself. He breathed with difficulty, and sweat came out at the roots of his hair on his forehead. "'Do you want to marry me?' she asked slowly, always uncertain. He was afraid lest he could not speak. He drew breath hard, saying, "'I do.' Then again, what was agony to him, with one hand lightly resting on his arm, she leaned forward a little, and with a strange primeval suggestion of embrace, held him her mouth. It was ugly beautiful, and he could not bear it. He put his mouth on hers, and slowly, slowly the response came, gathering force and passion till it seemed to him she was thundering at him till he could bear no more. He drew away white, unbreathing. Only in his blue eyes was something of himself concentrated, and in her eyes was a little smile upon a black void. She was drifting away from him again, and he wanted to go away. It was intolerable. He could bear no more. He must go. Yet he was irresolute. But she turned away from him. With a little pang of anguish, of denial, it was decided. "'I'll come and speak to the vicar to-morrow,' he said, taking his hat. She looked at him, her eyes expressionless and full of darkness. He could see no answer. "'That'll do, won't it?' he said. "'Yes,' she answered, mere echo, without body or meaning. "'Good night,' he said. "'Good night.' He left her standing there, expressionless and void as she was, then she went on laying the tray for the vicar. Kneading the table, she put the daffodils aside on the dresser without noticing them. Only their coolness, touching her hand, remained echoing there a long while. They were such strangers, they must forever be such strangers, that his passion was a clanging torment to him, such intimacy of embrace, and such utter foreignness of contact. It was unbearable. He could not bear to be near her and know the utter foreignness between them, know how entirely they were strangers to each other. He went out into the wind. Big holes were blown into the sky. The moonlight blew about. Sometimes a high moon, liquid brilliant, scudded across a hollow space and took cover under electric brown iridescent cloud edges. Then there was a blot of cloud and shadow, then somewhere in the night a radiance again, like a vapor and all the sky was teeming and tearing along, a vast disorder of flying shapes and darkness and ragged fumes of light and a great brown circling halo, then the terror of a moon running liquid brilliant into the open for a moment, hurting the eyes before she plunged under cover of cloud again. End of chapter 1《チャプター2パート1オブ・ザ・レインボー》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter 2 They Live at the Marsh. Part 1 she was the daughter of a Polish landowner who, deeply in debt to the Jews, had married a German wife with money, and who had died just before the rebellion. Quite young she had married Paul Lenski, an intellectual who had studied at Berlin, and had returned to Warsaw a patriot. 
Her mother had married a German merchant and gone away. Lydia Lenski, married to the young doctor, became with him a patriot and an emancipee. They were poor, but they were very conceited. She learned nursing as a mark of her emancipation. They represented in Poland the new movement just begun in Russia, but they were very patriotic and at the same time very European. They had two children. Then came the Great Rebellion. Lenski, very ardent and full of words, went about inciting his countrymen. Little Poles flamed down the streets of Warsaw on the way to shoot every Muscovite. So they crossed into the south of Russia, and it was common for six little insurgents to ride into a Jewish village, brandishing swords and words, emphasizing the fact that they were going to shoot every living Muscovite. Lenski was something of a fire-eater also. Lydia, tempered by her German blood, coming of a different family, was obliterated, carried along in her husband's emphasis of declaration and his whirl of patriotism. He was indeed a brave man, but no bravery could quite have equaled the vividness of his talk. He worked very hard till nothing lived in him but his eyes, and Lydia, as if drugged, followed him like a shadow, serving, echoing. Sometimes she had her two children, sometimes they were left behind. She returned once to find them both dead of diphtheria. Her husband wept aloud, unaware of everybody. But the war went on, and soon he was back at his work. A darkness had come over Lydia's mind. She walked always in a shadow, silenced, with a strange deep terror having hold of her. Her desire was to seek satisfaction in dread, to enter a nunnery, to satisfy the instincts of dread in her through service of a dark religion, but she could not. Then came the flight to London. Lenski, the little thin man, had got all his life locked into a resistance and could not relax again. He lived in a sort of insane irritability, touchy, haughty to the last degree, fractious, so that, as assistant doctor in one of the hospitals, he soon became impossible. They were almost beggars, but he kept still his great ideas of himself. He seemed to live in a complete hallucination, where he himself figured vivid and lordly. He guarded his wife jealously against the ignominy of her position, rushed round her like a brandished weapon, an amazing sight to the English eye, had her in his power as if he hypnotized her. She was passive, dark, always in shadow. He was wasting away. Already, when the child was born, he seemed nothing but skin and bone and fixed idea. She watched him dying, nursed him, nursed the baby, but really took no notice of anything. A darkness was on her, like remorse, or like a remembering of the dark, savage, mystic ride of dread, of death, of the shadow of revenge. When her husband died, she was relieved. He would no longer dart about her. England fitted her mood, its aloofness and foreignness. She had known a little of the language before coming, and a sort of parrot mind made her pick it up fairly easily. But she knew nothing of the English, nor of English life. Indeed, these did not exist for her. She was like one walking in the underworld, where the shades throng intelligibly, but have no connection with one. She felt the English people as a potent, cold, slightly hostile host amongst whom she walked isolated. The English people themselves were almost deferential to her. The church saw that she did not want. She walked without passion, like a shade, tormented into moments of love by the child. Her dying husband, with his tortured eyes and the skin drawn tight over his face, he was as a vision to her, not a reality. In a vision he was buried and put away. Then the vision ceased. She was untroubled. Time went on gray, uncolored, like a long journey where she sat unconscious as the landscape unrolled beside her. When she rocked her baby at evening, maybe she fell into a Polish slumber song, or she talked sometimes to herself in Polish. Otherwise, she did not think of Poland, nor of that life to which she had belonged. It was a great blot, looming blank in its darkness. In the superficial activity of her life, she was all English, 
She even thought in English, but her long blanks and darknesses of abstraction were Polish. So she lived for some time. Then, with slight uneasiness, she used half to awake to the streets of London. She realized that there was something around her, very foreign. She realized she was in a strange place, and then she was sent away into the country. There came into her mind now the memory of her home where she had been a child, the big house among the land, the peasants of the village. She was sent to Yorkshire to nurse an old rector in his rectory by the sea. This was the first shake of the kaleidoscope that brought in front of her eyes something she must see. It hurt her brain, the open country and the moors. It hurt her and hurt her, yet it forced itself upon her as something living. It roused some potency of her childhood in her. It had some relation to her. There was green and silver and blue in the air about her now, and there was a strange insistence of light from the sea to which she must attend. Primroses glimmered around, many of them, and she stooped to the disturbing influence near her feet. She even picked one or two flowers, faintly remembering in the new color of life what had been. All the day long as she sat at the upper window, the light came off the sea, constantly constantly without refusal till it seemed to bear her away and the noise of the sea created a drowsiness in her a relaxation like sleep her automatic consciousness gave way a little she stumbled sometimes she had a poignant momentary vision of her living child that hurt her unspeakably her soul roused to attention very strange was the constant glitter of the sea unsheathed in heaven very warm and sweet the graveyard, in a nook of the hill, catching the sunshine and holding it as one holds a bee between the palms of the hands, when it is benumbed. Gray grass and lichens and a little church and snowdrops among coarse grass and a cup full of incredibly warm sunshine. She was troubled in spirit. Hearing the rushing of the beck away down under the trees, she was startled and wondered what it was. Walking down, she found the bluebells around her glowing like a presence among the trees. Summer came. The moors were tangled with harebells like water in the ruts of the roads. The heather came rosy under the skies, setting the whole world awake. And she was uneasy. She went past the gorse bushes, shrinking from their presence. She stepped into the heather as into a quickening bath that almost hurt. Her fingers moved over the clasped fingers of the child. She heard the anxious voice of the baby as it tried to make her talk, distraught. And she shrank away again back into her darkness, and for a long while remained blotted safely away from living. But autumn came with the faint red glimmer of robins singing, winter darkened the moors, and almost savagely she turned again to life, demanding her life back again, demanding that it should be as it had been when she was a girl, on the land at home, under the sky. Snow lay in great expanses, the telegraph posts strode over the wide earth, away under the gloom of the sky, and savagely her desire rose in her again, demanding that this was Poland, her youth, that all was her own again. But there were no sledges nor bells. She did not see the peasants coming out like new people in their sheepskins and their fresh, ruddy, bright faces that seemed to become new and vivid when the snow lit up the ground. It did not come to her, the life of her youth. It did not come back. There was a little agony of struggle, then a relapse into the darkness of the convent, where Satan and the devils raged round the walls, and Christ was white on the cross of victory. She watched from the sick room the snow whirl past like flocks of shadows in haste, flying on some final mission out to a leaden, inalterable sea, beyond the final whiteness of the curving shore and the snow-speckled blackness of the rocks half submerged. But near at hand on the trees the snow was soft in bloom. Only the voice of the dying vicar spoke gray and querulous from behind. By the time the snowdrops were out, however, he was dead. He was dead. 
but with curious equanimity the returning woman watched the snowdrops on the edge of the grass below, blown white in the wind, but not to be blown away. She watched them fluttering and bobbing, the white shut flowers anchored by a thread to the grey-green grass, yet never blown away, not drifting with the wind. As she rose in the morning the dawn was beating up white, gusts of light blown like a thin snowstorm from the east, blown stronger and fiercer till the rose appeared and the gold, and the sea lit up below. She was impassive and indifferent, yet she was outside the enclosure of darkness. There passed a space of shadow again, the familiarity of dread worship, during which she was moved, oblivious to Cossette. There at first there was nothing, just grey nothing. But then one morning there was a light from the yellow jasmine caught her, and after that morning and evening the persistent ringing of thrushes from the shrubbery, till her heart, beaten upon, was forced to lift up its voice in rivalry and answer. Little tunes came into her mind. She was full of trouble, almost like anguish. Resistant, she knew she was beaten, and from fear of darkness turned to fear of light. She would have hidden herself indoors if she could. Above all, she craved for the peace and heavy oblivion of her old state. She could not bear to come to, to realize. The first pangs of this new parturition were so acute, she knew she could not bear it. She would rather remain out of life than be torn, mutilated, into this birth which she could not survive. She had not the strength to come to life now, in England, so foreign, skies so hostile. She knew she would die like an early colourless, scentless flower that the end of the winter puts forth mercilessly, and she wanted to harbour her modicum of twinkling life. But a sunshiny day came, full of the scent of a mezzeron tree, when bees were tumbling into the yellow crocuses, and she forgot. She felt like somebody else, not herself, a new person, quite glad. But she knew it was fragile, and she dreaded it. The vicar put pea-flower into the crocuses for his bees to roll in, and she laughed. Then night came, with brilliant stars that she knew of old, from her girlhood, and they flashed so bright she knew they were victors. She could neither wake nor sleep, as if crushed between the past and the future, like a flower that comes above ground to find a great stone lying above it. She was helpless. The bewilderment and helplessness continued. She was surrounded by great moving masses that must crush her, and there was no escape, save in the old obliviousness, the cold darkness she strove to retain. But the vicar showed her the eggs in the thrush's nest near the back door. She saw herself the mother thrush upon the nest, and the way her wings were spread, so eager down upon her secret. The tense, eager nesting wings moved her beyond endurance. She thought of them in the morning, when she heard the thrush whistling as he got up, and she thought, Why didn't I die out there? Why am I brought here? She was aware of people who passed around her, not as persons, but as looming presences. It was very difficult for her to adjust herself. In Poland the peasantry, the people, had been cattle to her. They had been her cattle that she owned and used. What were these people? Now she was coming awake, she was lost. But she had felt Brangwen go by almost as if he had brushed her. She had tingled in body as she had gone on up the road. After she had been with him in the marsh kitchen, the voice of her body had risen strong and insistent. Soon she wanted him. He was the man who had come nearest to her for her awakening. Always, however, between whiles, she lapsed into the old unconsciousness, indifference, and there was a will in her to save herself from living any more, but she would wake in the morning one day and feel her blood running, feel herself lying open like a flower unsheathed in the sun, insistent and potent with demand. She got to know him better, and her instinct fixed on him, just on him. Her impulse was strong against him, because he was not of her own sort. But one blind instinct led her to take him, to leave him, and then to relinquish herself to him. It would be safety. 
she felt the rooted safety of him and the life in him also he was young and very fresh the blue steady livingness of his eyes she enjoyed like morning he was very young then she lapsed again to stupor and indifference this however was bound to pass the warmth flowed through her she felt herself opening unfolding asking as a flower opens in full request under the sun as the beaks of tiny birds open flat to receive to receive and unfolded she turned to him straight to him and he came slowly afraid held back by uncouth fear and driven by a desire bigger than himself when she opened and turned to him then all that had been and all that was was gone from her she was as new as a flower that unsheathes itself and stands always ready waiting receptive he could not understand this he forced himself through lack of understanding to the adherence to the line of honourable courtship and sanctioned licensed marriage therefore after he had gone to the vicarage and asked for her she remained for some days held in this one spell open receptive to him before him he was roused to chaos he spoke to the vicar and gave in the bands then he stood to wait she remained attentive and instinctively expectant before him unfolded ready to receive him he could not act because of self-fear and because of his conception of honour towards her so he remained in a state of chaos and after a few days gradually she closed again away from him was sheathed over impervious to him oblivious then a black bottomless despair became real to him he knew what he had lost he felt he had lost it for good he knew what it was to have been in communication with her and to be cast off again in misery his heart like a heavy stone he went about unliving till gradually he became desperate lost his understanding was plunged in a revolt that knew no bounds inarticulate he moved with her at the marsh in violent gloomy wordless passion almost in hatred of her till gradually she became aware of him aware of herself with regard to him her blood stirred to life she began to open towards him to flow towards him again he waited till the spell was between them again till they were together within one rushing hastening flame and then again he was bewildered he was tied up as with cords and could not move to her so she came to him and unfastened the breast of his waistcoat and his shirt and put her hand on him needing to know him for it was cruel to her to be opened and offered to him yet not to know what he was not even that he was there she gave herself to the hour but he could not and he bungled in taking her so that he lived in suspense as if only half his faculties worked until the wedding she did not understand but the vagueness came over her again and the days lapsed by he could not get definitely into touch with her for the time being she let him go again he suffered very much from the thought of actual marriage the intimacy and nakedness of marriage he knew her so little they were so foreign to each other they were such strangers and they could not talk to each other when she talked of poland or of what had been it was all so foreign she scarcely communicated anything to him and when he looked at her an overmuch reverence and fear of the unknown changed the nature of his desire into a sort of worship holding her aloof from his physical desire self-thwarting she did not know this she did not understand they had looked at each other and had accepted each other it was so then there was nothing to balk at it was complete between them at the wedding his face was stiff and expressionless he wanted to drink to get rid of his forethought and afterthought to set the moment free but he could not the suspense only tightened at his heart the jesting and joviality and jolly broad insinuation of the guests only coiled him more he could not hear that which was impending obsessed him he could not get free she sat quiet with a strange still smile she was not afraid having accepted him she wanted to take him 
She belonged altogether to the hour, now. No future, no past, only this, her hour. She did not even notice him as she sat beside him at the head of the table. He was very near. Their coming together was close at hand. What more? As the time came for all the guests to go, her dark face was softly lighted, the bend of her head was proud, her grey eyes clear and dilated, so that the men could not look at her, and the women were elated by her. They served her. Very wonderful she was, as she bade farewell, her ugly wide mouth smiling with pride and recognition, her voice speaking softly and richly in the foreign accent, her dilated eyes ignoring one and all the departing guests. Her manner was gracious and fascinating, but she ignored the being of him or her to whom she gave her hand. And Brangwen stood beside her, giving his hearty handshake to his friends, receiving their regard gratefully, glad of their attention. His heart was tormented within him. He did not try to smile. The time of his trial and his admittance, his Gethsemane and his triumphal entry in one, had come now. Behind her there was so much unknown to him. When he approached her, he came to such a terrible, painful unknown. How could he embrace it and fathom it? How could he close his arms round all this darkness and hold it to his breast and give himself to it? What might not happen to him? If he stretched and strained for ever, he would never be able to grasp it all and to yield himself naked out of his own hands into the unknown power. How could a man be strong enough to take her, put his arms round her, and have her, and be sure he could conquer this awful unknown next to his heart? What was it, then, that she was, to which he must also deliver himself up, and which at the same time he must embrace, contain? He was to be her husband. It was established so, and he wanted it more than he wanted life or anything. She stood beside him in her silk dress, looking at him strangely, so that a certain terror, horror, took possession of him, because she was strange and impending, and he had no choice. He could not bear to meet her look from under her strange thick brows. "'Is it late?' she said. He looked at his watch. "'No, half-past eleven, he said and he made an excuse to go into the kitchen, leaving her standing in the room among the disorder and the drinking-glasses. Tilly was seated beside the fire in the kitchen, her head in her hands. She started up when he entered. "'Why haven't you gone to bed?' he said. "'I thought I'd better stop and lock up and do,' she said. Her agitation quietened him. He gave her some little order, then returned, steadied now, almost ashamed, to his wife." She stood a moment watching him as he moved with averted face. Then she said, "'You will be good to me, won't you?' She was small and girlish and terrible, with a queer, wide look in her eyes. His heart leaped in him. In anguish of love and desire, he went blindly to her and took her in his arms. "'I want to,' he said, as he drew her closer and closer in. She was soothed by the stress of his embrace and remained quite still, relaxed against him, mingling in to him, and he let himself go from past and future, was reduced to the moment with her, in which he took her and was with her, and there was nothing beyond. They were together in an elemental embrace beyond their superficial foreignness. But in the morning he was uneasy again. She was still foreign and unknown to him. Only within the fear was pride— Belief in himself as mate for her, and she, everything forgotten in her new hour of coming to life, radiated vigor and joy, so that he quivered to touch her. It made a great difference to him, marriage. Things became so remote and of so little significance as he knew the powerful source of his life. His eyes opened on a new universe, and he wondered in thinking of his triviality before. A new calm relationship showed to him in the things he saw, in the cattle he used, the young wheat as it eddied in a wind. And each time he returned home he went steadily, expectantly, like a man who goes to a profound, unknown satisfaction. At dinner-time he appeared in the doorway, hanging back a moment from entering, to see if she was there. 
He saw her setting the plates on the white scrubbed table. Her arms were slim. She had a slim body and full skirts. She had a dark, shapely head with close banded hair. Somehow it was her head, so shapely and poignant, that revealed her, his woman, to him. As she moved about, clothed closely, full skirted, and wearing her little silk apron, her dark hair smoothly parted, her head revealed itself to him in all its subtle, intrinsic beauty, and he knew she was his woman. He knew her essence, that it was his to possess, and he seemed to live thus in contact with her, in contact with the unknown, the unaccountable, and incalculable. They did not take much notice of each other consciously. "'I'm betimes,' he said. "'Yes,' she answered. He turned to the dogs, or to the child, if she was there. The little Anna played about the farm, flitting constantly in to call something to her mother, to fling her arms round her mother's skirts, to be noticed, perhaps caressed, then forgetting to slip out again. Then Brangwen, talking to the child, or to the dog between his knees, would be aware of his wife, as in her tight dark bodice and her lace fichu she was reaching up to the corner cupboard. He realized with a sharp pang that she belonged to him and he to her. He realized that he lived by her. Did he own her? Was she here forever, or might she go away? She was not really his. It was not a real marriage, this marriage between them. She might go away. He did not feel like a master, husband, father of her children. She belonged elsewhere. Any moment she might be gone, and he was ever drawn to her, drawn after her, with ever-raging, ever-unsatisfied desire. He must always turn home, wherever his steps were taking him, always to her, and he could never quite reach her, he could never quite be satisfied, never be at peace, because she might go away. At evening he was glad. Then, when he had finished in the yard and come in and washed himself, when the child was put to bed, he could sit on the other side of the fire with his beer on the hob and his long white pipe in his fingers, conscious of her there opposite him, as she worked at her embroidery, or as she talked to him, and he was safe with her now till morning. She was curiously self-sufficient, and did not say very much. Occasionally she lifted her head, her grey eyes shining with a strange light that had nothing to do with him or with this place, and would tell him about herself. She seemed to be back again in the past, chiefly in her childhood or her girlhood, with her father. She very rarely talked of her first husband— but sometimes, all shining-eyed, she was back at her own home, telling him about the riotous times, the trip to Paris with her father, tales of the mad acts of the peasants when a burst of religious, self-hurting fervor had passed over the country. She would lift her head and say, when they brought the railway across the country, they made afterwards smaller railways, of shorter width, to come down to our town a hundred miles. When I was a girl... Gisla, my German gouvernante, was very shocked, and she would not tell me. But I heard the servants talking. I remember. It was Pierre, the coachman, and my father and some of his friends, landowners. They had taken a wagon, a whole railway wagon, that you travel in. A railway carriage, said Brangwen. She laughed to herself. I know it was a great scandal. Yes, a whole wagon. And they had girls, you know fields, naked, all the wagon full, and so they came down to our village. They came through villages of the Jews, and it was a great scandal. Can you imagine all the countryside? And my mother, she did not like it. Gisla said to me, Madame, she must not know that you have heard such things. My mother, she used to cry, and she wished to beat my father, plainly beat him. He would say, when she cried, because he sold the forest, the wood, to jingle money in his pocket, and go to Warsaw, or Paris, or Kiev, when she said he must take back his word, he must not sell the forest, he would stand and say, I know, I know, I have heard it all, I have heard it all before, tell me some new thing, I know, I know, I know. Oh, but can you understand? I loved him when he stood there under the door, saying only, I know, I know, I know it all already. 
She could not change him, no, not if she killed herself for it, and she could change everybody else, but him, she could not change him. Brangwen could not understand. He had pictures of a cattle truck full of naked girls riding from nowhere to nowhere, of Lydia laughing because her father made great debts and said, I know, I know, of Jews running down the streets shouting in Yiddish, Don't do it, don't do it, and being cut down by demented peasants. She called them cattle, while she looked on interested and even amused. Of tutors and governesses and Paris and a convent. It was too much for him. And there she sat, telling the tales to the open space not to him, arrogating a curious superiority to him, a distance between them, something strange and foreign and outside his life, talking, rattling without rhyme or reason, laughing when he was shocked or astounded, condemning nothing, confounding his mind and making the whole world a chaos, without order or stability of any kind. Then, when they went to bed, he knew that he had nothing to do with her. She was back in her childhood. He was a peasant, a serf, a servant, a lover, a paramour, a shadow, a nothing. He lay still in amazement, staring at the room he knew so well, and wondering whether it was really there. The window, the chest of drawers, or whether it was merely a figment in the atmosphere. And gradually he grew into a raging fury against her. But because he was so much amazed, and there was as yet such a distance between them, and she was such an amazing thing to him, with all wonder opening out behind her, he made no retaliation on her, only he lay still and wide-eyed with rage, inarticulate, not understanding, but solid with hostility. And he remained wrathful and distinct from her, unchanged outwardly to her, but underneath a solid power of antagonism to her of which she became gradually aware, and it irritated her to be made aware of him as a separate power. She lapsed into a sort of sombre exclusion, a curious communion with mysterious powers, a sort of mystic dark state which drove him and the child nearly mad. He walked about for days, stiffened with resistance to her, stiff with a will to destroy her as she was. Then suddenly out of nowhere there was connection between them again. It came on him as he was working in the fields. The tension, the bond, burst, and the passionate flood broke forward into a tremendous, magnificent rush, so that he felt he could snap off the trees as he passed and create the world afresh. And when he arrived home there was no sign between them. He waited and waited till she came, and as he waited his limbs seemed strong and splendid to him. His hands seemed like passionate servants to him. Goodly! He felt a stupendous power in himself of life and of urgent strong blood. She was sure to come at last and touch him. Then he burst into flame for her and lost himself. They looked at each other, a deep laugh at the bottom of their eyes, and he went to take of her again, wholesale, mad to revel in the inexhaustible wealth of her, to bury himself in the depths of her in an inexhaustible exploration she all the while reveling in that he reveled in her, tossed all her secrets aside and plunged to that which was secret to her as well, whilst she quivered with fear in the last anguish of delight. What did it matter who they were, whether they knew each other or not? The hour passed away again. There was severance between them, and rage and misery and bereavement for her, and deposition and toiling at the mill with slaves for him, but no matter. They had had their hour, and should it chime again they were ready for it, ready to renew the game at the point where it was left off, on the edge of the outer darkness, when the secrets within the woman are game for the man, hunted doggedly, when the secrets of the woman are the man's adventure, and they both give themselves to the adventure. She was with child, and there was again the silence and distance between them. She did not want him, nor his secrets, nor his game. He was deposed. He was cast out. He seethed with fury at the small, ugly-mouthed woman who had nothing to do with him. Sometimes his anger broke on her, but she did not cry. She turned on him like a tiger, and there was battle. 
He had to learn to contain himself again, and he hated it. He hated her that she was not there for him, and he took himself off anywhere. But an instinct of gratitude and a knowledge that she would receive him back again, that later on she would be there for him again, prevented his straying very far. He cautiously did not go too far. He knew she might lapse into ignorance of him, lapse away from him, farther, 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 till she was lost to him. He had sense enough, premonition enough in himself to be aware of this, and to measure himself accordingly, for he did not want to lose her. He did not want her to lapse away. Cold, he called her. Selfish, only caring about herself a foreigner with a bad nature, caring really about nothing, having no proper feelings at the bottom of her, and no proper niceness. He raged and piled up accusations that had some measure of truth in them all, but a certain grace in him forbade him from going too far. He knew, and he quivered with rage and hatred, that she was all these vile things, that she was everything vile and detestable, but he had grace at the bottom of him which told him that, above all things, he did not want to lose her. He was not going to lose her. So he kept some consideration for her. He preserved some relationship. He went out more often to the Red Lion again, to escape the madness of sitting next to her when she did not belong to him, when she was as absent as any woman in indifference could be. He could not stay at home, so he went to the Red Lion, and sometimes he got drunk. But he preserved his measure. Some things between them he never forfeited. A tormented look came into his eyes, as if something were always dogging him. He glanced sharp and quick. He could not bear to sit still, doing nothing. He had to go out, to find company, to give himself away there, for he had no other outlet. He could not work to give himself out. He had not the knowledge. As the months of her pregnancy went on, she left him more and more alone. She was more and more unaware of him. His existence was annulled, and he felt bound down, bound, unable to stir, beginning to go mad, ready to rave, for she was quiet and polite, as if he did not exist, as one is quiet and polite to a servant. Nevertheless, she was great with his child, it was his turn to submit. She sat opposite him, sewing, her foreign face inscrutable and indifferent. He felt he wanted to break her into acknowledgment of him, into awareness of him. It was insufferable that she had so obliterated him. He would smash her into regarding him. He had a raging agony of desire to do so. But something bigger in him withheld him, kept him motionless. So he went out of the house for relief. Or he turned to the little girl for her sympathy and her love. He appealed with all his power to the small Anna. So soon they were like lovers, father and child. For he was afraid of his wife. As she sat there with bent head, silent, working or reading, but so unutterably silent that his heart seemed under the millstone of it, she became herself like the upper millstone lying on him, crushing him, as sometimes a heavy sky lies on the earth. Yet he knew he could not tear her away from the heavy obscurity into which she was merged. He must not try to tear her into recognition of himself, an agreement with himself. It were disastrous, impious, so let him rage as he might, he must withhold himself. But his wrists trembled and seemed mad, seemed as if they would burst. When, in November, the leaves came beating against the window-shutters with a lashing sound, he started, and his eyes flickered with flame. The dog looked up at him. He sunk his head to the fire, but his wife was startled. He was aware of her listening. "'They blow up with a rattle,' he said. "'What?' she asked. "'The leaves.' She sank away again. The strange leaves beating in the wind on the wood had come nearer than she. The tension in the room was overpowering. It was difficult for him to move his head. He sat with every nerve, every vein, every fiber of muscle in his body stretched on a tension. He felt like a broken arch thrust sickeningly out from support. For her response was gone. He thrust at nothing, and he remained himself. 
he saved himself from crashing down into nothingness, from being squandered into fragments, by sheer tension, sheer backward resistance. End of chapter 2, part 1Chapter Two, Part Two of the Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Two, Part Two. During the last months of her pregnancy, he went about in a surcharged, imminent state that did not exhaust itself. She was also depressed, and sometimes she cried. It needed so much life to begin afresh, after she had lost so lavishly. Sometimes she cried. Then he stood stiff, feeling his heart would burst, for she did not want him. She did not want even to be made aware of him. By the very puckering of her face, he knew that he must stand back, leave her intact, alone. For it was the old grief come back in her the old loss, the pain of the old life, the dead husband, the dead children. This was sacred to her, and he must not violate her with his comfort. For what she wanted, she would come to him. He stood aloof with turgid heart. He had to see her tears come, fall over her scarcely moving face, that only puckered sometimes, down under her breast that was so still, scarcely moving, and there was no noise, save now and again, when with a strange somnambulant movement she took her handkerchief and wiped her face and blew her nose, and went on with a noiseless weeping. He knew that any offer of comfort from himself would be worse than useless, hateful to her, jangling her. She must cry, but it drove him insane. His heart was scalded, his brain hurt in his head. He went away out of the house." His great and chiefest source of solace was the child. She had been at first aloof from him, reserved. However friendly she might seem one day, the next she would have lapsed to her original disregard of him, cold, detached, at her distance. The first morning after his marriage he had discovered it would not be so easy with the child. At the break of dawn he had started awake, hearing a small voice outside the door, saying plaintively, "'Mother!' He rose and opened the door. She stood on the threshold in her nightdress, as she had climbed out of bed, black eyes staring round and hostile, her fair hair sticking out in a wild fleece. The man and child confronted each other. "'I want my mother,' she said, jealously accenting the my. "'Come on, then,' he said gently." "'Where's my mother?' "'She's here. Come on.' The child's eyes, staring at the man with ruffled hair and beard, did not change. The mother's voice called softly. The little bare feet entered the room with trepidation. "'Mother!' "'Come, my dear.' The small bare feet approached swiftly. "'I wondered where you were,' came the plaintive voice. The mother stretched out her arms. The child stood beside the high bed. Brangwen lightly lifted the tiny girl with an ups -a daisy then took his own place in the bed again. "'Mother!' cried the child, as in anguish. "'What, my pet?' Anna wriggled close into her mother's arms, clinging tight, hiding from the fact of the man. Brangwen lay still and waited. There was a long silence." Then suddenly Anna looked round, as if she thought he would be gone. She saw the face of the man lying upturned to the ceiling. Her black eyes stared antagonistic from her exquisite face. Her arms clung tightly to her mother, afraid. He did not move for some time, not knowing what to say. His face was smooth and soft-skinned with love, his eyes full of soft light. He looked at her, scarcely moving his head his eyes smiling. "'Have you just wakened up?' he said. "'Go away!' she retorted, with a little darting forward of the head, something like a viper. 
Nay, he answered, I'm not going. You can go. Go away, came the sharp little command. There's room for you, he said. You can't send your father from his own bed, my little bird, said her mother pleasantly. The child glowered at him, miserable in her impotence. There's room for you as well, he said. It's a big bed enough. She glowered without answering, then turned and clung to her mother. She would not allow it. During the day she asked her mother several times, When are we going home, mother? We are at home, darling. We live here now. This is our house. We live here with your father. The child was forced to accept it, but she remained against the man. As night came on, she asked, "'Where are you going to sleep, mother?' "'I sleep with the father now.' And when Brangwen came in, the child asked fiercely, "'Why do you sleep with my mother? "'My mother sleeps with me,' her voice quivering. "'You come as well and sleep with both of us,' he coaxed. "'Mother!' she cried, turning, appealing against him. "'But I must have a husband, darling. "'All women must have a husband.' "'And you like to have a father with your mother, don't you?' said Brangwen. Anna glowered at him. She seemed to cogitate. "'No!' she cried fiercely at length. "'No, I don't want!' And slowly her face puckered. She sobbed bitterly. He stood and watched her. Sorry, but there could be no altering it. Which, when she knew, she became quiet. He was easy with her, talking to her, taking her to see the live creatures, bringing her the first chickens in his cap, taking her to gather the eggs, letting her throw crusts to the horse. She would easily accompany him and take all he had to give, but she remained neutral still. She was curiously, incomprehensibly jealous of her mother, always anxiously concerned about her. If Brangwen drove with his wife to Nottingham, Anna ran about happily enough, or unconcerned, for a long time. Then, as afternoon came on, there was only one cry, "'I want my mother! I want my mother!' and a bitter, pathetic sobbing that soon had the soft-hearted Tilly sobbing too. The child's anguish was that her mother was gone, gone. Yet, as a rule, Anna seemed cold, resenting her mother, critical of her. It was, "'I don't like you to do that, mother!' or, I don't like you to say that. She was a sore problem to Brangwen and to all the people at the marsh. As a rule, however, she was active, lightly flitting about the farmyard, only appearing now and again to assure herself of her mother. Happy she never seemed, but quick, sharp, absorbed, full of imagination and changeability. Tilly said she was bewitched, but it did not matter, so long as she did not cry. There was something heart-rending about Anna's crying. Her childish anguish seemed so utter and so timeless, as if it were a thing of all the ages. She made playmates of the creatures of the farmyard, talking to them, telling them the stories she had from her mother, counselling them and correcting them. Brangwen found her at the gate leading to the paddock and to the duck-pond. She was peering through the bars and shouting to the stately white geese that stood in a curving line, "'You're not to call at people when they want to come. You must not do it!' The heavy-balanced birds looked at the fierce little face and the fleece of keen hair thrust between the bars, and they raised their heads and swayed off, producing the long, can can king protesting noise of geese, rocking their ship-like, beautiful white bodies in a line beyond the gate." "'You're naughty! You're naughty!' cried Anna, tears of dismay and vexation in her eyes, and she stamped her slipper. "'Why, what are they doing?' said Brangwen. "'They won't let me come in,' she said, turning her flushed little face to him. "'Yeah, they will. You can go in if you want to,' and he pushed open the gate for her. She stood irresolute, looking at the group of bluey-white geese standing monumental under the grey cold day. "'Go on,' he said. She marched valiantly a few steps in. Her little body started convulsively at the sudden derisive can can ank of the geese. A blankness spread over her. The geese trailed away with uplifted heads under the low gray sky. "'They don't know you,' said Brangwen. 
"'You should tell him what your name is.' "'They're naughty to shout at me,' she flashed. "'They think you don't live here,' he said. Later he found her at the gate, calling shrilly and imperiously, "'My name is Anna, Anna Lensky, and I live here because Mr. Brangwen's my father now. He is, yes, he is, and I live here.' This pleased Brangwen very much. And gradually, without knowing it herself, she clung to him, in her lost, childish, desolate moments, when it was good to creep up to something big and warm, and bury her little self in his big, unlimited being. Instinctively he was careful of her, careful to recognize her, and to give himself to her disposal. She was difficult of her affections. For Tilly she had a childish, essential contempt, almost dislike, because the poor woman was such a servant. The child would not let the serving woman attend to her, do intimate things for her, not for a long time. She treated her as one of an inferior race. Brangwen did not like it. "'Why aren't you fond of Tilly?' he asked. "'Because, because, because she looks at me with her eyes bent.' Then gradually she accepted Tilly as belonging to the household, never as a person. For the first weeks the black eyes of the child were forever on the watch. Brangwen, good-humoured but impatient, spoiled by Tilly, was an easy blusterer. If for a few minutes he upset the household with his noisy impatience, he found at the end the child glowering at him with intense black eyes, and she was sure to dart forward her little head like a serpent with her biting, "'Go away!' "'I'm not going away,' he shouted, irritated at last. "'Go yourself. Hustle. Stir the sen. Hop!' And he pointed to the door. The child backed away from him, pale with fear. Then she gathered up courage, seeing him become patient. "'We don't live with you,' she said, thrusting forward her little head at him. "'You—you're—you're you're a bowmaker. "'A what?' he shouted. Her voice wavered, but it came. A bow makel. Eh? And you're a co makel. She meditated, then she hissed forwards her head. I'm not. Not what? A co makel. No more am I a bow makel. He was really cross. Other times she would say, My mother doesn't live here. Oh, eh? I want her to go away. Then wants your portion, he replied laconically. So they drew nearer together. He would take her with him when he went out in the trap. The horse ready at the gate, he came noisily into the house, which seemed quiet and peaceful, till he appeared to set everything awake. Now then, Topsy, pop into thy bonnet. The child drew herself up, resenting the indignity of the address. I can't fasten my bonnet myself, she said haughtily. Not man enough yet, he said tying the ribbons under her chin with clumsy fingers. She held up her face to him. Her little bright red lips moved as he fumbled under her chin. "'You talk nonsense,' she said, re-echoing one of his phrases. "'That face shouts for the pump,' he said, and taking out a big red handkerchief that smelled of strong tobacco, began wiping round her mouth. "'Is Kitty waiting for me?' she asked. "Eh?" he said. Let's finish wiping your face. It'll pass with a cat lick. She submitted prettily. Then, when he let her go, she began to skip, with a curious flicking up of one leg behind her. Now, my young buck rabbit, he said. Slippy. She came and was shaken into her coat, and the two set off. She sat very close beside him in the gig, tucked tightly, feeling his big body sway against her, very splendid. She loved the rocking of the gig when his big live body swayed upon her, against her. She laughed a poignant little shrill laugh, and her black eyes glowed. She was curiously hard, and then passionately tender-hearted. Her mother was ill. The child stole about on tiptoe in the bedroom for hours, being nurse, and doing the thing thoughtfully and diligently. Another day her mother was unhappy. Anna would stand with her legs apart, glowering, balancing on the sides of her slippers. She laughed when the goslings wriggled in Tilly's hand. 
As the pellets of food were rammed down their throats with a skewer, she laughed nervously. She was hard and imperious with the animals, squandering no love, running about amongst them like a cruel mistress. Summer came and hay harvest. Anna was a brown, elfish mite dancing about. Tilly always marveled over her more than she loved her. But always in the child was some anxious connection with the mother. So long as Mrs. Brangwen was all right, the little girl played about and took very little notice of her. But corn harvest went by, the autumn drew on, and the mother, the later months of her pregnancy beginning, was strange and detached. Brangwen began to knit his brows. The old unhealthy uneasiness, the unskinned susceptibility, came on the child again. If she went to the fields with her father, then instead of playing about carelessly, it was, I want to go home. Home? Why, there's not but this minute come. I want to go home. What for? What ails thee? I want my mother. Thy mother? Thy mother none wants thee. I want to go home. There would be tears in a moment. Can to find to road, then? and he watched her scudding, silent and intent, along the hedge-bottom, at a steady, anxious pace, till she turned and was gone through the gateway. Then he saw her two fields off, still pressing forward, small and urgent. His face was clouded as he turned to plough up the stubble. The year drew on. In the hedges the berries shone red and twinkling above bare twigs. Robins were seen— Great droves of birds dashed like spray from the fallow. Rooks appeared, black and flapping down to earth. The ground was cold as he pulled the turnips. The roads were churned deep in mud. Then the turnips were pitted, and work was slack. Inside the house it was dark and quiet. The child flitted uneasily round, and now and again came her plaintive startled cry, "'Mother!' Mrs. Brangwen was heavy and unresponsive, tired, lapsed back. Brangwen went on working out of doors. At evening, when he came in to milk, the child would run behind him. Then, in the cosy cow-sheds, with the doors shut and the air looking warm by the light of the hanging lantern, above the branching horns of the cows, she would stand watching his hands, squeezing rhythmically the teats of the placid beast, watch the froth and the leaping squirt of milk, watch his hand sometimes rubbing slowly, understandingly, upon a hanging udder, so they kept each other company, but at a distance, rarely speaking. The darkest days of the year came on. The child was fretful, sighing as if some oppression were on her, running hither and thither without relief, and Brangwen went about at his work, heavy, his heart heavy as the sodden earth. The winter nights fell early. The lamp was lighted before tea-time. The shutters were closed. They were all shut into the room with attention and stress. Mrs. Brangwen went early to bed, Anna playing on the floor beside her. Brangwen sat in the emptiness of the downstairs room, smoking, scarcely conscious even of his own misery, and very often he went out to escape it. Christmas passed. The wet, drenched, cold days of January recurred monotonously, with now and then a brilliance of blue flashing in, when Brangwen went out into a morning like crystal, when every sound rang again, and the birds were many and sudden and brusque in the hedges. Then an elation came over him in spite of everything. Whether his wife were strange or sad, or whether he craved for her to be with him, it did not matter. The air rang with clear noises. The sky was like crystal, like a bell, and the earth was hard. Then he worked and was happy, his eyes shining, his cheeks flushed, and the zest of life was strong in him. The birds pecked busily round him. The horses were fresh and ready. The bare branches of the trees flung themselves up like a man yawning, taut with energy. The twigs radiated off into the clear light. He was alive and full of zest for it all, and if his wife were heavy, separated from him, extinguished, then let her be, let him remain himself. Things would be as they would be. 
Meanwhile, he heard the ringing crow of a cockerel in the distance. He saw the pale shell of the moon he faced on a blue sky. So he shouted to the horses and was happy. If, driving into Ilkston, a fresh young woman were going in to do her shopping, he hailed her and reined in his horse and picked her up. Then he was glad to have her near him. His eyes shone, his voice laughing, teasing in a warm fashion, made the poise of her head more beautiful. Her blood ran quicker. They were both stimulated. The morning was fine. What did it matter that at the bottom of his heart was care and pain? It was at the bottom. Let it stop at the bottom. His wife, her suffering, her coming pain, well, it must be so. She suffered, but he was out of doors, full in life, and it would be ridiculous, indecent, to pull a long face and to insist on being miserable. He was happy this morning driving to town, with the hoofs of the horse spanking the hard earth. Well, he was happy, if half the world were weeping at the funeral of the other half, and it was a jolly girl sitting beside him, and woman was immortal, whatever happened, whoever turned towards death. Let the misery come when it could not be resisted. The evening arrived later, very beautiful, with a rosy flush hovering above the sunset and passing away into violet and lavender, with turquoise green north and south in the sky, and in the east a great yellow moon hanging heavy and radiant. It was magnificent to walk between the sunset and the moon on a road where little holly trees thrust black into the rose and lavender, and starlings flickered in droves across the light. But what was the end of the journey? The pain came right enough, later on, when his heart and his feet were heavy, his brain dead, his life stopped. One afternoon the pains began. Mrs. Brangwen was put to bed. The midwife came. Night fell. The shutters were closed. Brangwen came in to tea, to the loaf and the pewter teapot, the child, silent and quivering, playing with glass beads, the house, empty it seemed, or exposed to the winter night as if it had no walls. Sometimes there sounded, long and remote in the house, vibrating through everything, the moaning cry of a woman in labor. Brangwen, sitting downstairs, was divided. His lower, deeper self was with her, bound to her, suffering. But the big shell of his body remembered the sound of owls that used to fly round the farmstead when he was a boy. He was back in his youth, a boy, haunted by the sound of the owls, waking up his brother to speak to him. And his mind drifted away to the birds, their solemn, dignified faces, their flight so soft and broad-winged. And then to the birds his brother had shot, fluffy, dust-colored, dead heaps of softness, with faces absurdly asleep. It was a queer thing, a dead owl. He lifted his cup to his lips. He watched the child with the beads, but his mind was occupied with owls, and the atmosphere of his boyhood, with his brothers and sisters. Elsewhere, fundamental, he was with his wife in labor. The child was being brought forth out of their one flesh. He and she one flesh out of which life must be put forth. The rent was not in his body, but it was of his body. On her the blows fell, but the quiver ran through to him, to his last fibre. She must be torn asunder for life to come forth. Yet still they were one flesh, and still from further back the life came out of him to her, and still he was the unbroken that has the broken rock in its arms, their flesh was one rock from which the life gushed, out of her who was smitten and rent, from him who quivered and yielded. He went upstairs to her. As he came to the bedside, she spoke to him in Polish. "'Is it very bad?' he asked. She looked at him, and, oh, the weariness to her of the effort to understand another language, the weariness of hearing him, attending to him, making out who he was, as he stood there, fair-bearded and alien, looking at her. She knew something of him, of his eyes, but she could not grasp him. She closed her eyes. He turned away, white to the gills. 
"'It's not so very bad,' said the midwife. He knew he was a strain on his wife. He went downstairs. The child glanced up at him, frightened. "'I want my mother,' she quavered. "'Aye, but she's badly,' he said mildly, unheeding. She looked at him with lost, frightened eyes. "'Has she got a headache?' "'No. She's going to have a baby.' The child looked round. He was unaware of her. She was alone again in terror. "'I want my mother!' came the cry of panic. "'Let Tilly undress you,' he said. "'You're tired.' There was another silence. Again came the cry of labor. "'I want my mother!' rang automatically from the wincing, panic-stricken child that felt cut off and lost in a horror of desolation. Tilly came forward, her heart wrung. "'Come and let me undress her, then, pet lamb,' she crooned. "'You shall have your mother in the morning. Don't you fret, my ducky. Never mind, angel.' But Anna stood upon the sofa, her back to the wall. "'I want my mother!' she cried, her little face quivering, and the great tears of childish, utter anguish falling. "'She's poorly, my lamb. She's poorly to-night, but she'll be better by morning.' "'Oh, don't cry. Don't cry, love. She doesn't want you to cry, precious little heart. No, she doesn't.' Tilly took gently hold of the child's skirts. Anna snatched back her dress and cried, in a little hysteria, "'No, you're not to undress me. I want my mother.' And her child's face was running with grief and tears, her body shaken. "'Oh, but let Tilly undress you. Let Tilly undress you, who loves you. Don't be willful to-night.' "'Mother's poorly. She doesn't want you to cry.' The child sobbed distractedly. She could not hear. "'I want my mother,' she wept. "'When you're undressed, you shall go up to see your mother. "'When you're undressed, pet. "'When you've let Tilly undress you, "'when you're a little jewel in your nighty, love. "'Oh, don't you cry, don't you?' Brangwen sat stiff in his chair. He felt his brain going tighter. He crossed over the room, aware only of the maddening sobbing. "'Don't make a noise,' he said, and a new fear shook the child from the sound of his voice. She cried mechanically, her eyes looking watchful through her tears, in terror, alert to what might happen. "'I want my mother,' quavered the sobbing, blind voice. A shiver of irritation went over the man's limbs. It was the utter persistent unreason, the maddening blindness of the voice and the crying. "'You must come and be undressed,' he said, in a quiet voice that was thin with anger, and he reached his hand and grasped her. He felt her body catch in a convulsive sob, but he too was blind and intent, irritated into mechanical action. He began to unfasten her little apron. She would have shrunk from him, but could not, so her small body remained in his grasp while he fumbled at the little buttons and tapes, unthinking, intent, unaware of anything but the irritation of her. Her body was held taut and resistant. He pushed off the little dress and the petticoats, revealing the white arms. She kept stiff, overpowered, violated. He went on with his task, and all the while she sobbed, choking, "'I want my mother!' He was unheedingly silent, his face stiff. The child was now incapable of understanding. She had become a little mechanical thing of fixed will. She wept, her body convulsed, her voice repeating the same cry. "'Eh, hey, dear o' me!' cried Tilly, becoming distracted herself. Brangwen, slow, clumsy, blind, intent, got off all the little garments, and stood the child naked in its shift upon the sofa. "'Where's her nightie?' he asked. Tilly brought it, and he put it on her. Anna did not move her limbs to his desire. He had to push them into place. She stood, with fixed blind will, resistant, a small, convulsed, unchangeable thing, weeping ever and repeating the same phrase. He lifted one foot after the other, pulled off slippers and socks. She was ready. "'Do you want a drink?' he asked. She did not change. Unheeding, uncaring, she stood on the sofa, standing back, alone, her hands shut and half-lifted, her face all tears, raised and blind, and through the sobbing and choking came the broken, "'I want my mother!' "'Do you want a drink?' he said again. There was no answer. 
He lifted the stiff, denying body between his hands. Its stiff blindness made a flash of rage go through him. He would like to break it. He set the child on his knee and sat again in his chair beside the fire, the wet, sobbing, inarticulate noise going on near his ear, the child sitting stiff, not yielding to him or anything, not aware. A new degree of anger came over him. What did it all matter? What did it matter if the mother talked Polish and cried in labor? If this child were stiff with resistance and crying, why take it to heart? Let the mother cry in labor, let the child cry in resistance, since they would do so. Why should he fight against it? Why resist? Let it be, if it were so. Let them be, as they were, if they insisted. And in a daze he sat, offering no fight. The child cried on. The minutes ticked away. A sort of torpor was on him. It was some little time before he came to, and turned to attend to the child. He was shocked by her little wet blinded face. A bit dazed, he pushed back the wet hair. Like a living statue of grief, her blind face cried on. Nay, he said, not as bad as that. It's not as bad as that, Anna, my child. Come, what are you crying for so much? Come, stop now. It'll make you sick. I wipe you dry. Don't wet your face any more. Don't cry any more, wet tears. Don't. It's better not to. Don't cry. It's not so bad as all that. Hush now. Hush. Let it be enough. His voice was queer and distant and calm. He looked at the child. She was beside herself now. He wanted her to stop. He wanted it all to stop, to become natural. Come, he said, rising to turn away. We'll go and supper up the beast. He took a big shawl, folded her round, and went out into the kitchen for a lantern. "'You're never taking the child out of a night like this,' said Tilly. "'Eh, hey, it'll quieten her,' he answered. It was raining. The child was suddenly still, shocked, finding the rain on its face, the darkness. "'We'll just give the cows their something to eat afore they go to bed,' Brangwen was saying to her, holding her close and sure. There was a trickling of water into the butt, a burst of raindrops sputtering onto her shawl, and the light of the lantern swinging, flashing on a wet pavement and the base of a wet wall. Otherwise it was black darkness. One breathed darkness. He opened the doors, upper and lower, and they entered into the high dry barn that smelled warm even if it were not warm. He hung the lantern on the nail and shut the door. They were in another world now. The light shed softly on the timbered barn, on the whitewashed walls, and the great heap of hay. Instruments cast their shadows largely. A ladder rose to the dark arch of a loft. Outside there was the driving rain. Inside, the softly illuminated stillness and calmness of the barn. Holding the child on one arm, he set about preparing the food for the cows, filling a pan with chopped hay and brewer's grains and a little meal. The child, all wonder, watched what he did. A new being was created in her for the new conditions. Sometimes a little spasm, eddying from the bygone storm of sobbing, shook her small body. Her eyes were wide and wondering, pathetic. She was silent, quite still. In a sort of dream his heart sunk to the bottom, leaving the surface of him still, quite still. He rose with the pan full of food, carefully balancing the child on one arm, the pan in the other hand. The silky fringe of the shawl swayed softly. Grains and hay trickled to the floor. He went along a dimly lit passage behind the mangers, where the horns of the cows pricked out of the obscurity. The child shrank. He balanced stiffly rested the pan on the manger wall, and tipped out the food, half to this cow, half to the next. There was a noise of chains running, as the cows lifted or dropped their heads sharply, then a contented soothing sound, a long snuffing as the beasts ate in silence. The journey had to be performed several times. There was the rhythmic sound of the shovel in the barn, then the man returned, walking stiffly between the two weights the face of the child peering out from the shawl. 
Then the next time, as he stooped, she freed her arm and put it round his neck, clinging soft and warm, making all easier. The beasts fed, he dropped the pan and sat down on a box to arrange the child. "'Will the cows go to sleep now?' she said, catching her breath as she spoke. "'Yes.' "'Will they eat all their stuff up first? "'Yes, hark at them.' and the two sat listening to the snuffing and breathing of cows feeding in the sheds communicating with this small barn. The lantern shed a soft, steady light from one wall. All outside was still in the rain. He looked down at the silky folds of the paisley shawl. It reminded him of his mother. She used to go to church in it. He was back again in the old irresponsibility and security, a boy at home. The two sat very quiet. His mind, in a sort of trance, seemed to become more and more vague. He held the child close to him. A quivering little shudder, re-echoing from her sobbing, went down her limbs. He held her closer. Gradually she relaxed. The eyelids began to sink over her dark, watchful eyes. As she sank to sleep, his mind became blank. When he came to, as if from sleep, he seemed to be sitting in a timeless stillness. What was he listening for? He seemed to be listening for some sound a long way off, from beyond life. He remembered his wife. He must go back to her. The child was asleep, the eyelids not quite shut, showing a slight film of black pupil between. Why did she not shut her eyes? Her mouth was also a little open. He rose quickly and went back to the house. "'Is she asleep?' whispered Tilly. He nodded. The servant-woman came to look at the child who slept in the shawl, with cheeks flushed hot and red, and a whiteness, a wanness, round the eyes. "'God a mercy!' whispered Tilly, shaking her head. He pushed off his boots and went upstairs with the child. He became aware of the anxiety grasped tight at his heart because of his wife but he remained still. The house was silent, save for the wind outside, and the noisy trickling and splattering of water in the water butts. There was a slit of light under his wife's door. He put the child into bed, wrapped as she was in the shawl, for the sheets would be cold. Then he was afraid that she might not be able to move her arms, so he loosened her. The black eyes opened, rested on him vacantly, sank shut again. He covered her up. The last little quiver from the sobbing shook her breathing. This was his room, the room he had had before he married. It was familiar. He remembered what it was to be a young man, untouched. He remained suspended. The child slept, pushing her small fists from the shawl. He could tell the woman her child was asleep but he must go to the other landing. He started. There was the sound of the owls, the moaning of the woman. What an uncanny sound! It was not human, at least to a man. He went down to her room, entering softly. She was lying still, with eyes shut, pale, tired. His heart leapt, fearing she was dead, yet he knew perfectly well she was not. He saw the way her hair went loose over her temples. Her mouth was shut with suffering and a sort of grin. She was beautiful to him, but it was not human. He had a dread of her as she lay there. What had she to do with him? She was other than himself. Something made him go and touch her fingers that were still grasped on the sheet. Her brown-gray eyes opened and looked at him. She did not know him as himself but she knew him as the man. She looked at him as a woman in childbirth looks at the man who begot the child in her, an impersonal look in the extreme hour, female to male. Her eyes closed again. A great scalding peace went over him, burning his heart and his entrails, passing off into the infinite. When her pains began afresh, tearing her, he turned aside and could not look, but his heart in torture was at peace, his bowels were glad. He went downstairs and to the door outside, 
lifted his face to the rain and felt the darkness striking unseen and steadily upon him. The swift unseen threshing of the night upon him silenced him, and he was overcome. He turned away indoors humbly. There was the infinite world, eternal, unchanging, as well as the world of life. End of chapter 2「Chapter Three of the Rainbow」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Three Childhood of Anna Lensky. Tom Brangwen never loved his own son as he loved his stepchild Anna. When they told him it was a boy, he had a thrill of pleasure. He liked the confirmation of fatherhood. It gave him satisfaction to know he had a son. But he felt not very much outgoing to the baby itself. He was its father, that was enough. He was glad that his wife was mother of his child. She was serene, a little bit shadowy, as if she were transplanted. In the birth of the child, she seemed to lose connection with her former self. She became now really English, really Mrs. Brangwen. Her vitality, however, seemed lowered. She was still, to Brangwen, immeasurably beautiful. She was still passionate, with a flame of being. But the flame was not robust and present. Her eyes shone, her face glowed for him, but like some flower opened in the shade that could not bear the full light. She loved the baby, but even this, with a sort of dimness, a faint absence about her, a shadowiness even in her mother-love. When Brangwen saw her nursing his child, happy, absorbed in it, a pain went over him like a thin flame, for he perceived how he must subdue himself in his approach to her, and he wanted again the robust moral exchange of love and passion such as he had had at first with her, at one time and another, when they were matched at their highest intensity. This was the one experience for him now, and he wanted it, always with remorseless craving. She came to him again, with the same lifting of her mouth as had driven him almost mad with trammelled passion at first. She came to him again, and his heart, delirious in delight and readiness, he took her, and it was almost as before. Perhaps it was quite as before. At any rate, it made him no perfection. It established in him a constant, eternal knowledge. But it died down before he wanted it to die down. She was finished. She could take no more, and he was not exhausted. He wanted to go on. But it could not be. So he had to begin the bitter lesson, to abate himself, to take less than he wanted. For she was woman to him. All other women were her shadows, for she had satisfied him, and he wanted it to go on, and it could not. However he raged, and filled with suppression that became hot and bitter, hated her in his soul that she did not want him, however he had mad outbursts, and drank and made ugly scenes, still he knew he was only kicking against the pricks. It was not, he had to learn, that she would not want him enough as much as he demanded that she should want him. It was that she could not. She could only want him in her own way and to her own measure, and she had spent much life before he found her as she was, the woman who could take him and give him fulfillment. She had taken him and given him fulfillment. She still could do so in her own times and ways, but he must control himself, measure himself to her. He wanted to give her all his love, all his passion, all his essential energy, but it could not be. He must find other things than her, other centers of living. She sat close and impregnable with the child, and he was jealous of the child. But he loved her, and time came to give some sort of course to his troublesome current of life, so that it did not foam and flood and make misery. 
he formed another centre of love in her child Anna. Gradually a part of his stream of life was diverted to the child, relieving the main flood to his wife. Also he sought the company of men. He drank heavily now and again. The child ceased to have so much anxiety for her mother after the baby came. Seeing the mother with the baby boy, delighted and serene and secure, Anna was at first puzzled, then gradually she became indignant, and at last her little life settled on its own swivel. She was no more strained and distorted to support her mother. She became more childish, not so abnormal, not charged with cares she could not understand. The charge of the mother, the satisfying of the mother, had devolved elsewhere than on her. Gradually the child was freed. She became an independent, forgetful little soul, loving from her own centre. Of her own choice, she then loved Brangwen most, or most obviously. For these two made a little life together. They had a joint activity. It amused him at evening to teach her to count, or to say her letters. He remembered for her all the little nursery rhymes and childish songs that lay forgotten at the bottom of his brain. At first she thought them rubbish, but he laughed and she laughed. They became to her a huge joke. Old King Cole she thought was Brangwen. Mother Hubbard was Tilly. Her mother was the old woman who lived in a shoe. It was a huge, it was a frantic delight to the child, this nonsense, after her years with her mother, after the poignant folk tales she had had from her mother, which always troubled and mystified her soul. She shared a sort of recklessness with her father, a complete chosen carelessness that had the laugh of ridicule in it. He loved to make her voice go high and shouting and defiant with laughter. The baby was dark-skinned and dark-haired like the mother, and had hazel eyes. Brangwen called him the blackbird. Hello, Brangwen would cry, starting as he heard the wail of the child, announcing it wanted to be taken out of the cradle. There's the blackbird tuning up. The blackbird's singing, Anna would shout with delight. The blackbird's singing. When the pie was opened, Brangwen shouted in his bawling bass voice, going over to the cradle, the bird began to sing. "'Wasn't it a dainty dish to set before a king?' cried Anna, her eyes flashing with joy as she uttered the cryptic words, looking at Brangwen for confirmation. He sat down with the baby, saying loudly, "'Sing up, my lad, sing up!' And the baby cried loudly, and Anna shouted lustily, dancing in wild bliss, "'Sing a song of sixpence, pocket full of posies, Asha, Asha!' Then she stopped suddenly in silence and looked at Brangwen again, her eyes flashing as she shouted loudly and delightedly, "'I've got it wrong! I've got it wrong!' "'Oh, my sirs,' said Tilly, entering, "'what a racket!' Brangwen hushed the child, and Anna flipped and danced on. She loved her wild bursts of rowdiness with her father. Tilly hated it. Mrs. Brangwen did not mind. Anna did not care much for other children— she domineered them. She treated them as if they were extremely young and incapable. To her, they were little people. They were not her equals. So she was mostly alone, flying round the farm, entertaining the farmhands, and Tilly and the servant girl, whirring on and never ceasing. She loved driving with Brangwen in the trap. Then, sitting high up and bowling along, her passion for eminence and dominance was satisfied. She was like a little savage in her arrogance. She thought her father important. She was installed beside him on high, and they spanked along beside the high flourishing hedge-tops, surveying the activity of the countryside. When people shouted a greeting to him from the road below, and Brangwen shouted jovially back, her little voice was soon heard shrilling along with his, followed by her chuckling laugh, when she looked up at her father with bright eyes, and they laughed at each other. And soon it was the custom for the passer-by to sing out, "'How are you, Tom? Well, my lady?' Or else, "'Mornin', Tom. Mornin', my lass.' Or else, "'You're off together, then.' Or else, "'You're looking rarely, you two.' Anna would respond with her father, "'How are you, John? Good morning, William.' 
Ay, makin' for Darby, shrilling as loudly as she could. Though often in response to, You're off out a bit, then, she would reply, Yes, we are, to the great joy of all. She did not like the people who saluted him, and did not salute her. She went into the public house with him, if he had to call, and often sat beside him in the bar parlour as he drank his beer or brandy. The landladies paid court to her, in the obsequious way landladies have. "'Well, little lady, and what's your name?' "'Anna Brangwen,' came the immediate haughty answer. "'Indeed it is. And do you like driving in a trap with your father?' "'Yes,' said Anna, shy but bored by these inanities. She had a touch-me-not way of blighting the inane inquiries of grown-up people. "'My word, she's a false little thing,' the landlady would say to Brangwen. "'Hey,' he answered, not encouraging comments on the child. Then there followed the present of a biscuit or of cake, which Anna accepted as her dues. "'What does she say that I'm a false little thing?' the small girl asked afterwards. "'She means you're a sharp shins,' Anna hesitated. She did not understand. Then she laughed at some absurdity she found. Soon he took her every week to market with him. "'I can come, can't I?' she asked every Saturday or Thursday morning, when he made himself look fine in his dress of a gentleman farmer, and his face clouded at having to refuse her. So at last he overcame his own shyness and tucked her beside him. They drove into Nottingham and put up at the Black Swan. So far all right. Then he wanted to leave her at the inn, but he saw her face and knew it was impossible. So he mustered his courage and set off with her, holding her hand, to the cattle market. She stared in bewilderment, flitting silent at his side. But in the cattle market she shrank from the press of men, all men, all in heavy filthy boots and leathern leggings, and the road underfoot was all nasty with cow muck, and it frightened her to see the cattle in the square pens. So many horns, and so little enclosure, and such a madness of men and a yelling of drovers. Also she felt her father was embarrassed by her, and ill at ease. He brought her a cake at the refreshment booth, and set her on a seat. A man hailed him. "'Good morning, Tom. That thine, then?' And the bearded farmer jerked his head at Anna. "'Eh,' hey, said Brangwen, deprecating. "'I didn't know that one that old.' "'No, it's my missus's.' "'Oh, that's it.' And the man looked at Anna as if she were some odd little cattle. She glowered with black eyes. Brangwen left her there, in charge of the barman, whilst he went to see about the selling of some young sturks. Farmers, butchers, drovers, dirty, uncouth men from whom she shrank instinctively, stared down at her as she sat on her seat, then went to get their drink, talking in unabated tones. All was big and violent about her. "'Whose child met that be?' they asked of the barman. "'It belongs to Tom Brangwen.' The child sat on in neglect, watching the door for her father. He never came. Many, many men came, but not he, and she sat like a shadow. She knew one did not cry in such a place, and every man looked at her inquisitively. She shut herself away from them. A deep, gathering coldness of isolation took hold on her. He was never coming back. She sat on, frozen, unmoving. When she had become blank and timeless, he came, and she slipped off her seat to him like one come back from the dead. He had sold his beast as quickly as he could, but all the business was not finished. He took her again through the hurtling welter of the cattle market. Then at last they turned and went out through the gate. He was always hailing one man or another, always stopping to gossip about land and cattle and horses and other things she did not understand standing in the filth and the smell among the legs and great boots of men, and always she heard the questions, "'What lass is that, then? I didn't know that one of that age.' "'It belongs to my missus.' 
Anna was very conscious of her derivation from her mother in the end, and of her alienation. But at last they were away, and Brangwen went with her into a little dark ancient eating-house in the Bridlesmith Gate. They had cow's tail soup, and meat and cabbage and potatoes. Other men, other people, came into the dark vaulted place to eat. Anna was wide-eyed and silent with wonder. Then they went into the big market, into the corn exchange, then to shops. He bought her a little book off a stall. He loved buying things, odd things that he thought would be useful. Then they went to the black swan, and she drank milk and he brandy, and they harnessed the horse and drove off up the Derby Road. She was tired out with wonder and marvelling, but the next day, when she thought of it, she skipped, flipping her leg in the odd dance she did, and talked the whole time of what had happened to her, of what she had seen. It lasted her all the week, and the next Saturday she was eager to go again. She became a familiar figure in the cattle market, sitting waiting in the little booth, but she liked best to go to Derby. There her father had more friends, and she liked the familiarity of the smaller town, the nearness of the river, the strangeness that did not frighten her. It was so much smaller. She liked the covered-in market and the old women. She liked the George Inn where her father put up. The landlord was Brangwen's old friend, and Anna was made much of. She sat many a day in the cosy parlour talking to Mr. Wigginton, a fat man with red hair, the landlord, and when the farmers all gathered at twelve o'clock for dinner, she was a little heroine. At first she would only glower or hiss at these strange men with their uncouth accent, but they were good-humoured. She was a little oddity, with her fierce fair hair like spun glass, sticking out in a flamy halo round the apple-blossom face and the black eyes, and the men liked an oddity. She kindled their attention. She was very angry because Marriott, a gentleman farmer from Ambergate, called her the little pole-cat. "'Why, you're a pole-cat,' he said to her. "'I'm not,' she flashed. "'You are. That's just how a pole-cat goes.' She thought about it. "'Well, you're—you're—' you're, she began. "'I'm what?' She looked him up and down. You're a bow-legged man, which he was. There was a roar of laughter. They loved her that she was indomitable. Ah, said Marriott, only a pole-cat says that. Well, I am a pole-cat, she flamed. There was another roar of laughter from the men. They loved to tease her. Well, me little maid, Braithwaite would say to her, and how's the lamb's wool? He gave a tug at a glistening pale piece of her hair. "'It's not lamb's wool,' said Anna, indignantly, putting back her offended lock. "'Why, what's to call it, then?' "'It's hair.' "'Hair? Wherever done they rear that sort?' "'We're ever done they?' she asked, in dialect, her curiosity overcoming her. Instead of answering, he shouted with joy. It was the triumph— to make her speak dialect. She had one enemy, the man they called Nutnat, or Nat-Nut, a cretin with interned feet who came flap-lapping along, shoulder jerking up at every step. This poor creature sold nuts in the public houses where he was known. He had no roof to his mouth, and the men used to mock his speech. The first time he came into the George, when Anna was there, she asked, after he had gone, her eyes very round, "'Why does he do that when he walks?' "'It canna help itself, ducky. It's the make of the fella." She thought about it, then she laughed nervously. And then she bethought herself, her cheeks flushed, and she cried, "'He's a horrid man!' "'Nay, he's non horrid. He canna help it if he were struck that road.' But when poor Nat came wambling in again, she slid away, and she would not eat his nuts, if the men bought them for her, and when the farmers gambled at dominoes for them, she was angry. "'They are dirty man's nuts!' she cried. So a revulsion started against Nat, who had not long after to go to the workhouse. There grew in Brangwen's heart now a secret desire to make her a lady." His brother Alfred, in Nottingham, had caused a great scandal by becoming the lover of an educated woman, 
a lady, widow of a doctor. Very often Alfred Brangwen went down as a friend to her cottage, which was in Derbyshire, leaving his wife and family for a day or two, then returning to them. And no one dared gainsay him, for he was a strong-willed, direct man, and he said he was a friend of this widow. One day Brangwen met his brother on the station. "'Where are you going to, then?' asked the younger brother. "'I'm going down to Worksworth. "'You've got friends down there, I'm told.' Yes. I shall have to be looking in when I'm down that road. You please yourself. Tom Brangwen was so curious about the woman that the next time he was in Worksworth he asked for her house. He found a beautiful cottage on the steep side of a hill looking clean over the town that lay in the bottom of the basin and away at the old quarries on the opposite side of the space. Mrs. Forbes was in the garden. She was a tall woman with white hair. She came up the path, taking off her thick gloves, laying down her shears. It was autumn. She wore a wide-brimmed hat. Brangwen blushed to the roots of his hair and did not know what to say. "'I thought I might look in,' he said, knowing you were friends of my brother's. I had to come to Worksworth. She saw at once that he was a Brangwen. "'Will you come in?' she said. "'My father is lying down.' She took him into a drawing-room full of books, with a piano and a violin stand. And they talked. She simply and easily. She was full of dignity. The room was of a kind Brangwen had never known. The atmosphere seemed open and spacious, like a mountain-top to him. "'Does my brother like reading?' he asked. "'Some things. He has been reading Herbert Spencer. And we read Browning sometimes.' Brangwen was full of admiration, deep thrilling, almost reverential admiration. He looked at her with lit-up eyes when she said, "'We read.' At last he burst out, looking round the room, "'I didn't know our Alfred was this way inclined. "'He is quite an unusual man.' He looked at her in amazement. She evidently had a new idea of his brother. She evidently appreciated him. He looked again at the woman. She was about forty, straight, rather hard, a curious, separate creature. Himself, he was not in love with her. There was something chilling about her, but he was filled with boundless admiration. At tea-time he was introduced to her father, an invalid who had to be helped about, but who was ruddy and well-favoured, with snowy hair and watery blue eyes, and a courtly, naive manner that again was new and strange to Brangwen, so suave, so merry, so innocent. His brother was this woman's lover. It was too amazing. Brangwen went home despising himself for his own poor way of life. He was a clodhopper and a boor, dull, stuck in the mud. More than ever he wanted to clamber out to this visionary, polite world. He was well off. He was as well off as Alfred, who could not have above six hundred a year, all told. He himself made about four hundred, and could make more. His investments got better every day. Why did he not do something? His wife was a lady also. But when he got to the marsh he realized how fixed everything was, how the other form of life was beyond him, and he regretted for the first time that he had succeeded to the farm. He felt a prisoner, sitting safe and easy and unadventurous. He might with risk have done more with himself. He could neither read Browning nor Herbert Spencer, nor have access to such a room as Mrs. Forbes's. All that form of life was outside him. But then he said he did not want it. The excitement of the visit began to pass off. The next day he was himself, and if he thought of the other woman— there was something about her and her place that he did not like, something cold, something alien, as if she were not a woman, but an inhuman being who used up human life for cold, unliving purposes. The evening came on. He played with Anna, and then sat alone with his own wife. She was sewing. He sat very still, smoking, perturbed. He was aware of his wife's quiet figure and quiet dark head bent over her needle. It was too quiet for him. It was too peaceful. 
He wanted to smash the walls down and let the night in, so that his wife should not be so secure and quiet sitting there. He wished the air were not so close and narrow. His wife was obliterated from him. She was in her own world, quiet, secure, unnoticed, unnoticing. He was shut down by her. He rose to go out. He could not sit still any longer. He must get out of this oppressive shut-down woman haunt. His wife lifted her head and looked at him. "'Are you going out?' she asked. He looked down and met her eyes. They were darker than darkness, and gave deeper space. He felt himself retreating before her, defensive, whilst her eyes followed and tracked his own. "'I was just going up to Cossete,' he said. She remained watching him. "'Why do you go?' she said. His heart beat fast, and he sat down slowly. "'No reason particular,' he said, beginning to fill his pipe again mechanically. "'Why do you go away so often?' she said. "'But you don't want me,' he replied. She was silent for a while. "'You do not want to be with me any more,' she said. It startled him. How did she know this truth? He thought it was his secret. "'Yay!' he said. "'You want to find something else,' she said. He did not answer. "'Did he?' he asked himself. "'You should not want so much attention,' she said. "'You are not a baby.' "'I'm not grumbling,' he said. Yet he knew he was. "'You think you have not enough,' she said. "'How enough?' "'You think you have not enough in me. "'But how do you know me? "'What do you do to make me love you?' "'He was flabbergasted. "'I never said I hadn't enough in you,' he replied. "'I didn't know you wanted making to love me. "'What do you want?' "'You don't make it good between us any more. "'You are not interested. "'You do not make me want you. "'And you don't make me want you, do you now?' "'There was a silence.' They were such strangers. "'Would you like to have another woman?' she asked. His eyes grew round. He did not know where he was. How could she, his own wife, say such a thing? But she sat there, small and foreign and separate. It dawned upon him she did not consider herself his wife, except in so far as they agreed. She did not feel she had married him. At any rate, she was willing to allow he might want another woman, a gap. A space opened before him. No, he said slowly. What other woman should I want? Like your brother, she said. He was silent for some time, ashamed also. What of her, he said. I didn't like the woman. Yes, you liked her, she answered persistently. He stared in wonder at his own wife, as she told him his own heart so callously, and he was indignant. What right had she to sit there telling him these things? She was his wife. What right had she to speak to him like this, as if she were a stranger? I didn't, he said. I want no woman. Yes, you would like to be like Alfred. His silence was one of angry frustration. He was astonished. He had told her of his visit to Worksworth, but briefly, without interest, he thought. As she sat with her strange dark face turned towards him, her eyes watched him, inscrutable, casting him up. He began to oppose her. She was again the active unknown facing him. Must he admit her? He resisted involuntarily. Why should you want to find a woman who is more to you than me? She said. The turbulence raged in his breast. I don't, he said. Why do you? she repeated. Why do you want to deny me? Suddenly, in a flash, he saw she might be lonely, isolated, unsure. She had seemed to him the utterly certain, satisfied, absolute, excluding him. Could she need anything? Why aren't you satisfied with me? I'm not satisfied with you. Paul used to come to me and take me like a man does. You only leave me alone, or take me like your cattle." quickly, to forget me again, so that you can forget me again. "'What am I to remember about you?' said Brangwen. "'I want you to know there is somebody there besides yourself.' 
"'Well, don't I know it? "'You come to me as if it was for nothing, "'as if I was nothing there. "'When Paul came to me, I was something to him, "'a woman. I was. "'To you I am nothing. "'It is like cattle or nothing. "'You make me feel as if I was nothing,' he said. They were silent. She sat watching him. He could not move. His soul was seething and chaotic. She turned to her sewing again, but the sight of her bent before him held him and would not let him be. She was a strange, hostile, dominant thing, yet not quite hostile. As he sat, he felt his limbs were strong and hard. He sat in strength. She was silent for a long time, stitching. He was aware— poignantly of the round shape of her head, very intimate, compelling. She lifted her head and sighed. The blood burned in him. Her voice ran to him like fire. "'Come here,' she said, unsure. For some moments he did not move. Then he rose slowly and went across the hearth. It required an almost deathly effort of volition or of acquiescence. He stood before her and looked down at her. Her face was shining again. Her eyes were shining again like terrible laughter. It was to him terrible, how she could be transfigured. He could not look at her. It burnt his heart. "'My love,' she said, and she put her arms round him as he stood before her, round his thighs, pressing him against her breast, and her hands on him seemed to reveal to him the mould of his own nakedness. He was passionately lovely to himself. He could not bear to look at her. "'My dear,' she said. He knew she spoke a foreign language. The fear was like bliss in his heart. He looked down. Her face was shining. Her eyes were full of light. She was awful. He suffered from the compulsion to her. She was the awful unknown. He bent down to her, suffering, unable to let go, unable to let himself go, yet drawn, driven. She was now the transfigured. She was wonderful, beyond him. He wanted to go, but he could not as yet kiss her. He was himself apart. Easiest he could kiss her feet, but he was too ashamed for the actual deed, which were like an affront. She waited for him to meet her, not to bow before her and serve her. She wanted his active participation, not his submission. She put her fingers on him, and it was torture to him that he must give himself to her actively, participate in her, that he must meet and embrace and know her who was other than himself. There was that in him which shrank from yielding to her, resisted the relaxing towards her, opposed the mingling with her, even while he most desired it. He was afraid. He wanted to save himself. There were a few moments of stillness, then gradually the tension, the withholding relaxed in him, and he began to flow towards her. She was beyond him, the unattainable, but he let go his hold on himself. He relinquished himself, and knew the subterranean force of his desire to come to her, to be with her, to mingle with her, losing himself to find her, to find himself in her. He began to approach her, to draw near. His blood beat up in waves of desire. He wanted to come to her, to meet her. She was there if he could reach her. The reality of her who was just beyond him absorbed him. Blind and destroyed, he pressed forward, nearer, nearer, to receive the consummation of himself. He received within the darkness which should swallow him and yield him up to himself. If he could come really within the blazing kernel of darkness, if really he could be destroyed, burnt away till he lit with her in one consummation that were supreme, supreme. Their coming together now, after two years of married life, was much more wonderful to them than it had been before. It was the entry into another circle of existence. It was the baptism to another life. It was the complete confirmation. Their feet trod strange ground of knowledge. Their footsteps were lit up with discovery. Wherever they walked, it was well. The world re-echoed round them in discovery. They went gladly and forgetful. 
everything was lost, and everything was found. The new world was discovered. It remained only to be explored. They had passed through the doorway into the further space, where movement was so big that it contained bonds and constraints and labors, and still was complete liberty. She was the doorway to him, he to her. At last they had thrown open the doors, each to the other, and had stood in the doorways facing each other, whilst the light flooded out from behind on to each of their faces. It was the transfiguration, glorification, the admission. And always the light of the transfiguration burned on in their hearts. He went his way as before, she went her way. To the rest of the world there seemed no change, but to the two of them there was the perpetual wonder of the transfiguration. He did not know her any better, any more precisely, now that he knew her altogether. Poland, her husband, the war, he understood no more of this in her. He did not understand her foreign nature, half German, half Polish, nor her foreign speech. But he knew her. He knew her meaning without understanding. What she said, what she spoke, this was a blind gesture on her part. In herself she walked strong and clear. He knew her, he saluted her, was with her. What was memory, after all, but the recording of a number of possibilities which had never been fulfilled? What was Paul Lensky to her but an unfulfilled possibility to which he, Brangwen, was the reality and the fulfillment? What did it matter that Anna Lensky was born of Lydia and Paul? God was her father and her mother. He had passed through the married pair without fully making himself known to them. Now he was declared to Brangwen and to Lydia Brangwen as they stood together. When at last they had joined hands, the house was finished, and the Lord took up his abode, and they were glad. The days went on as before. Brangwen went out to his work, his wife nursed her child, and attended in some measure to the farm. They did not think of each other. Why should they? Only when she touched him he knew her instantly that she was with him, near him, that she was the gateway and the way out, that she was beyond, and that he was travelling in her through the beyond. Whither? What does it matter? He responded always. When she called, he answered. When he asked, her response came at once, or at length. Anna's soul was put at peace between them. She looked from one to the other, and she saw them established to her safety, and she was free. She played between the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud in confidence, having the assurance on her right hand and the assurance on her left. She was no longer called upon to uphold with her childish might the broken end of the arch. Her father and her mother now met to the span of the heavens, and she, the child, was free to play in the space beneath between. End of chapter 3chapter 4 part 1 of the rainbow this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the rainbow by d h lawrence chapter 4 girlhood of anna brangwen part 1 when anna was 9 years old brangwen sent her to the dame's school in casate there she went, flipping and dancing in her inconsequential fashion, doing very much as she liked, disconcerting old Miss Coates by her indifference to respectability and by her lack of reverence. Anna only laughed at Miss Coates, liked her and patronized her in superb childish fashion. The girl was at once shy and wild. She had a curious contempt for ordinary people, a benevolent superiority. She was very shy and tortured with misery when people did not like her. On the other hand, she cared very little for anybody save her mother, whom she still rather resentfully worshipped, and her father, whom she loved and patronized, but upon whom she depended. These two, her mother and father, held her still in fee, but she was free of other people, towards whom on the whole she took the benevolent attitude. 
She deeply hated ugliness or intrusion or arrogance, however. As a child she was as proud and shadowy as a tiger, and as aloof. She could confer favors, but, save from her mother and father, she could receive none. She hated people who came too near to her. Like a wild thing she wanted her distance. She mistrusted intimacy. In Cassate and Ilkston she was always an alien. She had plenty of acquaintances, but no friends. Very few people whom she met were significant to her. They seemed part of a herd, undistinguished. She did not take people very seriously. She had two brothers, Tom, dark-haired, small, volatile, whom she was intimately related to, but whom she never mingled with, and Fred, fair and responsive, whom she adored, but did not consider as a real separate thing. She was too much the centre of her own universe, too little aware of anything outside. The first person she met who affected her as a real living person, whom she regarded as having definite existence, was Baron Skrebensky, her mother's friend. He also was a Polish exile, who had taken orders and had received from Mr. Gladstone a small country living in Yorkshire. When Anna was about ten years old, she went with her mother to spend a few days with the Baron Skrebensky. He was very unhappy in his red-brick vicarage. He was vicar of a country church, a living worth a little over two hundred pounds a year, but he had a large parish containing several collieries, with a new, raw, heathen population. He went to the north of England, expecting homage from the common people, for he was an aristocrat. He was roughly, even cruelly, received. But he never understood it. He remained a fiery aristocrat, only he had to learn to avoid his parishioners. Anna was very much impressed by him. He was a smallish man with a rugged, rather crumpled face, and blue eyes set very deep and glowing. His wife was a tall, thin woman of noble Polish family, mad with pride. He still spoke broken English, for he had kept very close to his wife, both of them forlorn in this strange, inhospitable country, and they always spoke in Polish together. He was disappointed with Mrs. Brangwen's soft, natural English, very disappointed that her child spoke no Polish. Anna loved to watch him. She liked the big, new, rambling vicarage, desolate and stark on its hill. It was so exposed, so bleak and bold after the marsh. The Baron talked endlessly in Polish to Mrs. Brangwen. He made furious gestures with his hands. His blue eyes were full of fire. And to Anna there was a significance about his sharp, flinging movements. Something in her responded to his extravagance and his exuberant manner. She thought him a very wonderful person. She was shy of him. She liked him to talk to her. She felt a sense of freedom near him. She never could tell how she knew it, but she did know that he was a knight of Malta. She could never remember whether she had seen his star or cross of his order or not, but it flashed in her mind like a symbol. He, at any rate, represented to the child the real world, where kings and lords and princes moved and fulfilled their shining lives, whilst queens and ladies and princesses upheld the noble order. She had recognized the Baron Skrebensky as a real person. He had had some regard for her, but when she did not see him any more he faded and became a memory, but as a memory he was always alive to her. Anna became a tall, awkward girl. Her eyes were still very dark and quick, but they had grown careless. They had lost their watchful, hostile look. Her fierce, spun hair turned brown. It grew heavier and was tied back. She was sent to a young ladies' school in Nottingham. And at this period she was absorbed in becoming a young lady. She was intelligent enough, but not interested in learning. At first she thought all the girls at school very ladylike and wonderful, and she wanted to be like them. She came to a speedy disillusion. They galled and maddened her. They were petty and mean. After the loose, generous atmosphere of her home, where little things did not count, she was always uneasy in the world that would snap and bite at every trifle. A quick change came over her. She mistrusted herself. She mistrusted the outer world. She did not want to go on. She did not want to go out into it. She wanted to go no further. "'What do I care about that lot of girls?' she would say to her father contemptuously. "'They are nobody.' 
The trouble was that the girls would not accept Anna at her measure. They would have her according to themselves, or not at all. So she was confused, seduced. She became as they were for a time, and then, in revulsion, she hated them furiously. "'Why don't you ask some of your girls here?' her father would say. "'They're not coming here,' she cried. "'And why not? "'They're bagatelle,' she said, using one of her mother's rare phrases. "'Bagatelles or billiards? "'It makes no matter. "'They're nice young lasses enough.' But Anna was not to be won over. She had a curious shrinking from commonplace people, and particularly from the young lady of her day. She would not go into company because of the ill-at-ease feeling other people brought upon her, and she never could decide whether it were her fault or theirs. She half respected these other people, and continuous disillusion maddened her. She wanted to respect them. Still, she thought the people she did not know were wonderful." those she knew seemed always to be limiting her, tying her up in little falsities that irritated her beyond bearing. She would rather stay at home and avoid the rest of the world, leaving it illusory. For at the marsh life had indeed a certain freedom and largeness. There was no fret about money, no mean little precedence, nor care for what other people thought, because neither Mrs. Brangwen nor Brangwen could be sensible of any judgment passed on them from outside. Their lives were too separate. So Anna was only easy at home, where the common sense and the supreme relation between her parents produced a freer standard of being than she could find outside. Where, outside the marsh, could she find the tolerant dignity she had been brought up in? Her parents stood undiminished and unaware of criticism. The people she met outside seemed to begrudge her her very existence. They seemed to want to belittle her also. She was exceedingly reluctant to go amongst them. She depended upon her mother and her father, and yet she wanted to go out. At school or in the world she was usually at fault. She felt usually that she ought to be slinking in disgrace. She never felt quite sure in herself whether she were wrong or whether the others were wrong. She had not done her lessons. Well, she did not see any reason why she should do her lessons if she did not want to. Was there some occult reason why she should? Were these people, schoolmistresses, representatives of some mystic right, some higher good? They seemed to think so themselves, but she could not for her life see why a woman should bully and insult her because she did not know thirty lines of As You Like It. After all, what did it matter if she knew them or not? Nothing could persuade her that it was of the slightest importance. Because she despised inwardly the coarsely working nature of the mistress— Therefore, she was always at outs with authority. From constant telling, she came almost to believe in her own badness, her own intrinsic inferiority. She felt that she ought always to be in a state of slinking disgrace, if she fulfilled what was expected of her. But she rebelled. She never really believed in her own badness. At the bottom of her heart she despised the other people, who carped and were loud over trifles. She despised them and wanted revenge on them. She hated them whilst they had power over her. Still, she kept an ideal, a free, proud lady absolved from the petty ties, existing beyond petty considerations. She would see such ladies in pictures. Alexandra, Princess of Wales, was one of her models. This lady was proud and royal, and stepped indifferently over all small, mean desires, so thought Anna in her heart. And the girl did up her hair high under a little slanting hat, her skirts were fashionably bunched up. She wore an elegant skin-fitting coat. Her father was delighted. Anna was very proud in her bearing, too, naturally indifferent to smaller bonds to satisfy Ilkston, which would have liked to put her down. But Brangwen was having no such thing. If she chose to be royal, royal she should be. He stood like a rock between her and the world. After the fashion of his family, he grew stout and handsome. His blue eyes were full of light, twinkling and sensitive. His manner was deliberate but hearty, warm. His capacity for living his own life without attention from his neighbors made them respect him. They would run to do anything for him. He did not consider them, but was open-handed towards them, so they made profit of their willingness. He liked people so long as they remained in the background." Mrs. Brangwen went on in her own way, following her own devices. She had her husband, her two sons, and Anna. 
These staked out and marked her horizon. The other people were outsiders. Inside her own world her life passed along like a dream for her. It lapsed, and she lived within its lapse, active and always pleased, intent. She scarcely noticed the outer things at all. What was outside was outside, non-existent. She did not mind if the boys fought, so long as it was out of her presence. But if they fought when she was by, she was angry, and they were afraid of her. She did not care if they broke a window of a railway carriage or sold their watches to have a revel at the goose fair. Brangwen was perhaps angry over these things. To the mother they were insignificant. It was odd little things that offended her. She was furious if the boys hung around the slaughterhouse. She was displeased when the school reports were bad. It did not matter how many sins her boys were accused of, so long as they were not stupid or inferior. If they seemed to brook insults, she hated them, and it was only a certain gaucherie, a gawkiness on Anna's part, that irritated her against the girl. Certain forms of clumsiness, grossness, made the mother's eyes glow with curious rage. Otherwise she was pleased, indifferent. Pursuing her splendid lady ideal, Anna became a lofty demoiselle of sixteen, plagued by family shortcomings. She was very sensitive to her father. She knew if he had been drinking, were he ever so little affected, and she could not bear it. He flushed when he drank. The veins stood out on his temples. There was a twinkling, cavalier boisterousness in his eye. His manner was jovially overbearing and mocking, and it angered her. When she heard his loud, roaring, boisterous mockery, an anger of resentment filled her. She was quick to forestall him the moment he came in. "'You look a sight, you do, red in the face,' she cried. "'I might look worse if I was green,' he answered. "'Boozing in Ilkston. "'And what's wrong with Ilson? "'She flounced away. "'He watched her with amused, twinkling eyes, "'yet, in spite of himself, said that she flouted him. "'They were a curious family, a law to themselves, "'separate from the world, isolated, "'a small republic set in invisible bounds.' The mother was quite indifferent to Ilkston and Cossete, to any claims made on her from outside. She was very shy of any outsider, exceedingly courteous, winning even. But the moment the visitor had gone, she laughed and dismissed him. He did not exist. It had been all a game to her. She was still a foreigner, unsure of her ground. But alone with her own children and husband at the marsh, she was mistress of a little native land that lacked nothing. She had some beliefs somewhere, never defined. She had been brought up a Roman Catholic. She had gone to the Church of England for protection. The outward form was a matter of indifference to her. Yet she had some fundamental religion. It was as if she worshipped God as a mystery, never seeking in the least to define what he was. And inside her the subtle sense of the great absolute wherein she had her being was very strong. The English dogma never reached her. The language was too foreign. Through it all she felt the great separator who held life in his hands, gleaming, imminent, terrible, the great mystery, immediate beyond all telling. She shone and gleamed to the mystery, whom she knew through all her senses. She glanced with strange mystic superstitions that never found expression in the English language, never mounted to thought in English. But so she lived, within a potent, sensuous belief that included her family and contained her destiny. To this she had reduced her husband. He existed with her entirely indifferent to the general values of the world. Her very ways, the very mark of her eyebrows, were symbols and indication to him. There, on the farm with her, he lived through a mystery of life and death and creation, strange, profound ecstasies and incommunicable satisfactions, of which the rest of the world knew nothing, which made the pair of them apart and respected in the English village, for they were also well-to-do. But Anna was only half safe within her mother's unthinking knowledge. She had a mother-of-pearl rosary that had been her own father's. What it meant to her she could never say. But the string of moonlight and silver, when she had it between her fingers, filled her with strange passion. She learned at school a little Latin. She learned an Ave Maria and a Paternoster. She learned how to say her rosary. 
but that was no good. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus Ticum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tu Jesus. Ave Maria, Sancta Maria, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc en in hora mortis nostre. Amen. It was not right somehow. What these words meant when translated was not the same as the pale rosary meant. There was a discrepancy, a falsehood. It irritated her to say, Dominus Ticum, or Benedicta tu in Meliorbus. She loved the mystic words, Ave Maria, Sancta Maria. She was moved by Benedictus Fructus Ventris Tri Jesus, and by Nunc et in Horror Mortis Nostre, but none of it was quite real. It was not satisfactory somehow. She avoided her rosary because, moving her with curious passion as it did, it meant only these not very significant things. She put it away. It was her instinct to put all these things away. It was her instinct to avoid thinking, to avoid it, to save herself. She was seventeen, touchy, full of spirits and very moody, quick to flush and always uneasy, uncertain. For some reason or other she turned more to her father. She felt almost flashes of hatred for her mother. Her mother's dark muzzle and curiously insidious ways, her mother's utter surety and confidence, her strange satisfaction, even triumph, her mother's way of laughing at things, and her mother's silent overriding of vexatious propositions, most of all her mother's triumphant power maddened the girl. She became sudden and incalculable. Often she stood at the window looking out as if she wanted to go. Sometimes she went. She mixed with people. But always she came home in anger, as if she were diminished, belittled, almost degraded. There was over the house a kind of dark silence and intensity in which passion worked its inevitable conclusions. There was in the house a sort of richness, a deep inarticulate interchange, which made other places seem thin and unsatisfying. Brangwen could sit silent, smoking in his chair, the mother could move about in her quiet, insidious way, and the sense of the two presences was powerful, sustaining. The whole intercourse was wordless, intense, and close. But Anna was uneasy. She wanted to get away, yet wherever she went there came upon her that feeling of thinness, as if she were made smaller, belittled. She hastened home. There she raged and interrupted the strong, settled interchange. Sometimes her mother turned on her with a fierce, destructive anger, in which was no pity or consideration, and Anna shrank, afraid. She went to her father. He would still listen to the spoken word which fell sterile on the unheeding mother. Sometimes Anna talked to her father. She tried to discuss people. She wanted to know what was meant. But her father became uneasy. He did not want to have things dragged into consciousness. Only out of consideration for her he listened, and there was a kind of bristling rousedness in the room. The cat got up and, stretching itself, went uneasily to the door. Mrs. Brangwen was silent. She seemed ominous. Anna could not go on with her fault-finding, her criticism, her expression of dissatisfactions. She felt even her father against her. He had a strong dark bond with her mother, a potent intimacy that existed inarticulate and wild, following its own course, and savage if interrupted, uncovered. Nevertheless, Brangwen was uneasy about the girl. The whole house continued to be disturbed. She had a pathetic, baffled appeal. She was hostile to her parents, even whilst she lived entirely with them, within their spell. Many ways she tried of escape. She became an assiduous church-goer, but the language meant nothing to her. It seemed false. She hated to hear things expressed, put into words. Whilst the religious feelings were inside her, they were passionately moving. In the mouth of the clergyman they were false, indecent. She tried to read, but again the tedium and the sense of the falsity of the spoken word put her off. She went to stay with girlfriends. At first she thought it splendid, but then the inner boredom came on. It seemed to her all nothingness, and she felt always belittled, as if never, never could she stretch her length and stride her stride. Her mind reverted often to the torture-cell of a certain bishop of France, 
in which the victim could neither stand nor lie stretched out, never. Not that she thought of herself in any connection with this. But often there came into her mind the wonder how the cell was built, and she could feel the horror of the crampedness as something very real. She was, however, only eighteen when a letter came from Mrs. Alfred Brangwen in Nottingham, saying that her son William was coming to Ilkston to take a place as junior draftsman, scarcely more than apprentice in a lace factory. He was twenty years old, and would the Marsh Brangwens be friendly with him? Tom Brangwen at once wrote, offering the young man a home at the Marsh. This was not accepted, but the Nottingham Brangwens expressed gratitude. There had never been much love lost between the Nottingham Brangwens and the Marsh. Indeed, Mrs. Alfred, having inherited three thousand pounds, and having occasion to be dissatisfied with her husband, held aloof from all the Brangwens whatsoever. She affected, however, some esteem of Mrs. Tom, as she called the Polish woman, saying that at any rate she was a lady. Anna Brangwen was faintly excited at the news of her cousin Will's coming to Ilkston. She knew plenty of young men, but they had never become real to her. She had seen in this young gallant a nose she liked, in that a pleasant moustache, in the other a nice way of wearing clothes, in one a ridiculous fringe of hair, in another a comical way of talking. They were objects of amusement and faint wonder to her, rather than real beings, the young men. The only man she knew was her father, and, as he was something large, looming, a kind of godhead, he embraced all manhood for her, and other men were just incidental. She remembered her cousin Will. He had town clothes and was thin, with a very curious head, black as jet, with hair like sleek thin fur. It was a curious head. It reminded her she knew not of what, of some animal, some mysterious animal that lived in the darkness under the leaves and never came out, but which lived vividly, swift and intense. She always thought of him with that black, keen, blind head, and she considered him odd. He appeared at the marsh one Sunday morning, a rather long, thin youth with a bright face and a curious self-possession among his shyness, a native unawareness of what other people might be, since he was himself. When Anna came downstairs in her Sunday clothes, ready for church, he rose and greeted her conventionally, shaking hands. His manners were better than hers. She flushed. She noticed that he now had a thick fledge on his upper lip a black, finely shapen line marking his wide mouth. It rather repelled her. It reminded her of the thin, fine fur of his hair. She was aware of something strange in him. His voice had rather high upper notes, and very resonant middle notes. It was queer. She wondered why he did it. But he sat very naturally in the marsh living room. He had some uncouthness, some natural self-possession of the Brangwens that made him at home there. Anna was rather troubled by the strangely intimate, affectionate way her father had towards this young man. He seemed gentle towards him. He put himself aside in order to fill out the young man. This irritated Anna. Father, she said abruptly, give me some collection. What collection? asked Brangwen. Don't be ridiculous, she cried, flushing. Nay, he said, what collection's this? You know it's the first Sunday of the month. Anna stood confused. Why was he doing this? Why was he making her conspicuous before this stranger? I want some collection, she reasserted. So the says, he replied indifferently, looking at her, then turning again to his nephew. She went forward and thrust her hand into his breeches pocket. He smoked steadily, making no resistance, talking to his nephew. Her hand groped about in his pocket, and then drew out his leathern purse. Her color was bright in her clear cheeks. Her eyes shone. Brangwen's eyes were twinkling. The nephew sat sheepishly. Anna, in her finery, sat down and slid all the money into her lap. There was silver and gold. The youth could not help watching her. She was bent over the heap of money, fingering the different coins. "'I've a good mind to take half a sovereign,' she said, and she looked up with glowing dark eyes. She met the light brown eyes of her cousin, close and intent upon her. She was startled. She laughed quickly and turned to her father. "'I've a good mind to take half a sovereign, our dad,' she said. 
"'Yes, nimble fingers,' said her father. "'You take what's your own.' "'Are you coming, our Anna?' asked her brother from the door. She suddenly chilled to normal, forgetting both her father and her cousin. "'Yes, I'm ready,' she said, taking sixpence from the heap of money and sliding the rest back into the purse, which she laid on the table. "'Give it here,' said her father. Hastily she thrust the purse into his pocket and was going out. "'You'd better go o him, lad, hadn't you?' said the father to the nephew. Will Brangwen rose uncertainly. He had golden-brown, quick, steady eyes like a bird's, like a hawk's, which cannot look afraid. "'Your cousin Will will come with you,' said the father. Anna glanced at the strange youth again. She felt him waiting there for her to notice him. He was hovering on the edge of her consciousness, ready to come in. She did not want to look at him. She was antagonistic to him. She waited without speaking. Her cousin took his hat and joined her. It was summer outside. Her brother Fred was plucking a sprig of flowery currant to put in his coat from the bush at the angle of the house. She took no notice. Her cousin followed just behind her. They were on the high road. She was aware of a strangeness in her being. It made her uncertain. She caught sight of the flowering currant in her brother's buttonhole. "'Oh, our Fred!' she cried. "'Don't wear that stuff to go to church!' Fred looked down protectively at the pink adornment on his breast. "'Why, I like it,' he said. "'Then you're the only one who does, I'm sure,' she said. And she turned to her cousin. "'Do you like the smell of it?' she asked. He was there beside her, tall and uncouth and yet self-possessed. It excited her. "'I can't say whether I do or not,' he replied. "'Give it here, Fred. Don't have it smelling in church,' she said to the little boy, her page." Her fair small brother handed her the flower dutifully. She sniffed it and gave it without a word to her cousin for his judgment. He smelled the dangling flower curiously. "'It's a funny smell,' he said. And suddenly she laughed, and a quick light came on all their faces. There was a blithe trip in the small boy's walk. The bells were ringing. They were going up the summery hill in their Sunday clothes. Anna was very fine in a silk frock of brown and white stripes, tight along the arms and the body, bunched up very elegantly behind the skirt. There was something of the cavalier about Will Brangwen, and he was well dressed. He walked along with the sprig of currant blossom dangling between his fingers, and none of them spoke. The sun shone brightly on little showers of buttercup down the bank. In the fields the fool's parsley was foamy held very high and proud above a number of flowers that flitted in the greenish twilight of the mowing grass below. They reached the church. Fred led the way to the pew, followed by the cousin, then Anna. She felt very conspicuous and important. Somehow this young man gave her away to other people. He stood aside and let her pass to her place, then sat next to her. It was a curious sensation to sit next to him. The color came streaming from the painted window above her. It lit on the dark wood of the pew, on the stone-worn aisle, on the pillar behind her cousin, and on her cousin's hands, as they lay on his knees. She sat amid illumination, illumination and luminous shadow all around her, her soul very bright. She sat, without knowing it, conscious of the hands and motionless knees of her cousin. Something strange had entered into her world— something entirely strange and unlike what she knew. She was curiously elated. She sat in a glowing world of unreality, very delightful. A brooding light, like laughter, was in her eyes. She was aware of a strange influence entering into her, which she enjoyed. It was a dark and richening influence she had not known before. She did not think of her cousin, but she was startled when his hands moved. She wished he would not say the responses so plainly. It diverted her from her vague enjoyment. Why would he obtrude and draw notice to himself? It was bad taste. But she went on all right till the hymn came. He stood up beside her to sing, and that pleased her. Then, suddenly, at the very first word, his voice came strong and overriding, filling the church. He was singing the tenor. Her soul opened in amazement. His voice filled the church— it rang out like a trumpet and rang out again. She started to giggle over her hymn-book, but he went on, perfectly steady. Up and down rang his voice, going its own way. She was helplessly shocked into laughter. 
Between moments of dead silence in herself she shook with laughter. On came the laughter, seized her, and shook her till the tears were in her eyes. She was amazed and rather enjoyed it. And still the hymn rolled on, and still she laughed. She bent over her hymn-book, crimson with confusion, but still her sides shook with laughter. She pretended to cough. She pretended to have a crumb in her throat. Fred was gazing up at her with clear blue eyes. She was recovering herself, and then a slur in the strong blind voice at her side brought it all on again in a gust of mad laughter. She bent down to prayer in cold reproof of herself. And yet, as she knelt, little eddies of giggling went through her. The very sight of his knees on the praying cushion sent the little shock of laughter over her. She gathered herself together and sat with prim, pure face, white and pink and cold as a Christmas rose, her hands in her silk gloves folded on her lap, her dark eyes all vague, abstracted, in a sort of dream, oblivious of everything. The sermon rolled on vaguely in a tide of pregnant peace. Her cousin took out his pocket-handkerchief. He seemed to be drifted, absorbed, into the sermon. He put his handkerchief to his face, then something dropped on to his knee. There lay the bit of flowering current. He was looking down at it in real astonishment. A wild snort of laughter came from Anna. Everybody heard. It was torture. He had shut the crumpled flower in his hand and was looking up again with the same absorbed attention to the sermon. Another snort of laughter from Anna. Fred nudged her remindingly. Her cousin sat motionless. Somehow he was aware that his face was red. She could feel him. His hand closed over the flower, remained quite still, pretending to be normal. Another wild struggle in Anna's breast and the snort of laughter. She bent forward, shaking with laughter. It was now no joke. Fred was nudged, nudging at her. She nudged him back fiercely. Then another vicious spasm of laughter seized her. She tried to ward it off in a little cough. The cough ended in a suppressed whoop. She wanted to die, and the closed hand crept away to the pocket. Whilst she sat in taut suspense, the laughter rushed back at her, knowing he was fumbling in his pocket to shove the flower away. In the end she felt weak, exhausted, and thoroughly depressed. A blankness of wincing depression came over her. She hated the presence of the other people. Her face became quite haughty. She was unaware of her cousin any more. When the collection arrived with the last hymn, her cousin was again singing resoundingly, and still it amused her. In spite of the shameful exhibition she had made of herself, it amused her still. She listened to it in a spell of amusement, and the bag was thrust in front of her, and her sixpence was mingled in the folds of her glove. In her haste to get it out, it flipped away and went twinkling in the next pew. She stood and giggled. She could not help it. She laughed outright, a figure of shame. "'What were you laughing about, our Anna?' asked Fred, the moment they were out of the church. "'Oh, I couldn't help it,' she said in her careless, half-mocking fashion. "'I don't know why Cousin Will's singing set me off.' "'What was there in my singing to make you laugh?' he asked. "'It was so loud,' she said. They did not look at each other, but they both laughed again, both reddening. "'What were you snorting and laughing for, our Anna?' asked Tom, the elder brother, at the dinner-table, his hazel eyes bright with joy. "'Everybody stopped to look at you.' Tom was in the choir. She was aware of Will's eyes shining steadily upon her, waiting for her to speak. "'It was Cousin Will singing,' she said, at which her cousin burst into a suppressed chuckling laugh, suddenly showing all his small, regular, rather sharp teeth, and just as quickly closing his mouth again. "'Has he got such a remarkable voice on him, then?' asked Brangwen. "'No, it's not that,' said Anna. "'Only it tickled me. I couldn't tell you why.' And again a ripple of laughter went down the table. Will Brangwen thrust forward his dark face, his eyes dancing, and said, "'I'm in the choir of St. Nicholas.' "'Oh, you go to church, then,' said Brangwen. "'Mother does. Father doesn't,' replied the youth. It was the little things, his movement, the funny tones of his voice, that showed up big to Anna. The matter-of-fact things he said were absurd in contrast. The things her father said seemed meaningless and neutral. During the afternoon they sat in the parlour that smelled of geranium, and they ate cherries and talked. Will Brangwen was called on to give himself forth, and soon he was drawn out. He was interested in churches— 
in church architecture. The influence of Ruskin had stimulated him to a pleasure in the medieval forms. His talk was fragmentary. He was only half articulate. But listening to him as he spoke of church after church, of nave and chancel and transept, of wood screen and font, of hatchet carving and moulding and tracery, speaking always with close passion of particular things, particular places, there gathered in her heart a pregnant hush of churches, a mystery, a ponderous significance of bowed stone, a dim-coloured light through which something took place obscurely, passing into darkness, a high, delighted framework of the mystic screen, and beyond, in the furthest beyond, the altar. It was a very real experience. She was carried away, and the land seemed to be covered with a vast mystic church, reserved in gloom, thrilled with an unknown presence. Almost it hurt her to look out of the window and see the lilacs towering in the vivid sunshine. Or was this the jewelled glass? He talked of Gothic and Renaissance and Perpendicular, and Early English and Norman. The words thrilled her. "'Have you been to Southwell?' he said. "'I was there at twelve o'clock at midday, eating my lunch in the churchyard, and the bells played a hymn. "'Eh, it's a fine minster, Southwell. Heavy. It's got heavy round arches, rather low, on thick pillars. It's grand the way those arches travel forward. "'There's a sedilia as well. Pretty.' "'But I like the main body of the church and that north porch.' "'He was very much excited and filled with himself that afternoon. "'A flame kindled round him, making his experience passionate and glowing, burningly real. "'His uncle listened with twinkling eyes, half-moved. "'His aunt bent forward, her dark face half-moved, but held by other knowledge. "'Anna went with him. "'He returned to his lodging at night, treading quick.' his eyes glittering, and his face shining darkly as if he came from some passionate vital tryst. The glow remained in him. The fire burned. His heart was fierce like a sun. He enjoyed his unknown life and his own self, and he was ready to go back to the marsh. Without knowing it, Anna was wanting him to come. In him she had escaped. In him the bounds of her experience were transgressed. He was the hole in the wall, beyond which the sunshine blazed on an outside world. He came, sometimes, not often, but sometimes, talking again. There recurred the strange, remote reality which carried everything before it. Sometimes he talked of his father, whom he hated with a hatred that was burningly close to love, of his mother, whom he loved, with a love that was keenly close to hatred, or to revolt. His sentences were clumsy. He was only half articulate, but he had the wonderful voice that could ring its vibration through the girl's soul, transport her into his feeling. Sometimes his voice was hot and declamatory. Sometimes it had a strange twanging, almost cat-like sound. Sometimes it hesitated, puzzled. Sometimes there was the break of a little laugh. Anna was taken by him. She loved the running flame that coursed through her as she listened to him and his mother and his father became to her two separate people in her life. End of chapter 4, part 1Chapter 4, Part 2 of The Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter 4, Part 2. For some weeks the youth came frequently, and was received gladly by them all. He sat amongst them, his dark face glowing, an eagerness and a touch of derisiveness on his wide mouth, something grinning and twisted, his eyes always shining like a bird's, utterly without depth. There was no getting hold of the fellow, Brangwen irritably thought. He was like a grinning young tomcat that came when he thought he would, and without cognizance of the other person. At first the youth had looked towards Tom Brangwen when he talked, and then he looked towards his aunt for her appreciation, valuing it more than his uncle's. And then he turned to Anna, because from her he got what he wanted, which was not in the elder people. So that the two young people, from being always attendant on the elder, began to draw apart and establish a separate kingdom. 
Sometimes Tom Brangwen was irritated. His nephew irritated him. The lad seemed to him too special, self-contained. His nature was fierce enough, but too much abstracted, like a separate thing. Like a cat's nature. A cat could lie perfectly peacefully on the hearth-rug whilst its master or mistress writhed in agony a yard away. It had nothing to do with other people's affairs. What did the lad really care about anything save his own instinctive affairs? Brangwen was irritated. Nevertheless, he liked and respected his nephew. Mrs. Brangwen was irritated by Anna, who was suddenly changed under the influence of the youth. The mother liked the boy. He was not quite an outsider. But she did not like her daughter to be so much under the spell. So that gradually the two young people drew apart, escaped from the elders to create a new thing by themselves. He worked in the garden to propitiate his uncle. He talked churches to propitiate his aunt. He followed Anna like a shadow. Like a long, persistent, unswerving black shadow, he went after the girl. It irritated Brangwen exceedingly. It exasperated him beyond bearing to see the lit-up grin, the cat grin, as he called it, on his nephew's face. And Anna had a new reserve, a new independence. Suddenly she began to act independently of her parents, to live beyond them. Her mother had flashes of anger. But the courtship went on. Anna would find occasion to go shopping in Ilkston at evening. She always returned with her cousin, he walking with his head over her shoulder a little bit behind her, like the devil looking over Lincoln, as Brangwen noted angrily, and yet with satisfaction. To his own wonder, Will Brangwen found himself in an electric state of passion. To his wonder, he had stopped her at the gate as they came home from Ilkston one night, and had kissed her blocking her way and kissing her whilst he felt as if some blow were struck at him in the dark. And when they went indoors, he was acutely angry that her parents looked up scrutinizingly at him and her. What right had they there? Why should they look up? Let them remove themselves or look elsewhere. And the youth went home with the stars in heaven whirling fiercely about the blackness of his head, and his heart fierce, insistent, but fierce as if he felt something balking him. He wanted to smash through something. A spell was cast over her, and how uneasy her parents were as she went about the house unnoticing, not noticing them, moving in a spell as if she were invisible to them. She was invisible to them. It made them angry, yet they had to submit. She went about absorbed, obscured for a while. Over him, too, the darkness of obscurity settled. He seemed to be hidden in a tense electric darkness in which his soul, his life, was intensely active, but without his aid or attention. His mind was obscured. He worked swiftly and mechanically, and he produced some beautiful things. His favorite work was wood carving. The first thing he made for her was a butter stamper. In it he carved a mythological bird, a phoenix, something like an eagle, rising on symmetrical wings from a circle of very beautiful flickering flames that rose upwards from the rim of the cup. Anna thought nothing of the gift on the evening when he gave it to her. In the morning, however, when the butter was made, she fetched his seal in place of the old wooden stamper of oak leaves and acorns. She was curiously excited to see how it would turn out. Strange, the uncouth bird molded there in the cup-like hollow, with curious thick waverings running inwards from a smooth rim. She pressed another mould. Strange to lift the stamp and see that eagle-beaked bird raising its breast to her. She loved creating it over and over again, and every time she looked it seemed a new thing come to life. Every piece of butter became this strange vital emblem. She showed it to her mother and father. "'That is beautiful,' said her mother." a little light coming on to her face. "'Beautiful!' exclaimed the father, puzzled, fretted. "'Why, what sort of a bird does he call it?' And this was the question put by the customers during the next weeks. "'What sort of a bird do you call that as you've got on the butter?' When he came in the evening, she took him into the dairy to show him. "'Do you like it?' he asked, in his loud, vibrating voice that always sounded strange, re-echoing in the dark places of her being. They very rarely touched each other. They liked to be alone together, near to each other, but there was still a distance between them. 
In the cool dairy, the candlelight lit on the large white surfaces of the cream pans. He turned his head sharply. It was so cool and remote in there, so remote. His mouth was open in a little strained laugh. She stood with her head bent, turned aside. He wanted to go near to her. He had kissed her once. Again his eye rested on the round blocks of butter where the emblematic bird lifted its breast from the shadow cast by the candle flame. What was restraining him? Her breast was near him, his head lifted like an eagle's. She did not move. Suddenly, with an incredibly quick, delicate movement, he put his arms round her and drew her to him. It was quick, cleanly done, like a bird that swoops and sinks close, closer. He was kissing her throat. She turned and looked at him. Her eyes were dark and flowing with fire. His eyes were hard and bright with a fierce purpose and gladness like a hawk's. She felt him flying into the dark space of her flames, like a brand, like a gleaming hawk. They had looked at each other, and seen each other strange, yet near, very near, like a hawk stooping, swooping, dropping into a flame of darkness. So she took the candle, and they went back to the kitchen. They went on in this way for some time, always coming together, but rarely touching. Very seldom did they kiss, and then, often, it was merely a touch of the lips, a sign. But her eyes began to waken with a constant fire. She paused often in the midst of her transit, as if to recollect something, or to discover something. And his face became somber, intent. He did not really hear what was said to him. One evening in August he came when it was raining. He came in with his jacket collar turned up, his jacket buttoned close, his face wet, and he looked so slim and definite coming out of the chill rain, she was suddenly blinded with love for him. Yet he sat and talked with her father and mother, meaninglessly, whilst her blood seethed to anguish in her. She wanted to touch him now, only to touch him. There was the queer abstract look on her silvery radiant face that maddened her father. Her dark eyes were hidden, but she raised them to the youth, and they were dark with a flare that made him quail for a moment. She went into the second kitchen and took a lantern. Her father watched her as she returned. "'Come with me, Will,' she said to her cousin. "'I want to see if I put the brick over where that rat comes in.' "'You've no need to do that,' retorted her father. She took no notice. The youth was between the two wills. The color mounted into the father's face. His blue eyes stared. The girl stood near the door, her head held slightly back, like an indication that the youth must come. He rose in his silent, intent way, and was gone with her. The blood swelled in Brangwen's forehead veins. It was raining. The light of the lantern flashed on the cobbled path in the bottom of the wall. She came to a small ladder and climbed up. He reached her the lantern and followed. Up there in the fowl loft, the birds sat in fat bunches on the perches, the red combs shining like fire. Bright, sharp eyes opened. There was a sharp crock of expostulation as one of the hens shifted over. The cock sat watching, his yellow neck feathers bright as glass. Anna went across the dirty floor. Brangwen crouched in the loft, watching. The light was soft under the red naked tiles. The girl crouched in a corner. There was another explosive bustle of a hen springing from her perch. Anna came back, stooping under the perches. He was waiting for her near the door. Suddenly she had her arms round him, was clinging close to him, cleaving her body against his, and crying in a whispering, whimpering sound, "'Will, I love you. I love you, Will. I love you.' It sounded as if it were tearing her. He was not even very much surprised. He held her in his arms, and his bones melted. He leaned back against the wall. The door of the loft was open. Outside the rain slanted by in fine, steely, mysterious haste, emerging out of the gulf of darkness. He held her in his arms, and he and she together seemed to be swinging in big, swooping oscillations, the two of them clasped together up in the darkness. Outside the open door of the loft in which they stood, beyond them and below them, was darkness, with a travelling veil of rain. "'I love you, Will, I love you,' she moaned. I love you, Will. 
He held her as though they were one, and was silent. In the house Tom Brangwen waited a while. Then he got up and went out. He went down the yard. He saw the curious misty shaft coming from the loft door. He scarcely knew it was the light in the rain. He went on till the illumination fell on him dimly. Then, looking up through the blur, he saw the youth and the girl together, the youth with his back against the wall, his head sunk over the head of the girl. The elder man saw them, blurred through the rain, but lit up. They thought themselves so buried in the night. He even saw the lighted dryness of the loft behind, and shadows and bunches of roosting fowls. Up in the night, strange shadows cast from the lantern on the floor. And a black gloom of anger and a tenderness of self-effacement fought in his heart. She did not understand what she was doing. She betrayed herself. She was a child, a mere child. She did not know how much of herself she was squandering. And he was blackly and furiously miserable. Was he then an old man, that he should be giving her away in marriage? Was he old? He was not old. He was younger than that young, thoughtless fellow in whose arms she lay. Who knew her, he or that blind-headed youth? To whom did she belong, if not to himself? He thought again of the child he had carried out at night into the barn, whilst his wife was in labor with the young Tom. He remembered the soft, warm weight of the little girl on his arm, round his neck. Now she would say he was finished. She was going away, to deny him, to leave an unendurable emptiness in him, a void that he could not bear. Almost he hated her. How dared she say he was old! He walked on in the rain, sweating with pain, with the horror of being old, with the agony of having to relinquish what was life to him. Will Brangwen went home without having seen his uncle. He held his hot face to the rain and walked on in a trance. "'I love you, Will. I love you.' The words repeated themselves endlessly. The veils had ripped and issued him naked into the endless space, and he shuddered. The walls had thrust him out and given him a vast space to walk in. Whither through this darkness of infinite space was he walking blindly? Where, at the end of all the darkness, was God the Almighty still darkly seated, thrusting him on? I love you, Will. I love you. He trembled with fear as the words beat in his heart again, and he dared not think of her face of her eyes which shone, and of her strange transfigured face. The hand of the hidden Almighty, burning bright, had thrust out of the darkness and gripped him. He went on, subject and in fear, his heart gripped and burning from the touch. The days went by. They ran on dark padded feet in silence. He went to see Anna, but again there had come a reserve between them. Tom Brangwen was gloomy, his blue eyes somber. Anna was strange and delivered up. Her face in its delicate coloring was mute, touched dumb and poignant. The mother bowed her head and moved in her own dark world that was pregnant again with fulfillment. Will Brangwen worked at his wood carving. It was a passion, a passion for him to have the chisel under his grip. Verily, the passion of his heart lifted the fine bite of steel. He was carving, as he had always wanted, the creation of Eve. It was a panel in low relief for a church. Adam lay asleep as if suffering, and God, a dim large figure, stooped towards him, stretching forward his unveiled hand. And Eve, a small, vivid, naked female shape, was issuing like a flame towards the hand of God from the torn side of Adam. Now Will Brangwen was working at the Eve. She was thin, a keen, unripe thing. With trembling passion, fine as a breath of air, he sent the chisel over her belly, her hard, unripe, small belly. She was a stiff little figure with sharp lines in the throes and torture and ecstasy of her creation. But he trembled as he touched her. He had not finished any of his figures. There was a bird on a bough overhead lifting its wings for flight, and a serpent breathing up to it. It was not finished yet. He trembled with passion, at last able to create the new, sharp body of his Eve. At the sides, at the far sides, at either end, were two angels, covering their faces with their wings. They were like trees. 
as he went to the marsh in the twilight he felt that the angels with covered faces were standing back as he went by the darkness was of their shadows and the covering of their faces when he went through the canal bridge the evening glowed in its last deep colours the sky was dark blue the stars glittered from afar very remote and approaching above the darkening cluster of the farm above the paths of crystal along the edge of the heavens she waited for him like the glow of light and as if his face were covered and he dared not lift his face to look at her corn harvest came on one evening they walked out through the farm buildings at nightfall a large gold moon hung heavily to the gray horizon trees hovered tall standing back in the dusk waiting anna and the young man went on noiselessly by the hedge along where the farm carts had made dark ruts in the grass they came through a gate into a wide open field where still much light seemed to spread against their faces in the under shadow the sheaves lay on the ground where the reapers had left them many sheaves like bodies prostrate in shadowy bulk others were riding hazily in shocks like ships in the haze of moonlight and of dusk farther off they did not want to turn back yet whither were they to go towards the moon for they were separate single we will put up some sheaves said anna so they could remain there in the broad open place they went across the stubble to where the long rows of upreared shocks ended curiously populous that part of the field looked where the shocks rode erect the rest was open and prostrate the air was all hoary silver she looked around her trees stood vaguely at their distance as if waiting like heralds for the signal to approach in this space of vague crystal her heart seemed like a bell ringing she was afraid lest the sound should be heard you take this row she said to the youth and passing on she stooped in the next row of lying sheaves grasping her hands in the tresses of the oats lifting the heavy corn in either hand carrying it as it hung heavily against her to the cleared space where she set the two sheaves sharply down bringing them together with a faint keen clash her two bulks stood leaning together he was coming walking shadowily with the gossamer dust carrying his two sheaves she waited near by he set his sheaves with a keen faint clash next to her sheaves they rode unsteadily he tangled the tresses of corn it hissed like a fountain he looked up and laughed then she turned away towards the moon which seemed glowingly to uncover her bosom every time she faced it he went to the vague emptiness of the field opposite dutifully they stooped grasped the wet soft hair of the corn lifted the heavy bundles and returned she was always first she set down her sheaves making a penthouse with those others he was coming shadowy across the stubble carrying his bundles she turned away hearing only the sharp hiss of his mingling corn she walked between the moon and his shadowy figure she took her two new sheaves and walked towards him as he rose from stooping over the earth he was coming out of the near distance she set down her sheaves to make a new stook they were unsure her hands fluttered yet she broke away and turned to the moon which laid bare her bosom so she felt as if her bosom were heaving and panting with moonlight and he had to put up her two sheaves which had fallen down he worked in silence the rhythm of the work carried him away again as she was coming near they worked together coming and going in a rhythm which carried their feet and their bodies in tune she stooped she lifted the burden of sheaves she turned her face to the dimness where he was and went with her burden over the stubble she hesitated set down her sheaves there was a swish and hiss of mingling oats he was drawing near and she must turn again and there was the flaring moon laying bare her bosom again making her drift and ebb like a wave he worked steadily engrossed threading backwards and forwards like a shuttle across the strip of cleared stubble weaving the long line of riding shocks nearer and nearer to the shadowy trees threading his sheaves with hers and always she was gone before he came as he came she drew away as he drew away she came were they never to meet 
Gradually a low, deep-sounding will in him vibrated to her, tried to set her in accord, tried to bring her gradually to him, to a meeting, till they should be together, till they should meet as the sheaves that swished together. And the work went on. The moon grew brighter, clearer. The corn glistened. He bent over the prostrate bundles. There was a hiss as the sheaves left the ground, a trailing of heavy bodies against him, a dazzle of moonlight on his eyes, and then he was setting the corn together at the stook, and she was coming near. He waited for her. He fumbled at the stook. She came, but she stood back till he drew away. He saw her in shadow, a dark column, and spoke to her, and she answered. She saw the moonlight flash question on his face, but there was a space between them, and he went away. The work carried them, rhythmic. Why was there always a space between them? Why were they apart? Why, as she came up from under the moon, would she halt and stand off from him? Why was he held away from her? His will drummed persistently, darkly. It drowned everything else. Into the rhythm of his work there came a pulse and a steadied purpose. He stooped, he lifted the weight, he heaved it towards her, setting it as in her, under the moonlit space, and he went back for more. Ever with increasing closeness he lifted the sheaves and swung striding to the centre with them. Ever he drove her more nearly to the meeting. Ever he did his share and drew towards her, overtaking her. There was only the moving to and fro in the moonlight, engrossed, the swinging in the silence that was marked only by the splash of sheaves and silence and a splash of sheaves, and ever the splash of his sheaves broke swifter, beating up to hers, and ever the splash of her sheaves recurred monotonously, unchanging, and ever the splash of his sheaves beat nearer, till at last they met at the shock, facing each other, sheaves in hand, and he was silvery with moonlight, with a moonlit shadowy face that frightened her. She waited for him. "'Put yours down,' she said. "'No, it's your turn.' His voice was twanging and insistent. She set her sheaves against the shock. He saw her hands glisten among the spray of grain, and he dropped his sheaves, and he trembled as he took her in his arms. He had overtaken her, and it was his privilege to kiss her. She was sweet and fresh with the night air, and sweet with the scent of grain, and the whole rhythm of him beat into his kisses, and still he pursued her in his kisses, and still she was not quite overcome. He wondered over the moonlight on her nose, all the moonlight upon her, all the darkness within her, all the night in his arms, darkness and shine he possessed of it all, all the night for him now to unfold, to venture within, all the mystery to be entered, all the discovery to be made. Trembling with keen triumph, his heart was white as a star as he drove his kisses nearer. "'My love!' she called in a low voice from afar. The low sound seemed to call to him from far off, under the moon, to him who was unaware. He stopped, quivered, and listened. "'My love!' came again the low, plaintive call, like a bird unseen in the night. He was afraid. His heart quivered and broke. He was stopped. "'Anna!' he said, as if he answered her from a distance, unsure. "'My love!' and he drew near, and she drew near. "'Anna!' he said, in wonder and the birth-pain of love. "'My love!' she said, her voice growing rapturous, and they kissed on the mouth in rapture and surprise, long, real kisses. The kiss lasted there among the moonlight. He kissed her again, and she kissed him, and again they were kissing together, till something happened in him. He was strange. He wanted her. He wanted her exceedingly. She was something new. They stood there folded, suspended in the night, and his whole being quivered with surprise as from a blow. He wanted her, and he wanted to tell her so, but the shock was too great to him. He had never realized before. He trembled with irritation and unusedness. He did not know what to do. He held her more gently, gently, much more gently. The conflict was gone by, and he was glad and breathless and almost in tears, but he knew he wanted her, something fixed in him forever. He was hers, and he was very glad and afraid. 
He did not know what to do as they stood there in the open moonlit field. He looked through her hair at the moon which seemed to swim liquid bright. She sighed and seemed to wake up. Then she kissed him again. Then she loosened herself away from him and took his hand. It hurt him when she drew away from his breast. It hurt him with a chagrin. Why did she draw away from him? But she held his hand. I want to go home, she said, looking at him in a way he could not understand. He held close to her hand. He was dazed and he could not move. He did not know how to move. She drew him away. He walked helplessly beside her, holding her hand. She went with bent head. Suddenly, he said, as the simple solution stated itself to him, "'We'll get married, Anna.' She was silent. "'We'll get married, Anna, shall we?' She stopped in the field again and kissed him, clinging to him passionately, in a way he could not understand. He could not understand, but he left it all now to marriage. That was the solution now, fixed ahead. He wanted her. He wanted to be married to her. He wanted to have her altogether as his own forever, and he waited intent for the accomplishment. But there was all the while a slight tension of irritation. He spoke to his uncle and aunt that night. Uncle, he said, Anna and me think of getting married. Oh, eh? said Brangwen. But how? You have no money, said the mother. The youth went pale. He hated these words. But he was like a gleaming bright pebble, something bright and inalterable. He did not think. He sat there in his hard brightness and did not speak. Have you mentioned it to your own mother? asked Brangwen. No, I'll tell her on Saturday. You'll go and see her? Yes. There was a long pause. And what are you going to marry on? Your pound a week? Again the youth went pale, as if the spirit were being injured in him. I don't know, he said, looking at his uncle with his bright, inhuman eyes like a hawk's. Brangwen stirred in hatred. It needs knowing, he said. I shall have the money later on, said the nephew. I will raise some now and pay it back then. Oh, eh, and why this desperate hurry? She's a child of eighteen, and you're a boy of twenty. You're neither of you of age to do as you like yet. Will Brangwen ducked his head and looked at his uncle with swift, mistrustful eyes, like a caged hawk. "'What does it matter how old she is and how old I am?' he said. "'What's the difference between me now and when I'm thirty? "'A big difference, let us hope. "'But you have no experience. "'You have no experience and no money. "'Why do you want to marry without experience or money?' asked the aunt. "'What experience do I want, aunt?' asked the boy. And if Brangwen's heart had not been hard and intact with anger like a precious stone, he would have agreed. Will Brangwen went home strange and untouched. He felt he could not alter from what he was fixed upon. His will was set. To alter it he must be destroyed, and he would not be destroyed. He had no money, but he would get some from somewhere. It did not matter. He lay awake for many hours, hard and clear and unthinking. his soul crystallizing more inalterably. Then he went fast asleep. It was as if his soul had turned into a hard crystal. He might tremble and quiver and suffer. It did not alter. The next morning Tom Brangwen, inhuman with anger, spoke to Anna. "'What's this about wanting to get married?' he said. She stood, paling a little, her dark eyes springing to the hostile, startled look of a savage thing that will defend itself, but trembles with sensitiveness. "'I do,' she said, out of her unconsciousness. His anger rose, and he would have liked to break her. "'You do, you do, and what for?' he sneered with contempt. The old childish agony, the blindness that could recognize nobody, the palpitating antagonism as of a raw, helpless, undefended thing came back on her. I do because I do, she cried in the shrill, hysterical way of her childhood. You are not my father. My father is dead. You are not my father. She was still a stranger. She did not recognize him. The cold blade cut down deep into Brangwen's soul. It cut him off from her. And what if I'm not? he said. But he could not bear it. It had been so passionately dear to him, her father, daddy. He went about for some days as if stunned. 
His wife was bemused. She did not understand. She only thought the marriage was impeded for want of money and position. There was a horrible silence in the house. Anna kept out of sight as much as possible. She could be for hours alone. Will Brangwen came back after stupid scenes at Nottingham. He, too, was pale and blank, but unchanging. His uncle hated him. He hated this youth who was so inhuman and obstinate. Nevertheless, it was to Will Brangwen that the uncle, one evening, handed over the shares which he had transferred to Anna Lenski. They were for two thousand five hundred pounds. Will Brangwen looked at his uncle. It was a great deal of the marsh capital here given away. The youth, however, was only colder and more fixed. He was abstract, purely a fixed will. He gave the shares to Anna. After which she cried for a whole day, sobbing her eyes out, and at night, when she had heard her mother go to bed, she slipped down and hung in the doorway. Her father sat in his heavy silence like a monument. He turned his head slowly. Daddy! she cried from the doorway, and she ran to him, sobbing as if her heart would break. Daddy! 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 She crouched on the hearth rug with her arms round him and her face against him. His body was so big and comfortable, but something hurt her head intolerably. She sobbed almost with hysteria. He was silent, with his hand on her shoulder. His heart was bleak. He was not her father, that beloved image she had broken. Who was he, then? A man put apart with those whose life has no more developments? He was isolated from her. There was a generation between them. He was old. He had died out from hot life. A great deal of ash was in his fire, cold ash. He felt the inevitable coldness, and in bitterness forgot the fire. He sat in his coldness of age and isolation. He had his own wife, and he blamed himself. He sneered at himself for this clinging to the young, wanting the young to belong to him. The child who clung to him wanted her child husband, as was natural, and from him brang when she wanted help, so that her life might be properly fitted out. But love she did not want. Why should there be love between them, between the stout middle-aged man and this child? How could there be anything between them but mere human willingness to help each other? He was her guardian, no more. His heart was like ice, his face cold and expressionless. She could not move him any more than a statue. She crept to bed and cried, but she was going to be married to Will Brangwen, and then she need not bother any more. Brangwen went to bed with a hard, cold heart and cursed himself. He looked at his wife. She was still his wife. Her dark hair was threaded with gray. Her face was beautiful in its gathering age. She was just fifty. How poignantly he saw her. And he wanted to cut out some of his own heart, which was incontinent, and demanded still to share the rapid life of youth. How he hated himself. His wife was so poignant and timely. She was still young and naive, with some girl's freshness. But she did not want any more the fight, the battle, the control, as he, in his incontinence, still did. She was so natural, and he was ugly, unnatural, in his inability to yield place. How hideous this greedy middle age which must stand in the way of life like a large demon. What was missing in his life that in his ravening soul he was not satisfied? He had had that friend at school, his mother, his wife, and Anna. What had he done? He had failed with his friend. He had been a poor son. But he had known satisfaction with his wife. Let it be enough. He loathed himself for the state he was in over Anna, yet he was not satisfied. It was agony to know it. Was his life nothing? Had he nothing to show, no work? He did not count his work. Anybody could have done it. What had he known but the long marital embrace with his wife? Curious that this was what his life amounted to. At any rate, it was something. It was eternal. He would say so to anybody and be proud of it. He lay with his wife in his arms, and she was still his fulfillment, just the same as ever. And that was the be-all and the end-all. Yes, and he was proud of it. But the bitterness underneath, 
that there still remained an unsatisfied Tom Brangwen, who suffered agony because a girl cared nothing for him. He loved his sons, he had them also, but it was the further, the creative life with the girl he wanted as well. Oh, and he was ashamed. He trampled himself to extinguish himself. What weariness! There was no peace, however old one grew. One was never right, never decent, never master of oneself. It was as if his hope had been in the girl. Anna quickly lapsed again into her love for the youth. Will Brangwen had fixed his marriage for the Saturday before Christmas, and he waited for her in his bright, unquestioning fashion until then. He wanted her. She was his. He suspended his being till the day should come. The wedding day, December the 23rd, had come into being for him as an absolute thing. He lived in it. He did not count the days, but like a man who journeys in a ship, he was suspended till the coming to port. He worked at his carving, he worked in his office, he came to see her. All was but a form of waiting, without thought or question. She was much more alive. She wanted to enjoy courtship. He seemed to come and go like the wind, without asking why or whither. But she wanted to enjoy his presence. For her, he was the kernel of life. To touch him alone was bliss. But for him, she was the essence of life. She existed as much when he was at his carving in his lodging in Ilkston as when she sat looking at him in the marsh kitchen. In himself he knew her, but his outward faculties seemed suspended. He did not see her with his eyes nor hear her with his voice. And yet he trembled, sometimes into a kind of swoon, holding her in his arms. They would stand sometimes folded together in the barn, in silence, then to her, as she felt his young, tense figure with her hands, the bliss was intolerable, intolerable the sense that she possessed him, for his body was so keen and wonderful, it was the only reality in her world. In her world there was this one tense, vivid body of a man, and then many other shadowy men, all unreal. In him she touched the center of reality, and they were together, he and she, at the heart of the secret. How she clutched him to her, his body the central body of all life. Out of the rock of his form the very fountain of life flowed. But to him she was a flame that consumed him. The flame flowed up his limbs, flowed through him till he was consumed, till he existed only as an unconscious dark transit of flame deriving from her. Sometimes in the darkness a cow coughed. There was in the darkness a slow sound of cud-chewing. And it all seemed to flow round them and upon them as the hot blood flows through the womb, laving the unborn young. Sometimes, when it was cold, they stood to be lovers in the stables, where the air was warm and sharp with ammonia. And during these dark vigils he learned to know her. Her body against his, they drew nearer and nearer together. The kisses came more subtly close and fitting. So when in the thick darkness a horse suddenly scrambled to its feet, with a dull, thunderous sound, they listened as one person listening. They knew as one person. They were conscious of the horse. Tom Brangwen had taken them a cottage at Cossete on a twenty-one years' lease. Will Brangwen's eyes lit up as he saw it. It was the cottage next the church, with dark yew trees, very black old trees, along the side of the house and the grassy front garden. A red, squarish cottage with a low slate roof and low windows. It had a long dairy scullery, a big flagged kitchen, and a low parlor that went up one step from the kitchen. There were whitewashed beams across the ceilings and odd corners with cupboards. Looking out through the windows there was the grassy garden, the procession of black yew trees down one side and along the other sides, a red wall with ivy separating the place from the high road and the churchyard. The old little church, with its small spire on a square tower, seemed to be looking back at the cottage windows. "'There'll be no need to have a clock,' said Will Brangwen, peeping out at the white clock face on the tower, his neighbor. At the back of the house was a garden adjoining the paddock. A cow-shed was standing for two cows, pig-coats, and fowl-houses. Will Brangwen was very happy. Anna was glad to think of being mistress of her own place.' Tom Brangwen was now the fairy godfather. He was never happy unless he was buying something. 
Will Brangwen, with his interest in all woodwork, was getting the furniture. He was left to buy tables and round staved chairs and the dressers, quite ordinary stuff, but such as was identified with his cottage. Tom Brangwen, with more particular thought, spied out what he called handy little things for her. He appeared with a set of new-fangled cooking-pans, with a special sort of hanging lamp, though the rooms were so low, with canny little machines for grinding meat or mashing potatoes or whisking eggs. Anna took a sharp interest in what he bought, though she was not always pleased. Some of the little contrivances which he thought so canny left her doubtful. Nevertheless, she was always expectant on market days. There was always a long thrill of anticipation. He arrived with the first darkness, the copper lamps of his cart glowing, and she ran to the gate as he, a dark, burly figure up in the cart, was bending over his parcels. "'It's cupboard love as brings you out so sharp,' he said, his voice resounding in the cold darkness. Nevertheless, he was excited, and she, taking one of the cart lamps, poked and peered among the jumble of things he had brought, pushing aside the oil or implements he had got for himself. She dragged out a pair of small, strong bellows, registered them in her mind, and then pulled uncertainly at something else. It had a long handle and a piece of brown paper round the middle of it, like a waistcoat. "'What's this?' she said, poking. He stopped to look at her. She went to the lamplight by the horse and stood there, bent over the new thing, while her hair was like bronze, her apron white and cheerful. Her fingers plucked busily at the paper. She dragged forth a little ringer, with clean india-rubber rollers. She examined it critically, not knowing quite how it worked. She looked up at him. He stood a shadowy presence beyond the light. "'How does it go?' she asked. "'Why, it's for pulp and turnips,' he replied. She looked at him. His voice disturbed her. "'Don't be silly. It's a little mangle,' she said. "'How do you stand it, though?' "'You screw it on the side of your wash-tub.' He came and held it out to her. "'Oh, yes!' she cried, with one of her little skipping movements, which still came when she was suddenly glad. And without another thought she ran off into the house, leaving him to untackle the horse. And when he came into the scullery he found her there with the little ringer fixed on the dolly-tub, turning blissfully at the handle, and Tilly beside her exclaiming, "'My word, that's a natty little thing! That'll save you lugging your inside out. That's the latest contraption, that is.' And Anna turned away at the handle with great gusto of possession. Then she let Tilly have a turn. "'It fair runs by itself,' said Tilly, turning on and on. "'Your clothes'll nip out on to the line.' End of chapter 4「Five of the Rainbow」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter 5 Wedding at the Marsh. It was a beautiful sunny day for the wedding, a muddy earth but a bright sky. They had three cabs and two big closed-in vehicles. Everybody crowded in the parlor in excitement. Anna was still upstairs. Her father kept taking a nip of brandy. He was handsome in his black coat and gray trousers. His voice was hearty but troubled. His wife came down in dark gray silk with lace and a touch of peacock blue in her bonnet. Her little body was very sure and definite. Brangwen was thankful she was there, to sustain him among all these people. The carriages! The Nottingham Mrs. Brangwen in silk brocade stands in the doorway saying who must go with whom. There is a great bustle. The front door is opened, and the wedding guests are walking down the garden path, whilst those still waiting peer through the window, and the little crowd at the gate gorps and stretches. How funny such dressed-up people look in the winter sunshine! They are gone, another lot. There begins to be more room. Anna comes down blushing and very shy, to be viewed in her white silk and her veil. Her mother-in-law surveys her objectively, twitches the white train, arranges the folds of the veil, and asserts herself. 
loud exclamations from the window that the bridegroom's carriage has just passed. "'Where's your hat, father, and your gloves?' cries the bride, stamping her white slipper, her eyes flashing through her veil. He hunts round. His hair is ruffled. Everybody has gone but the bride and her father. He is ready, his face very red and daunted. Tilly dithers in the little porch, waiting to open the door. A waiting woman walks round Anna, who asks, "'Am I all right?' She is ready. She bridles herself and looks queenly. She waves her hand sharply to her father. "'Come here.' He goes. She puts her hand very lightly on his arm, and holding her bouquet like a shower, stepping, oh, very graciously, just a little impatient with her father for being so red in the face, she sweeps slowly past the fluttering Tilly and down the path. There are hoarse shouts at the gate, and all her floating foamy whiteness passes slowly into the cab. Her father notices her slim ankle and foot as she steps up. A child's foot. His heart is hard with tenderness. But she is in ecstasies with herself for making such a lovely spectacle. All the way she sat flamboyant with bliss because it was all so lovely. She looked down solicitously at her bouquet. White roses and lilies of the valley and tuberoses and maidenhair fern, very rich and cascade-like. Her father sat bewildered with all this strangeness. His heart was so full it felt hard, and he couldn't think of anything. The church was decorated for Christmas, dark with evergreens, cold and snowy with white flowers. He went vaguely down to the altar. How long was it since he had gone to be married himself? He was not sure whether he was going to be married now or what he had come for. He had a troubled notion that he had to do something or other— he saw his wife's bonnet, and wondered why she wasn't there with him. They stood before the altar. He was staring up at the east window that glowed intensely, a sort of blue-purple. It was deep blue glowing, and some crimson and little yellow flowers held fast in veins of shadow, in a heavy web of darkness, how it burned alive in radiance among its black web. "'Who giveth this woman to be married to this man?' He felt somebody touch him. He started. The words still re-echoed in his memory, but were drawing off. "'Me,' he said hastily. Anna bent her head and smiled in her veil. How absurd he was! Brangwen was staring away at the burning blue window at the back of the altar, and wondering vaguely, with pain, if he ever should get old, if he ever should feel arrived and established. He was here at Anna's wedding— well, what right had he to feel responsible, like a father? He was still as unsure and unfixed as when he had married himself, his wife and he. With a pang of anguish he realized what uncertainties they both were. He was a man of forty-five. Forty-five! In five more years fifty! Then sixty! Then seventy! Then it was finished! My God! And one still was so unestablished! How did one grow old? How could one become confident? He wished he felt older. Why, what difference was there, as far as he felt matured or completed, between him now and him at his own wedding? He might be getting married over again, he and his wife. He felt himself tiny, a little upright figure on a plain circled round with the immense roaring sky. He and his wife, two little upright figures, walking across this plain, whilst the heavens shimmered and roared about them. When did one come to an end? In which direction was it finished? There was no end, no finish, only this roaring vast space. Did one never get old, never die? That was the clue. He exulted strangely with torture. He would go on with his wife, he and she, like two children camping in the plains. What was sure but the endless sky? But that was so sure, so boundless. Still, the royal blue color burned and blazed and sported itself in the web of darkness before him, unwearingly rich and splendid. How rich and splendid his own life was, red and burning and blazing and sporting itself in the dark meshes of his body, and his wife, how she glowed and burned dark within her meshes. Always it was so unfinished and unformed. There was a loud noise of the organ. The whole party was trooping to the vestry. 
There was a blotted, scrawled book, and that young girl putting back her veil in her vanity, and laying her hand with the wedding ring self-consciously conspicuous, and signing her name proudly, because of the vain spectacle she made. Anna Teresa Lensky. Anna Teresa Lensky, what a vain, independent minx she was! The bridegroom, slender in his black swallow-tail and grey trousers, solemn as a young solemn cat, was writing seriously, William Brangwen. That looked more like it. "'Come and sign, father,' cried the imperious young hussy. "'Thomas Brangwen, clumsy fist,' he said to himself as he signed. Then his brother, a big sallow fellow with black side-whiskers, wrote, "'Alfred Brangwen.' "'How many more Brangwens?' said Tom Brangwen, ashamed of the too frequent recurrence of his family name. When they were out again in the sunshine, and he saw the frost hoary and blue among the long grass under the tombstones, the holly berries overhead twinkling scarlet as the bells rang, the yew-trees hanging their black motionless ragged boughs, everything seemed like a vision. The marriage party went across the graveyard to the wall, mounted it by the little steps, and descended. Oh, a vain white peacock of a bride, perching herself on the top of the wall, and giving her hand to the bridegroom on the other side to be helped down. The vanity of her white, slim, daintily stepping feet, and her arched neck, and the regal impudence with which she seemed to dismiss them all, the others, parents and wedding guests, as she went with her young husband. In the cottage big fires were burning. There were dozens of glasses on the table, and holly and mistletoe hanging up. The wedding party crowded in, and Tom Brangwen, becoming roisterous, poured out drinks. Everybody must drink. The bells were ringing away against the windows. "'Lift your glasses up!' shouted Tom Brangwen from the parlour. "'Lift your glasses up and drink to the hearth and home, hearth and home, and may they enjoy it!' "'Night and day, and may they enjoy it!' shouted Frank Brangwen, in addition. "'Hammer and tongs, and may they enjoy it!' shouted Alfred Brangwen, the Saturnine. "'Fill your glasses up, and let's have it all over again,' shouted Tom Brangwen. "'Hearth and home, and may ye enjoy it!' There was a ragged shout of the company in response. "'Bed and blessin', and may ye enjoy it!' shouted Frank Brangwen. There was a swelling chorus in answer. "'Comin' and goin', and may ye enjoy it!' shouted the Saturnine Alfred Brangwen, and the men roared by now boldly, and the women said, "'Just hark now!' There was a touch of scandal in the air, then the party rolled off in the carriages, full speed back to the marsh, to a large meal of the high tea order, which lasted for an hour and a half. The bride and bridegroom sat at the head of the table, very prim and shining, both of them, wordless, whilst the company raged down the table. The Brangwen men had brandy in their tea, and were becoming unmanageable. The Saturnine Alfred had glittering, unseeing eyes, and a strange, fierce way of laughing that showed his teeth. His wife glowered at him, and jerked her head at him like a snake. He was oblivious. Frank Brangwen, the butcher, flushed and florid and handsome, roared echoes to his two brothers. Tom Brangwen, in his solid fashion, was letting himself go at last. These three brothers dominated the whole company. Tom Brangwen wanted to make a speech. For the first time in his life he must spread himself wordily. Marriage? he began, his eyes twinkling and yet quite profound, for he was deeply serious and hugely amused at the same time. "'Marriage,' he said, speaking in the slow, full-mouthed way of the Brangwens, "'is what we're made for.' "'Let him talk,' said Alfred Brangwen, slowly and inscrutably. "'Let him talk.' Mrs. Alfred darted indignant eyes at her husband. "'A man,' continued Tom Brangwen, "'enjoys being a man.' For what purpose was he made a man, if not to enjoy it? That a true word, said Frank floridly. And likewise, continued Tom Brangwen, a woman enjoys being a woman. At least we surmise she does. Oh, don't you bother, called the farmer's wife. You may back your life they'd be surmising, said Frank's wife. Now, continued Tom Brangwen, for a man to be a man it takes a woman... "'It does that,' said a woman grimly. "'And for a woman to be a woman, it takes a man,' continued Tom Brangwen. "'All speak up, men,' chimed in a feminine voice. 
"'Therefore we have marriage,' continued Tom Brangwen. "'Hold, hold,' said Alfred Brangwen. "'Don't run us off our legs.' And in dead silence the glasses were filled. The bride and bridegroom, two children, sat with intent, shining faces at the head of the table, abstracted. "'There's no marriage in heaven,' went on Tom Brangwen, "'but on earth there is marriage.' "'That's the difference between them, said Alfred Brangwen, mocking. "'Alfred,' said Tom Brangwen, "'keep your remarks till afterwards, and then we'll thank you for them. "'There's very little else on earth but marriage. "'You can talk about making money or saving souls. "'You can save your own soul seven times over, "'and you may have a mint of money, "'but your soul goes gnawing, 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 "'and it says there's something it must have. "'In heaven there is no marriage.' "'But on earth there is marriage, else heaven drops out, and there's no bottom to it.' "'Just hark you now,' said Frank's wife. "'Go on, Thomas,' said Alfred sardonically. "'If we've got to be angels,' went on Tom Brangwen, haranguing the company at large, "'and if there is no such thing as a man nor a woman amongst them, "'then it seems to me as a married couple makes one angel.' "'It's the brandy,' said Alfred Brangwen wearily. For, said Tom Brangwen, and the company was listening to the conundrum, an angel can't be less than a human being, and if it was only the soul of a man minus the man, then it would be less than a human being. Decidedly, said Alfred, and a laugh went round the table, but Tom Brangwen was inspired. An angel's got to be more than a human being, he continued. So I say an angel is the soul of man and woman in one. They rise united at the judgment day as one angel. Praising the Lord, said Frank. Praising the Lord, repeated Tom. And what about the women left over, asked Alfred, jeering. The company was getting uneasy. That I can't tell. How do I know as there is anybody left over at the judgment day? Let that be. What I say is, that when a man's soul and a woman's soul unites together, that makes an angel. "'I don't know about souls. I know as one plus one makes three sometimes,' said Frank. But he had the laugh to himself. "'Bodies and souls, it's the same,' said Tom. "'And what about your missus, who was married afore you knew her?' asked Alfred, set on edge by this discourse. "'That I can't tell you. "'If I am to become an angel, it'll be my married soul and not my single soul.' It'll not be the soul of me when I was a lad, for I hadn't a soul as would make an angel then. I can always remember, said Frank's wife, when our herald was bad, he did nothing but see an angel at the back of the looking-glass. Look, mother, he said, at that angel. There isn't no angel, my duck, I said, but he wouldn't have it. I took the looking-glass off in the dressing-table, but it made no difference. He kept on saying it was there. "'My word, it did give me a turn. "'I thought for sure as I'd lost him.' "'I can remember,' said another man, "'Tom's sister's husband. "'My mother gave me a good hiding once "'for saying I'd got an angel up my nose. "'She seed me poking, and she said, "'What are you poking at your nose for? "'Give over. "'There's an angel up it,' I said, "'and she fetched me such a wipe. "'But there was. "'We used to call them thistle things angels "'as wafts about.' "'and I'd pushed one of these up my nose for some reason or other. "'It's wonderful what children will get up their noses,' said Frank's wife. "'I can remember our Hemi. "'She shoved one of them bluebell things out of the middle of a bluebell, "'what they call candles, up her nose, and, oh, we had some work. "'I'd seen her sticking them on the end of her nose, like, "'but I never thought she'd be so soft as to shove it right up. "'She was a gell of eight or more.' "'Oh, my word, we got a crochet hook, and I don't know what.' Tom Brangwen's mood of inspiration began to pass away. He forgot all about it, and was soon roaring and shouting with the rest. Outside the wake came, singing the carols. They were invited into the bursting house. They had two fiddles and a piccolo. There in the parlor they played carols, and the whole company sang them at the top of its voice. Only the bride and bridegroom sat with shining eyes and strange bright faces, and scarcely sang, or only with just moving lips. The wake departed, and the geysers came. There was loud applause and shouting and excitement, as the old mystery play of St. George, in which every man present had acted as a boy, 
proceeded with banging and thumping of club and dripping pan. "'By Jove, I got a crack once when I was playing Beelzebub,' said Tom Brangwen, his eyes full of water with laughing. "'It knocked all the sense out of me as you'd crack an egg. "'But I tell you, when I come to, I played old Johnny Roger with St. George. I did that.' He was shaking with laughter. Another knock came at the door. There was a hush. "'It's the cab,' said somebody from the door. "'Walk in!' shouted Tom Brangwen, and a red-faced grinning man entered. "'Now you two get yourselves ready and off to blanket fair,' shouted Tom Brangwen. "'Strike a daisy, but if you're not off like a blink of lightning, you shan't a go. You shall sleep separate.' Anna rose silently and went to change her dress. Will Brangwen would have gone out, but Tilly came with his hat and coat. The youth was helped on. "'Well, here's luck, my boy,' shouted his father. "'When the fat's in the fire, let it frizzle,' admonished his Uncle Frank. "'Fair and softly does it, fair and softly does it,' cried his aunt. Frank's wife, contrary. "'You don't want to fall over yourself,' said his uncle by marriage. "'You're not a bull at a gate.' "'Let a man have his own road,' said Tom Brangwen testily. "'Don't be so free of your advice. "'It's his wedding this time, not yours.' "'He don't want many signposts,' said his father. "'There's some roads a man has to be led, "'and there's some roads a boss-eyed man can only follow with one eye shut. "'But this road can't be lost by a blind man, nor a boss-eyed man, nor a cripple. "'And he's neither, thank God.' "'Don't you be so sure of your walking powers,' cried Frank's wife. "'There's many a man gets no further than half-way, nor can't to save his life, let him live for ever.' "'Why, how do you know?' said Alfred. "'It's plain enough in the looks of some,' retorted Lizzie, his sister-in-law. The youth stood with a faint, half-hearing smile on his face. He was tense and abstracted. These things, or anything, scarcely touched him. Anna came down in her day-dress, very elusive. She kissed everybody, men and women. Will Brangwen shook hands with everybody, kissed his mother, who began to cry, and the whole party went surging out to the cab. The young couple were shut up. Last injunction shouted at them. "'Drive on!' shouted Tom Brangwen. The cab rolled off. They saw the light diminish under the ash-trees. Then the whole party quietened, went indoors. "'They'll have three good fires burning,' said Tom Brangwen, looking at his watch. I told Emma to make em up at nine, and then leave the door on the latch. It's only half past. They'll have three fires burning, and lamps lighted, and Emma will a warmed the bed with a warming pan. So I should think they'll be all right. The party was much quieter. They talked of the young couple. She said she didn't want a servant in, said Tom Brangwen. The house isn't big enough. She'd always have the creature under her nose. Emma'll do what is wanted of her, and they'll be to themselves. "'It's best,' said Lizzie. "'You're more free.' The party talked on slowly. Brangwen looked at his watch. "'Let's go and give him a carol,' he said. "'We shall find the fiddles at the cock and robin.' "'Hey, come on,' said Frank. Alfred rose in silence. The brother-in-law and one of Will's brothers rose also. The five men went out. The night was flashing with stars. Sirius blazed like a signal at the side of the hill. Orion, stately and magnificent, was sloping along. Tom walked with his brother Alfred. The men's heels rang on the ground. "'It's a fine night,' said Tom. "'Eh,' said Alfred, "'nice to get out.' "'Eh.' The brothers walked close together, the bond of blood strong between them. Tom always felt very much the junior to Alfred. "'It's a long while since you left home,' he said. "'Eh,' said Alfred.' I thought I was getting a bit oldish, but I'm not. It's the things you've got as gets worn out. It's not you yourself. Why, what's worn out? Most folks as I've anything to do with, as has anything to do with me, they all break down. You've got to go on by yourself, if it's only to perdition. There's nobody going alongside, even there. Tom Brangwen meditated this. Maybe you was never broken in, he said. "'No, I never was,' said Alfred proudly. And Tom felt his elder brother despised him a little. He winced under it. "'Everybody's got a way of their own,' he said stubbornly. "'It's only a dog as hasn't, and them as can't take what they give and give what they take, they must go by themselves or 
"'Get a dog as'll follow em. "'They can do without the dog,' said his brother. "'And again Tom Brangwen was humble, "'thinking his brother was bigger than himself. "'But if he was, he was. "'And if it were finer to go alone, it was. "'He did not want to go for all that. "'They went over the field, "'where a thin, keen wind blew round the ball of the hill "'in the starlight. "'They came to the stile and to the side of Anna's house. "'The lights were out.' Only on the blinds of the rooms downstairs and of a bedroom upstairs firelight flickered. "'We'd better leave him alone,' said Alfred Brangwen. "'Nay, nay,' said Tom, "'we'll carol him for the last time.' And in a quarter of an hour's time eleven silent, rather tipsy men scrambled over the wall and into the garden by the yew-trees outside the windows where faint firelight glowered on the blinds. There came a shrill sound, two violins and a piccolo shrilling on the frosty air. In the fields, with their flocks abiding, a commotion of men's voices broke out, singing in ragged unison. Anna Brangwen had started up listening when the music began. She was afraid. "'It's the wake,' he whispered. She remained tense, her heart beating heavily, possessed with strange, strong fear. Then there came the burst of men's singing, rather uneven. She strained still, listening. "'It's Dad,' she said in a low voice. They were silent, listening. "'And my father,' he said. She listened still, but she was sure. She sank down again into bed, into his arms. He held her very close, kissing her. The hymn rambled on outside, all the men singing their best, having forgotten everything else under the spell of the fiddles on the tune, the firelight glowed against the darkness in the room. Anna could hear her father singing with gusto. "'Aren't they silly?' she whispered. And they crept closer, closer together, hearts beating to one another, and even as the hymn rolled on, they ceased to hear it. End of chapter 5《ハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピーハッピ Wasn't there some duty outside calling him and he did not come? It was all very well at night when the doors were locked and the darkness drawn round the two of them. Then they were the only inhabitants of the visible earth. The rest were under the flood. And being alone in the world, they were a law unto themselves. They could enjoy and squander and waste like conscienceless gods. But in the morning, as the carts clanked by and children shouted down the lane, as the hucksters came calling their wares, and the church clock struck eleven, and he and she had not got up yet, even to breakfast, he could not help feeling guilty, as if he were committing a breach of the law, ashamed that he was not up and doing. "'Doing what?' she asked. "'What is there to do? You will only lounge about.' Still, even lounging about was respectable. One was at least in connection with the world then, whereas now, lying so still and peacefully, while the daylight came obscurely through the drawn blind, one was severed from the world. One shut oneself off in tacit denial of the world, and he was troubled. But it was so sweet and satisfying, lying there talking desultorily with her. It was sweeter than sunshine, and not so evanescent. It was even irritating the way the church clock kept on chiming. There seemed no space between the hours. Just a moment, golden and still, whilst she traced his features with her fingertips, utterly careless and happy, and he loved her to do it. But he was strange and unused. So suddenly everything that had been before was shed away and gone. One day he was a bachelor, 
living with the world. The next day he was with her, as remote from the world as if the two of them were buried like a seed in darkness. Suddenly, like a chestnut falling out of a burr, he was shed naked and glistening on to a soft, fecund earth, leaving behind him the hard rind of worldly knowledge and experience. He heard it in the huckster's cries, the noise of carts, the calling of children, and it was all like the hard shed rind, discarded. Inside, in the softness and stillness of the room, was the naked kernel that palpitated in silent activity, absorbed in reality. Inside the room was a great steadiness, a core of living eternity. Only far outside at the rim went on the noise and the destruction. Here at the center, the great wheel was motionless, centered upon itself. Here was a poised, unflawed stillness that was beyond time, because it remained the same, inexhaustible, unchanging, unexhausted. As they lay close together, complete and beyond the touch of time or change, it was as if they were at the very centre of all the slow wheeling of space and the rapid agitation of life. Deep, deep inside them all, at the centre where there is utter radiance and eternal being, and the silence absorbed in praise, the steady core of all movements, the unawakened sleep of all wakefulness. They found themselves there, and they lay still in each other's arms. For their moment they were at the heart of eternity, whilst time roared far off, forever far off, towards the rim. Then gradually they were passed away from the supreme centre, down the circles of praise and joy and gladness, further and further out towards the noise and the friction. But their hearts had burned and were tempered by the inner reality. They were unalterably glad. Gradually they began to wake up. The noises outside became more real. They understood and answered the call outside. They counted the strokes of the bell, and when they counted midday they understood that it was midday in the world, and for themselves also. It dawned upon her that she was hungry. She had been getting hungrier for a lifetime, but even yet it was not sufficiently real to rouse her. A long way off she could hear the words, "'I am dying of hunger!' Yet she lay still, separate, at peace, and the words were unuttered. There was still another lapse. And then, quite calmly, even a little surprised, she was in the present and was saying, I am dying with hunger. So am I, he said calmly, as if it were of not the slightest significance. And they relapsed into the warm golden stillness, and the minutes flowed unheeded past the window outside. Then suddenly she stirred against him. "'My dear, I am dying of hunger,' she said. It was a slight pain to him to be brought to. "'We'll get up,' he said, unmoving. And she sank her head on to him again, and they lay still, lapsing. Half-consciously he heard the clock chime the hour. She did not hear. "'Do get up,' she murmured at length, "'and give me something to eat.' Yes, he said, and he put his arms round her, and she lay with her face on him. They were faintly astonished that they did not move. The minutes rustled louder at the window. Let me go, then, he said. She lifted her head from him relinquishingly. With a little breaking away, he moved out of bed, and was taking his clothes. She stretched out her hand to him. You are so nice, she said, and he went back for a moment or two. Then, actually, he did slip into some clothes, and, looking round quickly at her, was gone out of the room. She lay translated again into a pale, clearer peace, as if she were a spirit. She listened to the noise of him downstairs, as if she were no longer of the material world. It was half-past one. He looked at the silent kitchen, untouched from last night, dim with the drawn blind, and he hastened to draw up the blind, so people should know they were not in bed any later. While well, it was his own house, it did not matter. Hastily he put wood in the grate and made a fire. He exulted in himself, like an adventurer on an undiscovered island. The fire blazed up. He put on the kettle. How happy he felt! How still and secluded the house was! There were only he and she in the world. But when he unbolted the door and, half-dressed, looked out, he felt furtive and guilty. The world was there after all and he had felt so secure, as though this house were the ark in the flood, and all the rest was drowned. The world was there, and it was afternoon. 
The morning had vanished and gone by. The day was growing old. Where was the bright, fresh morning? He was accused. Was the morning gone, and he had lain with blinds drawn, let it pass by unnoticed? He looked again round the chill grey afternoon, and he himself so soft and warm and glowing. There were two sprigs of yellow jasmine in the saucer that covered the milk jug. He wondered who had been and left the sign. Taking the jug, he hastily shut the door, let the day and the daylight drop out, let it go by unseen. He did not care. What did one day more or less matter to him? It could fall into oblivion unspent if it liked this one course of daylight. "'Somebody has been and found the door locked,' he said, when he went upstairs with the tray. He gave her the two sprigs of jasmine. She laughed as she sat up in bed, childishly threading the flowers in the breast of her nightdress. Her brown hair stuck out like a nimbus all fierce round her softly glowing face. Her dark eyes watched the tray eagerly. "'How good!' she cried, sniffing the cold air. "'I'm glad you did a lot.' And she stretched out her hands eagerly for her plate. "'Come back to bed, quick, it's cold.' She rubbed her hands together sharply. He put off what little clothing he had on, and sat beside her in the bed. "'You look like a lion, with your mane sticking out and your nose pushed over your food,' he said. She tinkled with laughter, and gladly ate her breakfast. The morning was sunk away unseen. The afternoon was steadily going, too, and he was letting it go. One bright transit of daylight gone by unacknowledged. There was something unmanly, recusant in it. He could not quite reconcile himself to the fact. He felt he ought to get up, go out quickly into the daylight, and work, or spend himself energetically in the open air of the afternoon, retrieving what was left to him of the day. But he did not go. Well, one might as well be hung for a sheep as for a lamb. If he had lost this day of his life, he had lost it. He gave it up. He was not going to count his losses. She didn't care. She didn't care in the least. Then why should he? Should he be behind her in recklessness and independence? She was superb in her indifference. He wanted to be like her. She took her responsibilities lightly. When she spilled her tea on the pillow, she rubbed it carelessly with a handkerchief and turned over the pillow. He would have felt guilty. She did not. And it pleased him. It pleased him very much to see how these things did not matter to her. When the meal was over, she wiped her mouth on her handkerchief, quickly, satisfied and happy, and settled down on the pillow again with her fingers in his close, strange, fur-like hair. The evening began to fall. The light was half alive, livid. He hid his face against her. "'I don't like the twilight,' he said. "'I love it,' she answered. He hid his face against her, who was warm and like sunlight. She seemed to have sunlight inside her. Her heart beating seemed like sunlight upon him. In her was a more real day than the day could give, so warm and steady and restoring. He hid his face against her whilst the twilight fell, whilst she lay staring out with her unseeing dark eyes, as if she wandered forth untrammeled in the vagueness. The vagueness gave her scope and set her free. To him, turned towards her heart pulse, all was very still and very warm and very close, like noontide. He was glad to know this warm, full noon. It ripened him and took away his responsibility, some of his conscience. They got up when it was quite dark. She hastily twisted her hair into a knot and was dressed in a twinkling. Then they went downstairs, drew to the fire, and sat in silence, saying a few words now and then. Her father was coming. She bundled the dishes away, flew round and tidied the room, assumed another character, and again seated herself. He sat thinking of his carving of Eve. He loved to go over his carving in his mind, dwelling on every stroke, every line. How he loved it now! When he went back to his creation panel again, he would finish his Eve, tender and sparkling. It did not satisfy him yet. The Lord should labor over her in a silent passion of creation, and Adam should be tense as if in a dream of immortality, and Eve should take form glimmeringly, shadowily, as if the Lord must wrestle with his own soul for her, yet she was a radiance. "'What are you thinking about?' she asked. He found it difficult to say. His soul became shy when he tried to communicate it. "'I was thinking my Eve was too hard and lively.' "'Why?' I don't know. She should be more... 
He made a gesture of infinite tenderness. There was a stillness with a little joy. He could not tell her any more. Why could he not tell her any more? She felt a pang of disconsolate sadness, but it was nothing. She went to him. Her father came and found them both very glowing, like an open flower. He loved to sit with them. Where there was a perfume of love, any one who came must breathe it. They were both very quick and alive, lit up from the other world, so that it was quite an experience for them that any one else could exist. But still it troubled Will Brangwen a little, in his orderly conventional mind, that the established rule of things had gone so utterly. One ought to get up in the morning and wash oneself and be a decent social being. Instead, the two of them stayed in bed till nightfall and then got up. She never washed her face, but sat there talking to her father as bright and shameless as a daisy opened out of the dew. Or she got up at ten o'clock and quite blithely went to bed again at three or at half past four, stripping him naked in the daylight and all so gladly and perfectly, oblivious quite of his qualms. He let her do as she liked with him and shone with strange pleasure. She was to dispose of him as she would. He was translated with gladness to be in her hands, and down went his qualms, his maxims, his rules, his smaller beliefs. She scattered them like an expert skittle player. He was very much astonished and delighted to see them scatter. He stood and gazed and grinned with wonder whilst his tablets of stone went bounding and bumping and splintering down the hill, dislodged for ever. Indeed, it was true, as they said, that a man wasn't born before he was married. What a change, indeed! He surveyed the rind of the world, houses, factories, trams, the discarded rind, people scurrying about, work going on, all on the discarded surface. An earthquake had burst it all from inside. It was as if the surface of the world had been broken away entire. Ilkston, streets, church, people, work— rule of the day, all intact, and yet peeled away into unreality, leaving here exposed the inside, the reality, one's own being, strange feelings and passions and yearnings and beliefs and aspirations, suddenly become present, revealed, the permanent bedrock, knitted one rock with the woman he loved. It was confounding. Things are not what they seem. When he was a child, he had thought a woman was a woman merely by virtue of her skirts and petticoats. And now, lo, the whole world could be divested of its garment. The garment could lie there shed away intact, and one could stand in a new world, a new earth, naked in a new naked universe. It was too astounding and miraculous. This, then, was marriage. The old things didn't matter any more. One got up at four o'clock and had broth at tea-time and made toffee in the middle of the night. One didn't put on one's clothes, or one did put on one's clothes. He still was not quite sure it was not criminal, but it was a discovery to find one might be so supremely absolved. All that mattered was that he should love her and she should love him, and they should live kindled to one another like the Lord in two burning bushes that were not consumed. And so they lived for the time." She was less hampered than he, so she came more quickly to her fullness, and was sooner ready to enjoy again a return to the outside world. She was going to give a tea-party. His heart sank. He wanted to go on, to go on as they were. He wanted to have done with the outside world, to declare it finished for ever. He was anxious with a deep desire and anxiety that she should stay with him where they were, in the timeless universe of free, perfect limbs and immortal breasts, affirming that the old outward order was finished. The new order was begun to last for ever. The living life, palpitating from the gleaming core to action, without crust or cover or outward lie. But no, he could not keep her. She wanted the dead world again. She wanted to walk on the outside once more. She was going to give a tea-party. It made him frightened and furious and miserable. He was afraid all would be lost that he had so newly come into, like the youth in the fairy tale, who was king for one day in the year and for the rest a beaten herd, like Cinderella also at the feast. He was sullen, but she blithely began to make preparations for her tea-party. His fear was too strong. He was troubled. He hated her shallow anticipation and joy. 
Was she not forfeiting the reality, the one reality for all that was shallow and worthless? Wasn't she carelessly taking off her crown to be an artificial figure, having other artificial women to tea, when she might have been perfect with him and kept him perfect in the land of intimate connection? Now he must be deposed, his joy must be destroyed, he must put on the vulgar, shallow death of an outward existence. He ground his soul in uneasiness and fear, but she rose to a real outburst of housework, turning him away as she shoved the furniture aside to her broom. He stood hanging miserable near. He wanted her back. Dread and desire for her to stay with him and shame at his own dependence on her drove him to anger. He began to lose his head. The wonder was going to pass away again. All the love, the magnificent new order was going to be lost. She would forfeit it all for the outside things. She would admit the outside world again. She would throw away the living fruit for the ostensible rind. He began to hate this in her. Driven by fear of her departure into a state of helplessness, almost of imbecility, he wandered about the house. And she, with her skirts kilted up, flew round at her work, absorbed. "'Shake the rug, then, if you must hang round,' she said. And fretting with resentment, he went to shake the rug. She was blithely unconscious of him. He came back, hanging near to her. "'Can't you do anything?' she said, as if to a child, impatiently. "'Can't you do your woodwork?' "'Where shall I do it?' he asked, harsh with pain. "'Anywhere!' How furious that made him. "'Or go for a walk,' she continued. "'Go down to the marsh. Don't hang about as if you were only half there.' He winced and hated it. He went away to read. Never had his soul felt so flayed and uncreated. And soon he must come down again to her. His hovering near her, wanting her to be with him, the futility of him, the way his hands hung, irritated her beyond bearing. She turned on him blindly and destructively. He became a mad creature, black and electric with fury. The dark storms rose in him. His eyes glowed black and evil. He was fiendish in his thwarted soul. There followed two black and ghastly days when she was set in anguish against him, and he felt as if he were in a black, violent underworld, and his wrists quivered murderously, and she resisted him. He seemed a dark, almost evil thing, pursuing her, hanging on to her, burdening her. She would give anything to have him removed. "'You need some work to do,' she said. "'You ought to be at work. Can't you do something?' His soul only grew the blacker. His condition now became complete. The darkness of his soul was thorough. Everything had gone. He remained complete in his own tense black will. He was now unaware of her. She did not exist. His dark, passionate soul had recoiled upon itself, and now, clinched and coiled round a centre of hatred, existed in its own power. There was a curiously ugly pallor and expressionlessness in his face. She shuddered from him. She was afraid of him. His will seemed grappled upon her. She retreated before him. She went down to the marsh. She entered again the immunity of her parents' love for her. He remained at Yew Cottage, black and clinched, his mind dead. He was unable to work at his wood-carving. He went on working monotonously at the garden, blindly, like a mole. As she came home up the hill, Looking away at the town, dim and blue on the hill, her heart relaxed and became yearning. She did not want to fight him any more. She wanted love, oh, love. Her feet began to hurry. She wanted to get back to him. Her heart became tight with yearning for him. He had been making the garden in order, cutting the edges of the turf, laying the path with stones. He was a good, capable workman. "'How nice you've made it,' she said approaching tentatively down the path. But he did not heed, he did not hear. His brain was solid and dead. "'Haven't you made it nice?' she repeated rather plaintively. He looked up at her with that fixed, expressionless face and unseeing eyes which shocked her, made her go dazed and blind. Then he turned away. She saw his slender, stooping figure groping. A revulsion came over her. She went indoors. As she took off her hat in the bedroom, she found herself weeping bitterly with some of the old anguished childish desolation. She sat still and cried on. She did not want him to know. 
She was afraid of his hard, evil moments. The head dropped a little, rigidly, in a crouching, cruel way. She was afraid of him. He seemed to lacerate her sensitive femaleness. He seemed to hurt her womb, to take pleasure in torturing her. He came into the house. The sound of his footsteps in his heavy boots filled her with horror. A hard, cruel, malignant sound. She was afraid he would come upstairs, but he did not. She waited apprehensively. He went out. Where she was most vulnerable, he hurt her. Oh, where she was delivered over to him in her very soft femaleness, he seemed to lacerate her and desecrate her. She pressed her hands over her womb in anguish whilst the tears ran down her face. And why, and why, why was he like this? Suddenly she dried her tears. She must get the tea ready. She went downstairs and set the table. When the meal was ready, she called to him. I've mashed the tea, Will. Are you coming? She herself could hear the sound of tears in her own voice, and she began to cry again. He did not answer, but went on with his work. She waited a few minutes in anguish. Fear came over her. She was panic-stricken with terror, like a child, and she could not go home again to her father. She was held by the power in this man who had taken her. She turned indoors so that he should not see her tears. She sat down to table. Presently he came into the scullery. His movements jarred on her as she heard them. How horrible was the way he pumped, exacerbating, so cruel! How she hated to hear him! How he hated her! How his hatred was like blows upon her! The tears were coming again. He came in, his face wooden and lifeless, fixed, persistent. He sat down to tea, his head dropped over his cup, uglily. His hands were red from the cold water, and there were rims of earth in his nails. He went on with his tea. It was his negative insensitiveness to her that she could not bear, something clayey and ugly. His intelligence was self-absorbed. How unnatural it was to sit with a self-absorbed creature, like something negative ensconced opposite one. Nothing could touch him. He could only absorb things into his own self. The tears were running down her face. Something startled him, and he was looking at her with his hateful, hard, bright eyes, hard and unchanging as a bird of prey. "'What are you crying for?' came the grating voice. She winced through her womb. She could not stop crying. "'What are you crying for?' came the question again, in just the same tone, and still there was silence, with only the sniff of her tears. His eyes glittered, and as if with malignant desire. She shrank and became blind. She was like a bird being beaten down. A sort of swoon of helplessness came over her. She was of another order than he. She had no defense against him. Against such an influence she was only vulnerable. She was given up. He rose and went out of the house, possessed by the evil spirit. It tortured him and racked him and fought in him, and whilst he worked in the deepening twilight it left him. Suddenly he saw that she was hurt. He had only seen her triumphant before. Suddenly his heart was torn with compassion for her. He became alive again, in an anguish of compassion. He could not bear to think of her tears. He could not bear it. He wanted to go to her and pour out his heart's blood to her. He wanted to give everything to her, all his blood, his life, to the last dregs, pour everything away to her. He yearned with passionate desire to offer himself to her, utterly. The evening star came, and the night. She had not lighted the lamp. His heart burned with pain and with grief. He trembled to go to her, and at last he went, hesitating, burdened with a great offering. The hardness had gone out of him. His body was sensitive, slightly trembling. His hand was curiously sensitive, shrinking as he shut the door. He fixed the latch almost tenderly. In the kitchen was only the fire-glow. He could not see her. He quivered with dread lest she had gone. He knew not where. In shrinking dread he went through to the parlor, to the foot of the stairs. Anna, he called. There was no answer. He went up the stairs, in dread of the empty house, the horrible emptiness that made his heart ring with insanity. He opened the bedroom door, and his heart flashed with certainty that she had gone, that he was alone. But he saw her on the bed, lying very still and scarcely noticeable, with her back to him. 
He went and put his hand on her shoulder, very gently, hesitating, in a great fear and self-offering. She did not move. He waited. The hand that touched her shoulder hurt him, as if she were sending it away. He stood dim with pain. "'Anna,' he said. But still she was motionless, like a curled-up oblivious creature. His heart beat with strange throes of pain. Then, by a motion under his hand, he knew she was crying, holding herself hard so that her tears should not be known. He waited. The tension continued. Perhaps she was not crying. Then suddenly relapsed with a sharp catch of a sob. His heart flamed with love and suffering for her. Kneeling carefully on the bed so that his earthy boots should not touch it, he took her in his arms to comfort her. The sobs gathered in her. She was sobbing bitterly, but not to him. She was still away from him. He held her against his breast whilst she sobbed, withheld from him, and all his body vibrated against her. "'Don't cry, don't cry,' he said, with an odd simplicity. His heart was calm and numb with a sort of innocence, of love now. She still sobbed, ignoring him, ignoring that he held her. His lips were dry. "'Don't cry, my love.' he said, in the same abstract way. In his breast his heart burned like a torch with suffering. He could not bear the desolateness of her crying. He would have soothed her with his blood. He heard the church clock chime as if it touched him, and he waited in suspense for it to have gone by. It was quiet again. "'My love,' he said to her, bending to touch her wet face with his mouth. He was afraid to touch her. How wet her face was! His body trembled as he held her. He loved her till he felt his heart and all his veins would burst and flood her with his hot, healing blood. He knew his blood would heal and restore her. She was becoming quieter. He thanked the God of mercy that at last she was becoming quieter. His head felt so strange and blazed. Still he held her close with trembling arms. His blood seemed very strong, enveloping her. And at last she began to draw near to him. She nestled to him. His limbs, his body, took fire and beat up in flames. She clung to him. She cleaved to his body. The flames swept him. He held her in sinews of fire. If she would kiss him, he bent his mouth down, and her mouth, soft and moist, received him. He felt his veins would burst with anguish of thankfulness. His heart was mad with gratefulness. He could pour himself out upon her forever. When they came to themselves, the night was very dark. Two hours had gone by. They lay still and warm and weak like the newborn together, and there was a silence almost of the unborn. Only his heart was weeping happily after the pain. He did not understand. He had yielded, given way. There was no understanding. There could be only acquiescence and submission and tremulous wonder of consummation. The next morning when they woke up it had snowed. He wondered what was the strange pallor in the air, and the unusual tang. Snow was on the grass and the window-sill. It weighed down the black, ragged branches of the yews, and smoothed the graves in the churchyard. Soon it began to snow again, and they were shut in. He was glad, for then they were immune in a shadowy silence. There was no world, no time. End of chapter 6, part 1Chapter 6, Part 2 of The Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter 6, Part 2. The snow lasted for some days. On the Sunday, they went to church. They made a line of footprints across the garden. He left a flat snowprint of his hand on the wall as he vaulted over. They traced the snow across the churchyard. For three days they had been immune in a perfect love. There were very few people in church, and she was glad. She did not care much for church. She had never questioned any beliefs, and she was, from habit and custom, a regular attendant at morning service. But she had ceased to come with any anticipation. 
Today, however, in the strangeness of snow, after such consummation of love, she felt expectant again, and delighted. She was still in the eternal world. She used, after she went to the high school and wanted to be a lady, wanted to fulfill some mysterious ideal, always to listen to the sermon and to try to gather suggestions. That was all very well for a while. The vicar told her to be good in this way and in that. She went away feeling it was her highest aim to fulfill these injunctions. But quickly this palled. After a short time she was not very much interested in being good. Her soul was in quest of something which was not just being good and doing one's best. No, she wanted something else, something that was not her ready-made duty. Everything seemed to be merely a matter of social duty and never of herself. They talked about her soul, but somehow never managed to rouse or to implicate her soul. As yet her soul was not brought in at all. So that whilst she had an affection for Mr. Loverseed, the vicar, and a protective sort of feeling for Cassate Church, wanting always to help it and defend it, it counted very small in her life. Not but that she was conscious of some unsatisfaction. When her husband was roused by the thought of the churches, then she became hostile to the ostensible church. She hated it for not fulfilling anything in her. The church told her to be good, very well. She had no idea of contradicting what it said. The church talked about her soul, about the welfare of mankind, as if the saving of her soul lay in her performing certain acts conducive to the welfare of mankind. Well and good, it was so then. Nevertheless, as she sat in church, her face had a pathos and a poignancy. Was this what she had come to hear? How by doing this thing and by not doing that she could save her soul? She did not contradict it, but the pathos of her face gave the lie. There was something else she wanted to hear. It was something else she asked for from the church. But who was she to affirm it? And what was she doing with unsatisfied desires? She was ashamed. She ignored them and left them out of count as much as possible. Her underneath yearnings. They angered her. She wanted to be like other people, decently satisfied. He angered her more than ever. Church had an irresistible attraction for him and he paid no more attention to that part of the service which was church to her than if he had been an angel or a fabulous beast sitting there. He simply paid no heed to the sermon or to the meaning of the service. There was something thick, dark, dense, powerful about him that irritated her too deeply for her to speak of it. The church teaching in itself meant nothing to him. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us. It simply did not touch him. It might have been mere sounds, and it would have acted upon him in the same way. He did not want things to be intelligible, and he did not care about his trespasses, neither about the trespasses of his neighbor when he was in church. Leave that care for weekdays. When he was in church, he took no more notice of his daily life. It was weekday stuff. As for the welfare of mankind, he merely did not realize that there was any such thing, except on weekdays, when he was good-natured enough. In church he wanted a dark, nameless emotion, the emotion of all the great mysteries of passion. He was not interested in the thought of himself or of her. Oh, and how that irritated her! He ignored the sermon, he ignored the greatness of mankind, he did not admit the immediate importance of mankind, he did not care about himself as a human being, he did not attach any vital importance to his life in the drafting office or his life among men. That was just merely the margin to the text. The verity was his connection with Anna and his connection with the church. His real being lay in his dark emotional experience of the infinite, of the absolute, and the great mysterious illuminated capitals to the text were his feelings with the church. It exasperated her beyond measure. She could not get out of the church the satisfaction he got. The thought of her soul was intimately mixed up with the thought of her own self. Indeed, her soul and her own self were one and the same in her, whereas he seemed simply to ignore the fact of his own self, almost to refute it. He had a soul, a dark, inhuman thing, caring nothing for humanity, so she conceived it, and in the gloom and the mystery of the church his soul lived and ran free, like some strange underground thing, abstract. He was very strange to her, and in this church spirit, in conceiving himself as a soul, 
he seemed to escape and run free of her. In a way she envied at him, this dark freedom and jubilation of the soul, some strange entity in him. It fascinated her. Again she hated it, and again she despised him, wanted to destroy it in him. This snowy morning he sat with a dark bright face beside her, not aware of her, and somehow she felt he was conveying to strange secret places the love that sprang in him for her. He sat with a dark rapt, half-delighted face, looking at a little stained window. She saw the ruby-coloured glass, with the shadow heaped along the bottom from the snow outside, and the familiar yellow figure of the lamb holding the banner, a little darkened now, but in the murky interior strangely luminous, pregnant. She had always liked the little red and yellow window. The lamb, looking very silly and self-conscious, was holding up a forepaw, in the cleft of which was dangerously perched a little flag with a red cross. Very pale yellow, the lamb, with greenish shadows. Since she was a child she had liked this creature, with the same feeling she felt for the little woolly lambs on green legs that children carried home from the fair every year. She had always liked these toys, and she had the same amused childish liking for this church lamb, yet she had always been uneasy about it. She was never sure that this lamb with a flag did not want to be more than it appeared, so she half mistrusted it. There was a mixture of dislike in her attitude to it. Now by a curious gathering, knitting of his eyes, the faintest tension of ecstasy on his face, he gave her the uncomfortable feeling that he was in correspondence with the creature, the lamb in the window. A cold wonder came over her. Her soul was perplexed. There he sat, motionless, timeless, with the faint bright tension on his face. What was he doing? What connection was there between him and the lamb in the glass? Suddenly it gleamed to her dominant, this lamb with the flag. Suddenly she had a powerful mystic experience. The power of the tradition seized on her. She was transported to another world, and she hated it, resisted it. Instantly it was only a silly lamb in the glass again, and dark, violent hatred of her husband swept up in her. What was he doing, sitting there gleaming, carried away, soulful? She shifted sharply. She knocked him as she pretended to pick up her glove. She groped among his feet. He came to, rather bewildered, exposed. Anybody but her would have pitied him. She wanted to rend him. He did not know what was amiss, what he had been doing. As they sat at dinner in their cottage, he was dazed by the chill of antagonism from her. She did not know why she was so angry, but she was incensed. "'Why do you never listen to the sermon?' she asked, seething with hostility and violation. "'I do,' he said. "'You don't. You don't hear a single word.' He retired into himself to enjoy his own sensation. There was something subterranean about him, as if he had an underworld refuge. The young girl hated to be in the house with him when he was like this. After dinner he retired into the parlour, continuing in the same state of abstraction, which was a burden intolerable to her. Then he went to the bookshelf and took down books to look at that she had scarcely glanced over. He sat absorbed over a book on the illuminations in old missals, and then over a book on paintings in churches—Italian, English, French, and German. He had, when he was sixteen, discovered a Roman Catholic bookshop where he could find such things. He turned the leaves in absorption, absorbed in looking, not thinking. He was like a man whose eyes were in his chest, she said of him later. She came to look at the things with him. Half they fascinated her. She was puzzled, interested, and antagonistic. It was when she came to pictures of the Pieta that she burst out. I do think they're loathsome, she cried. What? he said, surprised, abstracted. Those bodies with slits in them, posing to be worshipped. You see, it means the sacraments, the bread, he said slowly. "'Does it?' she cried. "'Then it's worse. "'I don't want to see your chest slit, "'nor to eat your dead body, even if you offer it to me. "'Can't you see it's horrible?' "'It isn't me. It's Christ. "'What if it is? It's you, and it's horrible, "'you wallowing in your own dead body "'and thinking of eating it in the sacrament. "'You've got to take it for what it means. "'It means your human body put up to be slit and killed "'and then worshipped. What else?' They lapsed into silence. His soul grew angry and aloof. 
"'And I think that lamb in church,' she said, "'is the biggest joke in the parish.' "'She burst into a poof of ridiculing laughter. "'It might be to those that see nothing in it,' he said. "'You know it's the symbol of Christ, "'of his innocence and sacrifice. "'Whatever it means, it's a lamb,' she said, "'and I like lambs too much to treat them "'as if they had to mean something. "'As for the Christmas tree flag, no—' "'And again she poofed with mockery. "'It's because you don't know anything.' he said violently, harshly. Laugh at what you know, not at what you don't know. What don't I know? What things mean, and what does it mean? He was reluctant to answer her. He found it difficult. What does it mean? she insisted. It means the triumph of the resurrection. She hesitated, baffled. A fear came upon her. What were these things? Something dark and powerful seemed to extend before her, "'Was it wonderful, after all?' "'But no, she refused it. "'Whatever it may pretend to mean, "'what it is is a silly, absurd toy lamb "'with a Christmas tree flag ledged on its paw, "'and if it wants to mean anything else "'it must look different from that.' "'He was in a state of violent irritation against her. "'Partly he was ashamed of his love for these things. "'He hid his passion for them. "'He was ashamed of the ecstasy "'into which he could throw himself with these symbols.' and for a few moments he hated the lamb and the mystic pictures of the Eucharist with a violent, ashy hatred. His fire was put out. She had thrown cold water on it. The whole thing was distasteful to him. His mouth was full of ashes. He went out cold with corpse-like anger, leaving her alone. He hated her. He walked through the white snow under a sky of lead, and she wept again in bitter recurrence of the previous gloom, but her heart was easy, oh, much more easy. She was quite willing to make it up with him when he came home again. He was black and surly, but abated. She had broken a little of something in him. And at length he was glad to forfeit from his soul all his symbols, to have her making love to him. He loved it when she put her head on his knee, and he had not asked her to or wanted her to. He loved her when she put her arms round him and made bold love to him, and he did not make love to her. He felt a strong blood in his limbs again. And she loved the intent, far look of his eyes when they rested on her. Intent, yet far, not near, not with her. And she wanted to bring them near. She wanted his eyes to come to hers, to know her, and they would not. They remained intent and far and proud, like a hawk's, naive and inhuman as a hawk's. So she loved him and caressed him and roused him like a hawk, till he was keen and instant, but without tenderness. He came to her fierce and hard like a hawk, striking and taking her. He was no mystic any more. She was his aim and object, his prey. And she was carried off, and he was satisfied, or satiated, at last. Then immediately she began to retaliate on him. She too was a hawk. If she imitated the pathetic plover running plaintive to him, that was part of the game. When he, satisfied, moved with a proud, insolent slouch of the body and a half-contemptuous drop of the head, unaware of her, ignoring her very existence, after taking his fill of her and getting his satisfaction of her, her soul roused, its pinions became like steel, and she struck at him. When he sat on his perch, glancing sharply round with solitary pride, pride eminent and fierce, she dashed at him and threw him from his station savagely. She goaded him from his keen dignity of a male. She harassed him from his unperturbed pride, till he was mad with rage. His light brown eyes burned with fury. They saw her now like flames of anger. They flared at her and recognized her as the enemy. Very good. She was the enemy. Very good. As he prowled round her, she watched him. As he struck at her, she struck back. He was angry because she had carelessly pushed away his tools so that they got rusty. "'Don't leave them littering in my way, then,' she said. "'I shall leave them where I like,' he cried. "'Then I shall throw them where I like.' They glowered at each other, he with rage in his hands, she with her soul fierce with victory. They were very well matched. They would fight it out. She turned to her sewing. Immediately the tea-things were cleared away— she fetched out the stuff, and his soul rose in rage. He hated beyond measure to hear the shriek of calico as she tore the web sharply, as if with pleasure. 
and the run of the sewing machine gathered a frenzy in him at last. "'Aren't you going to stop that row?' he shouted. "'Can't you do it in the daytime?' She looked up sharply, hostile, from her work. "'No, I can't do it in the daytime. I have other things to do. Besides, I like sewing, and you're not going to stop me doing it.' Whereupon she turned back to her arranging, fixing, stitching. His nerves jumped with anger as the sewing machine started and stuttered and buzzed. But she was enjoying herself. She was triumphant and happy as the darting needle danced ecstatically down a hem, drawing the stuff along under its vivid stabbing irresistibly. She made the machine hum. She stopped it imperiously. Her fingers were deft and swift and mistress. If he sat behind her, stiff with impotent rage, it only made a trembling vividness come into her energy. On she worked. At last he went to bed in a rage and lay stiff, away from her, and she turned her back on him and in the morning they did not speak, except in mere cold civilities. And when he came home at night, his heart relenting and growing hot for love of her, when he was just ready to feel he had been wrong, and when he was expecting her to feel the same, there she sat at the sewing machine, the whole house was covered with clipped calico, the kettle was not even on the fire. She started up, affecting concern. "'Is it so late?' she cried. But his face had gone stiff with rage. He walked through to the parlour, then he walked back and out of the house again. Her heart sank. Very swiftly she began to make his tea. He went black-hearted down the road to Ilkston. When he was in this state he never thought. A bolt shot across the doors of his mind and shut him in, a prisoner. He went back to Ilkston and drank a glass of beer. What was he going to do? He did not want to see anybody. He would go to Nottingham, to his own town. He went to the station and took a train. When he got to Nottingham, still he had nowhere to go. However, it was more agreeable to walk familiar streets. He paced them with a mad restlessness, as if he were running amuck. Then he turned to a bookshop and found a book on Bamberg Cathedral. Here was a discovery. Here was something for him. He went into a quiet restaurant to look at his treasure. He lit up with thrills of bliss as he turned from picture to picture. He had found something at last in these carvings. His soul had great satisfaction. Had he not come out to seek, and had he not found? He was in a passion of fulfillment. These were the finest carvings, statues he had ever seen. The book lay in his hands like a doorway. The world around was only an enclosure, a room, but he was going away. He lingered over the lovely statues of women, a marvellous finely wrought universe crystallized out around him as he looked again at the crowns, the twining hair, the woman faces. He liked all the better the unintelligible text of the German. He preferred things he could not understand with the mind. He loved the undiscovered and the undiscoverable. He pored over the pictures intensely, and these were wooden statues. Holes, he believed that, meant wood wooden statues so shapen to his soul. He was a million times gladdened. How undiscovered the world was, how it revealed itself to his soul. What a fine, exciting thing his life was at his hand. Did not Bamberg Cathedral make the world his own? He celebrated his triumphant strength and life and verity, and embraced the vast riches he was inheriting. But it was about time to go home. He had better catch a train. All the time there was a steady bruise at the bottom of his soul, but so steady as to be forgettable. He caught a train for Ilkston. It was ten o'clock as he was mounting the hill to Cossete, carrying his limp book on Bamberg Cathedral. He had not yet thought of Anna, not definitely. The dark finger pressing a bruise controlled him thoughtlessly. Anna had started guiltily when he left the house. She had hastened preparing the tea, hoping he would come back. She had made some toast and got all ready. Then he didn't come. She cried with vexation and disappointment. Why had he gone? Why couldn't he come back now? Why was it such a battle between them? She loved him. She did love him. Why couldn't he be kinder to her, nicer to her? She waited in distress. Then her mood grew harder. He passed out of her thoughts. She had considered indignantly what right he had to interfere with her sewing. She had indignantly refuted his right to interfere with her at all. She was not to be interfered with. Was she not herself and he the outsider? Yet a quiver of fear went through her. 
if he should leave her she sat conjuring fears and sufferings till she wept with very self-pity she did not know what she would do if he left her or if he turned against her the thought of it chilled her made her desolate and hard and against him the stranger the outsider the being who wanted to arrogate authority she remained steadily fortified was she not herself how could one who was not of her own kind presume with authority she knew she was immutable unchangeable she was not afraid for her own being she was only afraid of all that was not herself it pressed round her it came to her and took part in her in form of her man this vast resounding alien world which was not herself and he had so many weapons he might strike from so many sides when he came in at the door his heart was blazed with pity and tenderness she looked so lost and forlorn and young she glanced up afraid and she was surprised to see him shining faced clear and beautiful in his movements as if he were clarified and a startled pang of fear and shame of herself went through her they waited for each other to speak do you want to eat anything she said i'll get it myself he answered not wanting her to serve him but she brought out food and it pleased him she did it for him he was again a bright lord i went to nottingham he said mildly to your mother she asked in a flash of contempt no i didn't go home who did you go to see i went to see nobody then why did you go to nottingham i went because i wanted to go he was getting angry that she again rebuffed him when he was so clear and shining and who did you see i saw nobody nobody no who should i see you saw nobody you knew no i didn't he replied irritably she believed him and her mood became cold i bought a book he said handing her the propitiatory volume she idly looked at the pictures beautiful the pure women with their clear dropping gowns her heart became colder what did they mean to him he sat and waited for her she bent over the book aren't they nice he said his voice roused and glad her blood flushed but she did not lift her head yes she said in spite of herself she was compelled by him he was strange attractive exerting some power over her he came over to her and touched her delicately her heart beat with wild passion wild raging passion but she resisted as yet it was always the unknown always the unknown and she clung fiercely to her known self but the rising flood carried her away they loved each other to transport again passionately and fully isn't it more wonderful than ever she asked him radiant like a newly opened flower with tears like dew he held her closer he was strange and abstracted it is always more wonderful she asseverated in a glad child's voice remembering her fear and not quite cleared of it yet so it went on continually the recurrence of love and conflict between them one day it seemed as if everything was shattered all life spoiled ruined desolate and laid waste the next day it was all marvellous again just marvellous one day she thought she would go mad from his very presence the sound of his drinking was detestable to her the next day she loved and rejoiced in the way he crossed the floor he was sun moon and stars in one she fretted however at last over the lack of stability when the perfect hours came back her heart did not forget that they would pass away again she was uneasy the surety the surety the inner surety the confidence and the abidingness of love that was what she wanted and that she did not get she knew also that he had not got it nevertheless it was a marvellous world she was for the most part lost in the marvellousness of it even her great woes were marvellous to her she could be very happy and she wanted to be happy she resented it when he made her unhappy then she could kill him cast him out many days she waited for the hour when he would be gone to work then the flow of her life which he seemed to dam up was let loose and she was free she was free she was full of delight everything delighted her she took up the rug and went to shake it in the garden patches of snow were on the fields the air was light she heard the ducks shouting on the pond 
she saw them charge and sail across the water as if they were setting off on an invasion of the world. She watched the rough horses, one of which was clipped smooth on the belly, so that he wore a jacket and long stockings of brown fur, stand kissing each other in the wintry morning by the churchyard wall. Everything delighted her now he was gone, the insulator, the obstruction removed. The world was all hers in connection with her. She was joyfully active. Nothing pleased her more than to hang out the washing in a high wind that came full butt over the round of the hill, tearing the wet garments out of her hands, making flap, flap, flap of the waving stuff. She laughed and struggled and grew angry, but she loved her solitary days. Then he came home at night, and she knitted her brows because of some endless contest between them. As he stood in the doorway, her heart changed. It steeled itself. The laughter and zest of the day disappeared from her. She was stiffened. They fought an unknown battle, unconsciously. Still, they were in love with each other. The passion was there, but the passion was consumed in a battle, and the deep, fierce, unnamed battle went on. Everything glowed intensely about them. The world had put off its clothes and was awful with new primal nakedness. Sunday came, when the strange spell was cast over her by him. Half she loved it. She was becoming more like him. All the weekdays there was a glint of sky and fields. The little church seemed to babble away to the cottages the morning through. But on Sundays, when he stayed at home, a deeply colored intense gloom seemed to gather on the face of the earth. The church seemed to fill itself with shadow, to become big, a universe to her. There was a burning of blue and ruby, a sound of worship about her, and when the doors were opened and she came out into the world, it was a world new created. She stepped into the resurrection of the world, her heart beating to the memory of the darkness and the passion. If, as very often, they went to the marsh for tea on Sundays, then she regained another, lighter world that had never known the gloom and the stained glass and the ecstasy of chanting. Her husband was obliterated. She was with her father again, who was so fresh and free in all daylight. Her husband, with his intensity and his darkness, was obliterated. She left him. She forgot him. She accepted her father. Yet, as she went home again with the young man, she put her hand on his arm tentatively, a little bit ashamed. Her hand pleaded that he would not hold it against her, her recusancy, but he was obscured. He seemed to become blind, as if he were not there with her. Then she was afraid. She wanted him. When he was oblivious of her, she almost went mad with fear, for she had become so vulnerable, so exposed. She was in touch so intimately. All things about her had become intimate. She had known them near and lovely, like presences hovering upon her. What if they should all go hard and separate again, standing back from her, terrible and distinct, and she, having known them, should be at their mercy? This frightened her. Always her husband was to her the unknown to which she was delivered up. She was a flower that has been tempted forth into blossom, and has no retreat. He had her nakedness in his power, and who was he? What was he? A blind thing, a dark force without knowledge. She wanted to preserve herself. Then she gathered him to herself again and was satisfied for a moment. But as time went on, she began to realize more and more that he did not alter, that he was something dark, alien to herself. She had thought him just the bright reflex of herself. As the weeks and months went by, she realized that he was a dark opposite to her, that they were opposites, not compliments. He did not alter. He remained separately himself, and he seemed to expect her to be part of himself, the extension of his will. She felt him trying to gain power over her without knowing her. What did he want? Was he going to bully her? What did she want herself? She answered herself that she wanted to be happy, to be natural, like the sunlight in the busy daytime. And at the bottom of her soul she felt he wanted her to be dark, unnatural. Sometimes, when he seemed like the darkness covering and smothering her, she revolted almost in horror and struck at him. She struck at him and made him bleed, and he became wicked. Because she dreaded him and held him in horror, he became wicked. He wanted to destroy, and then the fight between them was cruel. She began to tremble. He wanted to impose himself on her, and he began to shudder. 
She wanted to desert him, to leave him a prey to the open, with the unclean dogs of the darkness setting on to devour him. He must beat her and make her stay with him, whereas she fought to keep herself free of him. They went their ways now, shadowed and stained with blood, feeling the world far off, unable to give help. Till she began to get tired. After a certain point she became impassive, detached utterly from him. He was always ready to burst out murderously against her. Her soul got up and left him. She went her way. Nevertheless, in her apparent blitheness that made his soul black with opposition, she trembled as if she bled. And ever and again the pure love came in sunbeams between them, when she was like a flower in the sun to him, so beautiful, so shining, so intensely dear that he could scarcely bear it. Then, as if his soul had six wings of bliss, he stood absorbed in praise, feeling the radiance from the Almighty beat through him like a pulse, as he stood in the upright flame of praise, transmitting the pulse of creation. And ever and again he appeared to her as the dread flame of power. Sometimes, when he stood in the doorway, his face lit up, he seemed like an annunciation to her. Her heart beat fast, and she watched him, suspended. He had a dark, burning being that she dreaded and resisted. She was subject to him as to the angel of the presence. She waited upon him and heard his will, and she trembled in his service. Then all this passed away. Then he loved her for her childishness and for her strangeness to him, for the wonder of her soul which was different from his soul, and which made him genuine when he would be false. And she loved him for the way he sat loosely in a chair, or for the way he came through a door with his face open and eager. She loved his ringing, eager voice and the touch of the unknown about him, his absolute simplicity. End of chapter 6, part 2「6 Part 3 of the Rainbow」This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence Chapter 6 Part 3 Yet neither of them was quite satisfied. He felt, somewhere, that she did not respect him. She only respected him as far as he was related to herself. For what he was beyond her she had no care. She did not care for what he represented in himself. It is true he did not know himself what he represented, but whatever it was she did not really honor it. She did no service to his work as a lace designer, nor to himself as breadwinner. Because he went down to the office and worked every day that entitled him to no respect or regard from her, he knew. Rather she despised him for it, and he almost loved her for this, though at first it maddened him like an insult. What was much deeper, she soon came to combat his deepest feelings. What he thought about life and about society and mankind did not matter very much to her. He was right enough to be insignificant. This was again galling to him. She would judge beyond him on these things. But at length he came to accept her judgments discovering them as if they were his own. It was not here the deep trouble lay. The deep root of his enmity lay in the fact that she jeered at his soul. He was inarticulate and stupid in thought. But to some things he clung passionately. He loved the church. If she tried to get out of him what he believed, then they were both soon in a white rage. Did he believe the water turned to wine at Cana? She would drive him to the thing as a historical fact. So much rain-water, look at it. Can it become grape-juice, wine? For an instant he saw with the clear eyes of the mind, and said no. His clear mind, answering her for a moment, rejected the idea. And immediately his whole soul was crying in a mad, inchoate hatred against this violation of himself. It was true for him. His mind was extinguished again at once. His blood was up. In his blood and bones he wanted the scene, the wedding, the water brought forward from the firkins as red wine, and Christ saying to his mother, Woman, what have I to do with thee? 
Mine hour is not yet come. And then, his mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Brangwen loved it. With his bones and blood he loved it. He could not let it go. Yet she forced him to let it go. She hated his blind attachments. Water, natural water, could it suddenly and unnaturally turn into wine, depart from its being, and at haphazard take on another being? Ah, no, he knew it was wrong. She became again the palpitating hostile child, hateful, putting things to destruction. He became mute and dead. His own being gave him the lie. He knew it was so. Wine was wine, water was water, forever. The water had not become wine. The miracle was not a real fact. She seemed to be destroying him. He went out, dark and destroyed, his soul running its blood, and he tasted of death, because his life was formed in these unquestioned concepts. She, desolate again as she had been when she was a child, went away and sobbed. She did not care. She did not care whether the water had turned to wine or not. Let him believe it if he wanted to. But she knew she had won, and an ashy desolation came over her. They were ashenly miserable for some time. Then the life began to come back. He was nothing if not dogged. He thought again of the chapter of St. John. There was a great biting pang. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. The best wine. The young man's heart responded in a craving, in a triumph, although the knowledge that it was not true in fact bit at him like a weasel in his heart. Which was stronger, the pain of the denial or the desire for affirmation? He was stubborn in spirit and abode by his desire, but he would not any more affirm the miracles as true. Very well, it was not true. The water had not turned into wine. The water had not turned into wine, but for all that he would live in his soul as if the water had turned into wine. For truth of fact it had not, but for his soul it had. Whether it turned into wine or whether it didn't, he said, it doesn't bother me, I take it for what it is. And what is it? she asked, quickly, hopefully. It's the Bible, he said. That answer enraged her, and she despised him. She did not actively question the Bible herself, but he drove her to contempt. And yet he did not care about the Bible, the written letter. Although he could not satisfy her, yet she knew of herself that he had something real. He was not a dogmatist. He did not believe, in fact, that the water turned into wine. He did not want to make a fact out of it. Indeed, his attitude was without criticism. It was purely individual. He took that which was of value to him from the written word he added to his spirit. His mind he let sleep. And she was bitter against him that he let his mind sleep. That which was human, belonged to mankind, he would not exert. He cared only for himself. He was no Christian. Above all, Christ had asserted the brotherhood of man. She, almost against herself, clung to the worship of the human knowledge. Man must die in the body, but in his knowledge he was immortal. Such, somewhere, was her belief, quite obscure and unformulated. She believed in the omnipotence of the human mind. He, on the other hand, blind as a subterranean thing, just ignored the human mind, and ran after his own dark-souled desires, following his own tunneling nose. She felt often she must suffocate, and she fought him off. Then he, knowing he was blind, fought madly back again, frantic in sensual fear. He did foolish things. He asserted himself on his rights. He arrogated the old position of master of the house. "'You've a right to do as I want,' he cried. "'Fool!' she answered. "'Fool!' "'I'll let you know who's master,' he cried. "'Fool!' she answered. "'Fool!' I've known my own father, who could put a dozen of you in his pipe and push them down with his finger end. Don't I know what a fool you are? He knew himself what a fool he was, and was flayed by the knowledge. Yet he went on trying to steer the ship of their dual life. He asserted his position as the captain of the ship, and captain and ship bored her. He wanted to loom important as master of one of the innumerable domestic craft that make up the great fleet of society, 
It seemed to her a ridiculous armada of tubs jostling in futility. She felt no belief in it. She jeered at him as master of the house, master of their dual life, and he was black with shame and rage. He knew with shame how her father had been a man without arrogating any authority. He had gone on the wrong tack, and he felt it hard to give up the expedition. There was great surging and shame. Then he yielded. He had given up the master of the house idea. There was something he wanted, nevertheless— some form of mastery. Ever and anon, after his collapses into the petty and the shameful, he rose up again, and, stubborn in spirit, strong in his power to start afresh, set out once more in his male pride of being to fulfill the hidden passion of his spirit. It began well, but it ended always in war between them, till they were both driven almost to madness. He said she did not respect him. She laughed in hollow scorn of this. For her it was enough that she loved him. "'Respect what?' she asked. But he always answered the wrong thing, and though she cudgelled her brains, she could not come at it. "'Why don't you go on with your wood-carving?' she said. "'Why don't you finish your Adam and Eve?' But she did not care for the Adam and Eve, and he never put another stroke to it. She jeered at the Eve, saying, "'She's like a little marionette. Why is she so small? You've made Adam as big as God, and Eve like a doll.' "'It is impudence to say that woman was made out of man's body,' she continued. "'When every man is born of woman, what impudence men have! What arrogance!' In a rage one day, after trying to work on the board and failing, so that his belly was a flame of nausea, he chopped up the whole panel and put it on the fire. She did not know. He went about for some days very quiet and subdued after it. "'Where is the Adam and Eve board?' she asked him. "'Burnt?' She looked at him. "'But you're carving!' "'I burned it.' "'When?' She did not believe him. "'On Friday night. "'When I was at the marsh?' "'Yes.' She said no more. Then when he had gone to work she wept for a whole day, and was much chastened in spirit, so that a new fragile flame of love came out of the ashes of this last pain. Directly it occurred to her that she was with child— there was a great trembling of wonder and anticipation through her soul. She wanted a child, not that she loved babies so much, though she was touched by all young things, but she wanted to bear children, and a certain hunger in her heart wanted to unite her husband with herself, in a child. She wanted a son. She felt a son would be everything. She wanted to tell her husband, but it was such a trembling, intimate thing to tell him, and he was at this time hard and unresponsive so that she went away and wept. It was such a waste of a beautiful opportunity, such a frost that nipped in the bud one of the beautiful moments of her life. She went about heavy and tremulous with her secret, wanting to touch him, almost delicately, and see his face, dark and sensitive, attend to her news. She waited and waited for him to become gentle and still towards her, but he was always harsh, and he bullied her so that the bud shriveled from her confidence. She was chilled. She went down to the marsh. "'Well,' said her father, looking at her and seeing her at the first glance, "'what's amiss with you now?' The tears came at the touch of his careful love. "'Nothing,' she said. "'Can't you hit it off, you two? he said. "'He's so obstinate,' she quivered, but her soul was obdurate itself." "'Eh, and I know another who's all that,' said her father. She was silent. "'You don't want to make yourselves miserable,' said her father. "'All about nought. "'He isn't miserable,' she said. "'I'll back my life. "'If you can do nought else, you can make him as miserable as a dog. "'You'd be a dab hand at that, my lass.' "'I do nothing to make him miserable,' she retorted. "'Oh, no, oh, no, a packet of butterscotch you are.' She laughed a little. "'You mustn't think I want him to be miserable,' she cried. "'I don't.' "'We quite readily believe it,' retorted Brangwen. "'Neither do you intend him to be hopping for joy like a fish in a pond.' This made her think. She was rather surprised to find that she did not intend her husband to be hopping for joy like a fish in a pond. Her mother came, and they all sat down to tea, talking casually. 
"'Remember, child,' said her mother, "'that everything is not waiting for your hand just to take or leave. "'You mustn't expect it. "'Between two people the love itself is the important thing, "'and that is neither you nor him. "'It is a third thing you must create. "'You mustn't expect it to be just your way.' "'Ha! Nor do I. "'If I did, I should soon find my mistake out. "'If I put my hand out to take anything, "'my hand is very soon bitten, I can tell you. "'Then you must mind where you put your hand,' said her father. "'Anna was rather indignant "'that they took the tragedy of her young married life "'with such equanimity. "'You love the man right enough,' said her father, "'wrinkling his forehead in distress. "'That's all as counts.' "'I do love him. More shame to him,' she cried. "'I want to tell him. I've been waiting for four days now to tell him.' Her face began to quiver. The tears came. Her parents watched her in silence. She did not go on. "'Tell him what?' said her father. "'That we're going to have an infant.' She sobbed. "'And he's never, never let me. Not once. Every time I've come to him he's been horrid to me, and I wanted to tell him. I did, and he won't let me. He's cruel to me.' She sobbed as if her heart would break. Her mother went and comforted her, put her arms round her, and held her close. Her father sat with a queer wrinkled brow and was rather paler than usual. His heart went tense with hatred of his son-in-law, so that when the tale was sobbed out and comfort administered and tea sipped and something like calm restored to the little circle, the thought of Will Brangwen's entry was not pleasantly entertained. Tilly was set to watch out for him as he passed by on his way home. The little party at table heard the woman servant's shrill call. "'You've got to come in, Will. Anna's here.' After a few moments the youth entered. "'Are you stopping?' he asked in his hard, harsh voice. He seemed like a blade of destruction standing there. She quivered to tears. "'Sit you down,' said Tom Brangwen, "'and take a bit off your length.' Will Brangwen sat down. He felt something strange in the atmosphere. He was dark-browed, but his eyes had the keen, intent, sharp look, as if he could only see in the distance, which was a beauty in him, and which made Anna so angry. "'Why does he always deny me?' she said to herself. "'Why is it nothing to him what I am?' And Tom Brangwen, blue-eyed and warm, sat in opposition to the youth. "'How long are you stopping?' the young husband asked his wife. "'Not very long,' she said. "'Get your tea, lad,' said Tom Brangwen. "'Are you itching to be off the moment you enter?' They talked of trivial things. Through the open door the level rays of sunset poured in, shining on the floor. A grey hen appeared stepping swiftly in the doorway, pecking, and the light through her comb and her wattles made an oriflamme tossed here and there as she went. Her grey body was like a ghost.' Anna watching through scraps of bread, and she felt the child flame within her. She seemed to remember again forgotten, burning, far-off things. "'Where was I born, mother?' she asked. "'In London. "'And was my father—' She spoke of him as if he were merely a strange name. She could never connect herself with him. "'Was he dark?' "'He had dark brown hair and dark eyes and a fresh colouring. "'He went bald, rather bald, when he was quite young.' "'replied her mother, also as if telling a tale which was just old imagination. "'Was he good-looking?' "'Yes, he was very good-looking, rather small. "'I have never seen an Englishman who looked like him. "'Why?' "'He was—' "'The mother made a quick running movement with her hands. "'His figure was alive and changing. It was never fixed. "'He was not in the least steady, like a running stream.' It flashed over the youth. Anna, too, was like a running stream. Instantly he was in love with her again. Tom Brangwen was frightened. His heart always filled with fear, fear of the unknown. When he heard his women speak of their bygone men as of strangers they had known in passing and had taken leave of again. In the room there came a silence and a singleness over all their hearts. They were separate people with separate destinies. Why should they seek each to lay violent hands of claim on the other? The young people went home as a sharp little moon was setting in the dusk of spring. Tufts of trees hovered in the upper air. The little church pricked up shadowily at the top of the hill. The earth was a dark blue shadow. 
she put her hand lightly on his arm out of her far distance and out of the distance he felt her touch him they walked on hand in hand along opposite horizons touching across the dusk there was a sound of thrushes calling in the dark blue twilight i think we are going to have an infant bill she said from far off he trembled and his fingers tightened on hers why he asked his heart beating you don't know i do she said they continued without saying any more walking along opposite horizons hand in hand across the intervening space two separate people and he trembled as if a wind blew on to him in strong gusts out of the unseen he was afraid he was afraid to know he was alone for she seemed fulfilled and separate and sufficient in her half of the world he could not bear to know that he was cut off why could he not be always one with her it was he who had given her the child why could she not be with him one with him why must he be set in this separateness why could she not be with him close close as one with him she must be one with him he held her fingers tightly in his own she did not know what he was thinking the blaze of light on her heart was too beautiful and dazzling from the conception in her womb she walked glorified and the sound of the thrushes of the trains in the valley of the far-off faint noises of the town were her magnificat but he was struggling in silence it seemed as though there were before him a solid wall of darkness that impeded him and suffocated him and made him mad he wanted her to come to him to complete him to stand before him so that his eyes did not should not meet the naked darkness nothing mattered to him but that she should come and complete him for he was ridden by the awful sense of his own limitation it was as if he ended uncompleted as yet uncreated on the darkness and he wanted her to come and liberate him into the whole but she was complete in herself and he was ashamed of his need his helpless need of her his need and his shame of need weighed on him like a madness yet still he was quiet and gentle in reverence of her conception and because she was with child by him and she was happy in showers of sunshine she loved her husband as a presence as a grateful condition but for the moment her need was fulfilled and now she wanted only to hold her husband by the hand in sheer happiness without taking thought only being glad he had various folios of reproductions and among them a cheap print from fra angelico's entry of the blessed into paradise this filled anna with bliss the beautiful innocent way in which the blessed held each other by the hand as they moved towards the radiance the real real angelic melody made her weep with happiness the floweriness the beams of light the linking of hands was almost too much for her too innocent day after day came shining through the door of paradise day after day she entered into the brightness the child in her shone till she herself was a beam of sunshine and how lovely was the sunshine that loitered and wandered out of doors where the catkins on the big hazel bushes at the end of the garden hung in their shaken floating aureola where little fumes like fire burst out from the black yew trees as a bird settled clinging to the branches one day bluebells were along the hedge bottoms then cowslips twinkled like manna golden and evanescent on the meadows she was full of a rich drowsiness and loneliness how happy she was how gorgeous it was to live to have known herself her husband the passion of love and begetting and to know that all this lived and waited and burned on around her a terrible purifying fire through which she had passed for once to come to this piece of golden radiance when she was with child and innocent and in love with her husband and with all the many angels hand in hand she lifted her throat to the breeze that came across the fields and she felt it handling her like sisters fondling her she drank it in perfume of cowslips and of apple blossoms and in all the happiness a black shadow shy wild a beast of prey roamed and vanished from sight and like strands of gossamer blown across her eyes there was a dread for her 
She was afraid when he came home at night. As yet her fear never spoke. The shadow never rushed upon her. He was gentle, humble. He kept himself withheld. His hands were delicate upon her, and she loved them. But there ran through her the thrill, crisp as pain, for she felt the darkness and other worlds still in his soft sheathed hands. But the summer drifted in with the silence of a miracle. She was almost always alone. All the while went on the long, lovely drowsiness. The maiden blush roses in the garden were all shed, washed away in a pouring rain. Summer drifted into autumn, and the long, vague, golden days began to close. Crimson clouds fumed about the west, and as night came on, all the sky was fuming and steaming, and the moon, far above the swiftness of vapors, was white, bleared. The night was uneasy. Suddenly the moon would appear at a clear window in the sky, looking down from far above like a captive. And Anna did not sleep. There was a strange, dark tension about her husband. She became aware that he was trying to force his will upon her. Something, there was something he wanted, as he lay there dark and tense, and her soul sighed in weariness. Everything was so vague and lovely, and he wanted to wake her up to the hard, hostile reality. She drew back in resistance. Still, he said nothing, but she felt his power persisting on her, till she became aware of the strain. She cried out against the exhaustion. He was forcing her. He was forcing her, and she wanted so much the joy and the vagueness and the innocence of her pregnancy. She did not want his bitter, corrosive love. She did not want it poured into her to burn her. Why must she have it? Why, oh, why was he not content, contained? She sat many hours by the window in those days when he drove her most with the black constraint of his will, and she watched the rain falling on the yew trees. She was not sad, only wistful, blanched. The child under her heart was a perpetual warmth, and she was sure. The pressure was only upon her from the outside. Her soul had no stripes. Yet in her heart itself was always the same strain, tense, anxious. She was not safe. She was always exposed. She was always attacked. There was a yearning in her for a fullness of peace and blessedness, what a heavy yearning it was, so heavy. She knew vaguely that all the time he was not satisfied, all the time he was trying to force something from her. Ah, how she wished she could succeed with him in her own way. He was there, so inevitable. She lived in him also, and how she wanted to be at peace with him, at peace. She loved him. She would give him love, pure love. With a strange, rapt look in her face, she awaited his homecoming that night. Then, when he came, she rose with her hands full of love, as of flowers, radiant, innocent. A dark spasm crossed his face. As she watched, her face shining and flower-like with innocent love, his face grew dark and tense. The cruelty gathered in his brows. His eyes turned aside. She saw the whites of his eyes as he looked aside from her. She waited, touching him with her hands. But from his body through her hands came the bitter corrosive shock of his passion upon her, destroying her in blossom. She shrank. She rose from her knees and went away from him to preserve herself, and it was great pain to her. To him also it was agony. He saw the glistening flower-like love in her face, and his heart was black because he did not want it. Not this, not this. He did not want flowery innocence. He was unsatisfied. The rage and storm of unsatisfaction tormented him ceaselessly. Why had she not satisfied him? He had satisfied her. She was satisfied, at peace, innocent round the doors of her own paradise. And he was unsatisfied, unfulfilled. He raged in torment, wanting, wanting. It was for her to satisfy him, then let her do it. Let her not come with flowery handfuls of innocent love. He would throw these aside and trample the flowers to nothing. He would destroy her flowery, innocent bliss. Was he not entitled to satisfaction from her, and was not his heart all raging desire, his soul a black torment of unfulfillment? Let it be fulfilled in him, then, as it was fulfilled in her. He had given her her fulfillment. 
Let her rise up and do her part. He was cruel to her, but all the time he was ashamed, and being ashamed he was more cruel, for he was ashamed that he could not come to fulfillment without her, and he could not, and she would not heed him. He was shackled and in darkness of torment. She beseeched him to work again, to do his wood carving, but his soul was too black. He had destroyed his panel of Adam and Eve. He could not begin again, least of all now, whilst he was in this condition. For her there was no final release, since he could not be liberated from himself. Strange and amorphous, she must go yearning on through the trouble, like a warm glowing cloud blown in the middle of a storm. She felt so rich in her warm vagueness that her soul cried out on him, because he harried her and wanted to destroy her. She had her moments of exaltation still, rebirths of old exaltations. As she sat by her bedroom window, watching the steady rain, her spirit was somewhere far off. She sat in pride and curious pleasure. When there was no one to exult with, and the unsatisfied soul must dance and play, then one danced before the unknown. Suddenly she realized that this was what she wanted to do. Big with child as she was, she danced there in the bedroom by herself, lifting her hands and her body to the unseen, to the unseen creator who had chosen her, to whom she belonged. She would not have had any one know. She danced in secret, and her soul rose in bliss. She danced in secret before the creator. She took off her clothes and danced in the pride of her bigness. It surprised her when it was over. She was shrinking and afraid. To what was she now exposed? She half wanted to tell her husband, yet she shrank from him. All the time she ran on by herself. She liked the story of David, who danced before the Lord, and uncovered himself exultingly. Why should he uncover himself to Michael, a common woman? He uncovered himself to the Lord. Thou comest to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Her heart rang to the words. She walked in her pride, and her battle was her own Lord's. Her husband was delivered over. End of chapter 6, part 3「Chapter Six, Part Four In these days she was oblivious of him. Who was he to come against her? No, he was not even the Philistine, the giant. He was like Saul, proclaiming his own kingship. She laughed in her heart. Who was he, proclaiming his kingship? She laughed in her heart with pride. And she had to dance in exultation beyond him, because he was in the house. She had to dance before her creator in exemption from the man. On a Saturday afternoon, when she had a fire in the bedroom, again she took off her things and danced, lifting her knees and her hands in a slow, rhythmic exulting, he was in the house, so her pride was fiercer. She would dance his nullification. She would dance to her unseen Lord. She was exalted over him before the Lord. She heard him coming up the stairs, and she flinched. She stood with the firelight on her ankles and feet, naked in the shadowy late afternoon, fastening up her hair. He was startled. He stood in the doorway, his brows black and lowering. "'What are you doing?' he said gratingly. "'You'll catch a cold.' And she lifted her hands and danced again to annul him. The light glanced on her knees as she made her slow, fine movements down the far side of the room, across the firelight. He stood away near the door in blackness of shadow, watching, transfixed, and with slow, heavy movements she swayed backwards and forwards like a full ear of corn, pale in the dusky afternoon, threading before the firelight, dancing his non-existence, dancing herself to the Lord, to exultation. 
He watched, and his soul burned in him. He turned aside. He could not look. It hurt his eyes. Her fine limbs lifted and lifted. Her hair was sticking out all fierce, and her belly, big, strange, terrifying, uplifted to the Lord. Her face was rapt and beautiful. She danced, exulting before her Lord, and knew no man. It hurt him as he watched, as if he were at the stake. He felt he was being burned alive. The strangeness, the power of her in her dancing, consumed him. He was burned. He could not grasp. He could not understand. He waited, obliterated. Then his eyes became blind to her. He saw her no more. And through the unseeing veil between them he called to her in his jarring voice, "'What are you doing that for?' "'Go away,' she said. "'Let me dance by myself.' "'That isn't dancing,' he said harshly. "'What do you want to do that for?' "'I don't do it for you,' she said. "'You go away.' Her strange lifted belly, big with his child. Had he no right to be there? He felt his presence a violation. Yet he had his right to be there. He went and sat on the bed. She stopped dancing and confronted him, again lifting her slim arms and twisting at her hair. Her nakedness hurt her, opposed to him. "'I can do as I like in my bedroom,' she cried. "'Why do you interfere with me?' And she slipped on a dressing-gown and crouched before the fire. He was more at ease now she was covered up. The vision of her tormented him all the days of his life as she had been then, a strange, exalted thing having no relation to himself. After this day the door seemed to shut on his mind. His brow shut and became impervious. His eyes ceased to see. His hands were suspended. Within himself his will was coiled like a beast, hidden under the darkness, but always potent, working. At first she went on blithely enough with him shut down beside her, but then his spell began to take hold of her. The dark, seething potency of him, the power of a creature that lies hidden and exerts its will to the destruction of the free-running creature, as the tiger lying in the darkness of the leaves steadily enforces the fall and death of the light creatures that drink by the waterside in the morning, gradually began to take effect on her. Though he lay there in his darkness and did not move, yet she knew he lay waiting for her. She felt his will fastening on her and pulling her down, even whilst he was silent and obscure. She found that in all her outgoings and her incomings he prevented her. Gradually she realized that she was being borne down by him, borne down by the clinging heavy weight of him, that he was pulling her down as a leopard clings to a wild cow and exhausts her and pulls her down. Gradually she realized that her life, her freedom, was sinking under the silent grip of his physical will. He wanted her in his power. He wanted to devour her at leisure, to have her. At length she realized that her sleep was a long ache and a weariness and exhaustion, because of his will fastened upon her as he lay there beside her during the night. She realized it all, and there came a momentous pause, a pause in her swift running, a moment's suspension in her life when she was lost. Then she turned fiercely on him and fought him. He was not to do this to her. It was monstrous. What horrible hold did he want to have over her body? Why did he want to drag her down and kill her spirit? Why did he want to deny her spirit? Why did he deny her spirituality, hold her for a body only? And was he to claim her carcass? Some vast, hideous darkness he seemed to represent to her. "'What do you do to me?' she cried. "'What beastly thing do you do to me? "'You put a horrible pressure on my head. "'You don't let me sleep. "'You don't let me live. "'Every moment of your life you are doing something to me, "'something horrible that destroys me. "'There is something horrible in you, "'something dark and beastly in your will. "'What do you want of me? "'What do you want to do to me?' "'All the blood in his body went black and powerful and corrosive "'as he heard her. "'Black and blind with hatred of her he was.' He was in a very black hell and could not escape. He hated her for what she said. Did he not give her everything? Was she not everything to him? And the shame was a bitter fire in him that she was everything to him, that he had nothing but her, and then that she should taunt him with it, that he could not escape. The fire went black in his veins, for try as he might he could not escape. 
She was everything to him. She was his life and his derivation. He depended on her. If she were taken away, he would collapse as a house from which the central pillar is removed. And she hated him because he depended on her so utterly. He was horrible to her. She wanted to thrust him off, to set him apart. It was horrible that he should cleave to her so close, so close like a leopard that had leapt on her and fastened. He went on from day to day in a blackness of rage and shame and frustration. How he tortured himself to be able to get away from her, but he could not. She was as the rock on which he stood, with deep heaving water all round, and he was unable to swim. He must take his stand on her, he must depend on her. What had he in life save her? Nothing. The rest was a great heaving flood, the terror of the night of heaving, overwhelming flood, which was his vision of life without her, was too much for him. He clung to her fiercely and abjectly. And she beat him off. She beat him off. Where could he turn, like a swimmer in a dark sea, beaten off from his hold? Whither could he turn? He wanted to leave her. He wanted to be able to leave her. For his soul's sake, for his manhood's sake, he must be able to leave her. But for what? She was the ark, and the rest of the world was flood. The only tangible, secure thing was the woman. He could leave her only for another woman, and where was the other woman, and who was the other woman? Besides, he would be just in the same state. Another woman would be woman, the case would be the same. Why was she the all, the everything? Why must he live only through her? Why must he sink if he were detached from her? Why must he cleave to her in a frenzy as for his very life? The only other way to leave her was to die. The only straight way to leave her was to die. His dark raging soul knew that, but he had no desire for death. Why could he not leave her? Why could he not throw himself into the hidden water to live or die as might be? He could not. He could not. But supposing he went away, right away, and found work, and had a lodging again, he could be again as he had been before. But he knew he could not. A woman, he must have a woman, and having a woman he must be free of her. It would be the same position, for he could not be free of her. For how can a man stand unless he have something sure under his feet? Can a man tread the unstable water all his life and call that standing? Better give in and drown at once. And upon what could he stand save upon a woman? Was he then, like the old man of the seas, impotent to move save upon the back of another life? Was he impotent, or a cripple, or a defective, or a fragment? It was black, mad, shameful torture, the frenzy of fear, the frenzy of desire, and the horrible, grasping backwash of shame. What was he afraid of? Why did life without Anna seem to him just a horrible welter, everything jostling in a meaningless, dark, fathomless flood? Why, if Anna left him even for a week, did he seem to be clinging like a madman to the edge of reality, and slipping surely, surely into the flood of unreality that would drown him? This horrible slipping into unreality drove him mad. His soul screamed with fear and agony. Yet she was pushing him off from her, pushing him away, breaking his fingers from their hold on her, persistently, ruthlessly. He wanted her to have pity, and sometimes, for a moment, she had pity, but she always began again thrusting him off into the deep water, into the frenzy and agony of uncertainty. She became like a fury to him, without any sense of him. Her eyes were bright with a cold, unmoving hatred. Then his heart seemed to die in its last fear. She might push him off into the deeps. She would not sleep with him any more. She said he destroyed her sleep. Up started all his frenzy and madness of fear and suffering. She drove him away. Like a cowed, lurking devil he was driven off, his mind working cunningly against her, devising evil for her. But she drove him off. In his moments of intense suffering she seemed to him inconceivable, a monster, the principle of cruelty. However her pity might give way for moments, she was hard and cold as a jewel. He must be put off from her. She must sleep alone. She made him a bed in the small room. And he lay there whipped, his soul whipped almost to death, yet unchanged. 
He lay in agony of suffering, thrown back into unreality, like a man thrown overboard into a sea, to swim till he sinks, because there is no hold, only a wide, weltering sea. He did not sleep, save for the white sleep when a thin veil is drawn over the mind. It was not sleep. He was awake, and he was not awake. He could not be alone. He needed to be able to put his arms round her. He could not bear the empty space against his breast where she used to be. He could not bear it. He felt as if he were suspended in space, held there by the grip of his will. If he relaxed, his will would fall, fall through endless space into the bottomless pit, always falling, willless, helpless, non-existent, just dropping to extinction, falling till the fire of friction had burned out, like a falling star, then nothing, nothing, complete nothing. He rose in the morning, gray and unreal, and she seemed fond of him again. She seemed to make up to him a little. "'I slept well,' she said, with her slightly false brightness. "'Did you?' "'All right,' he answered. He would never tell her. For three or four nights he lay alone through the white sleep, his will unchanged, unchanged, still tense, fixed in its grip. Then, as if she were revived and free to be fond of him again, deluded by his silence and seeming acquiescence, moved also by pity, she took him back again. Each night, in spite of all the shame, he had waited with agony for bedtime to see if she would shut him out. And each night, as in her false brightness she said good night, he felt he must kill her or himself. But she asked for her kiss, so pathetically, so prettily, so he kissed her, whilst his heart was ice, and sometimes he went out. Once he sat for a long time in the church porch before going into bed. It was dark with a wind blowing. He sat in the church porch and felt some shelter, some security, but it grew cold and he must go into bed. Then came the night when she said, putting her arms round him and kissing him fondly, "'Stay with me to-night, will you?' And he had stayed without demur, but his will had not altered. He would have her fixed to him, so that soon she told him again she must be alone. "'I don't want to send you away. I want to sleep with you, but I can't sleep. You don't let me sleep.' His blood turned black in his veins. "'What do you mean by such a thing? It's an errant lie. I don't let you sleep.' "'But you don't. I sleep so well when I'm alone, and I can't sleep when you're there. You do something to me. You put a pressure on my head, and I must sleep now the child is coming.' "'It's something in yourself,' he replied, "'something wrong in you. "'Horrible in the extreme were these nocturnal combats, "'when all the world was asleep and they too were alone, "'alone in the world and repelling each other. "'It was hardly to be borne. "'He went and lay down alone, "'and at length, after a grey and livid and ghastly period, "'he relaxed. "'Something gave way in him. "'He let go. "'He did not care what became of him. Strange and dim he became to himself, to her, to everybody. A vagueness had come over everything, like a drowning. And it was an infinite relief to drown. A relief. A great, great relief. He would insist no more. He would force her no more. He would force himself upon her no more. He would let go, relax, lapse, and what would be should be. Yet he wanted her still. He always, always wanted her. In his soul he was desolate as a child. He was so helpless. Like a child on its mother, he depended on her for his living. He knew it, and he knew he could hardly help it. Yet he must be able to be alone. He must be able to lie down alongside the empty space and let be. He must be able to leave himself to the flood, to sink or live as might be. For he recognized at length his own limitation, and the limitation of his power. He had to give in. There was a stillness, a wanness between them. Half, at least, of the battle was over. Sometimes she wept as she went about. Her heart was very heavy, but the child was always warm in her womb. They were friends again, new subdued friends, but there was a wanness between them. They slept together once more, very quietly and distinct, not one together as before, and she was intimate with him as at first, but he was very quiet and not intimate. He was glad in his soul, but for the time being he was not alive. He could sleep with her and let her be. He could be alone now. 
He had just learned what it was to be able to be alone. It was right and peaceful. She had given him a new, deeper freedom. The world might be a welter of uncertainty, but he was himself now. He had come into his own existence. He was born for a second time, born at last unto himself, out of the vast body of humanity. Now, at last, he had a separate identity. He existed alone, even if he were not quite alone. Before he had only existed in so far as he had relations with another being. Now he had an absolute self, as well as a relative self. But it was a very dumb, weak, helpless self, a crawling nursling. He went about very quiet, and in a way submissive. He had an unalterable self at last, free, separate, independent. She was relieved. She was free of him. She had given him to himself. She wept sometimes with tiredness and helplessness, but he was a husband, and she seemed, in the child that was coming, to forget. It seemed to make her warm and drowsy. She lapsed into a long muse, indistinct, warm, vague, unwilling to be taken out of her vagueness, and she rested on him also. Sometimes she came to him with a strange light in her eyes, poignant, pathetic, as if she were asking for something. He looked, and he could not understand. She was so beautiful, so visionary. The rays seemed to go out of his breast to her like a shining. He was there for her, all for her. And she would hold his breast and kiss it, and kiss it kneeling beside him, she who was waiting for the hour of her delivery. And he would lie looking down at his breast till it seemed that his breast was not himself, that he had left it lying there. Yet it was himself also, and beautiful and bright with her kisses. He was glad, with a strange radiant pain. Whilst she kneeled beside him, and kissed his breast with a slow, rapt, half-devotional movement. He knew she wanted something. His heart yearned to give it her. His heart yearned over her. And as she lifted her face, that was radiant and rosy as a little cloud, his heart still yearned over her. And now, from the distance, adored her. She had a flower-like presence which he adored as he stood far off, a stranger. The weeks passed on. The time drew near. They were very gentle and delicately happy. The insistent, passionate, dark soul, the powerful unsatisfaction in him, seemed stilled and tamed. The lion lay down with the lamb in him. She loved him very much indeed, and he waited near her. She was a precious, remote thing to him at this time, as she waited for her child. Her soul was glad with an ecstasy because of the coming infant. She wanted a boy. Oh, very much she wanted a boy. But she seemed so young and so frail. She was, indeed, only a girl. As she stood by the fire washing herself, she was proud to wash herself at this time, and he looked at her. His heart was full of extreme tenderness for her. Such fine, fine limbs, her slim round arms like chasing lights, and her legs so simple and childish, yet so very proud. Oh, she stood on proud legs with a lovely reckless balance of her full belly, and the adorable little roundnesses, and the breasts becoming important. Above it all her face was like a rosy cloud, shining. How proud she was! What a lovely, proud thing, her young body, and she loved him to put his hand on her ripe fullness, so that he should thrill also with the stir and the quickening there. He was afraid and silent, but she flung her arms round his neck with proud, impudent joy. The pains came on, and oh, how she cried! She would have him stay with her, and after her long cries she would look at him with tears in her eyes and a sobbing laugh on her face, saying, I don't mind it, really. It was bad enough, but to her it was never deathly. Even the fierce tearing pain was exhilarating. She screamed and suffered, but was all the time curiously alive and vital. She felt so powerfully alive and in the hands of such a masterly force of life that her bottommost feeling was one of exhilaration. She knew she was winning. Winning, she was always winning. With each onset of pain she was nearer to victory. Probably he suffered more than she did. He was not shocked or horrified, but he was screwed very tight in the vice of suffering. It was a girl. The second of silence on her face when they said so showed him she was disappointed, 
and a great blazing passion of resentment and protest sprang up in his heart. In that moment he claimed the child. But when the milk came and the infant sucked her breast, she seemed to be leaping with extravagant bliss. "'It sucks me! It sucks me! It likes me! Oh, it loves it!' she cried, holding the child to her breast with her two hands covering it passionately. And in a few moments, as she became used to her bliss, she looked at the youth with glowing, unseeing eyes, and said, "'Anna Victrix!' He went away, trembling, and slept. To her, her pains were the wound smart of a victor. She was the prouder. When she was well again, she was very happy. She called the baby Ursula. Both Anna and her husband felt they must have a name that gave them private satisfaction. The baby was tawny-skinned. It had a curious downy skin and wisps of bronze hair and the yellow-gray eyes that wavered and then became golden-brown like the father's. So they called her Ursula because of the picture of the saint. It was a rather delicate baby at first, but soon it became stronger and was restless as a young eel. Anna was worn out with the day-long wrestling with its young vigor. As a little animal she loved and adored it and was happy. She loved her husband. She kissed his eyes and nose and mouth and made much of him. She said his limbs were beautiful. She was fascinated by the physical form of him. And she was indeed Anna Victrix. He could not combat her any more. He was out in the wilderness alone with her. Having occasion to go to London, he marvelled as he returned, thinking of naked lurking savages on an island, how these had built up and created the great mass of Oxford Street or Piccadilly. How had helpless savages, running with their spears on the riverside after fish, how had they come to rear up this great London? the ponderous, massive, ugly superstructure of a world of man upon a world of nature. It frightened and awed him. Man was terrible, awful in his works. The works of man were more terrible than man himself, almost monstrous. And yet for his own part, for his private being, Brangwen felt that the whole of the man's world was exterior and extraneous to his own real life with Anna. Sweep away the whole monstrous superstructure of the world of today, cities and industries and civilization. Leave only the bare earth with plants growing and waters running, and he would not mind, so long as he were whole, had Anna and the child, and the new strange certainty in his soul. Then, if he were naked, he would find clothing somewhere. He would make a shelter and bring food to his wife. And what more? What more would be necessary? The great mass of activity on which mankind was engaged meant nothing to him. By nature he had no part in it. What did he live for, then? For Anna only, and for the sake of living? What did he want on this earth? Anna only, and his children, and his life with his children in her? Was there no more? He was attended by a sense of something more, something further, which gave him absolute being. It was as if now he existed in eternity— let time be what it might. What was there outside? The fabricated world that he did not believe in? What should he bring to her from outside? Nothing? Was it enough as it was? He was troubled in his acquiescence. She was not with him, yet he scarcely believed in himself apart from her, though the whole infinite was with him. Let the whole world slide down and over the edge of oblivion. He would stand alone." but he was unsure of her, and he existed also in her, so he was unsure. He hovered near to her, never quite able to forget the vague haunting uncertainty that seemed to challenge him, and which he would not hear. A pang of dread, almost guilt, as of insufficiency, would go over him, as he heard her talking to the baby. She stood before the window with the month-old child in her arms, talking in a musical young sing-song that he had not heard before, and which rang on his heart like a claim from the distance, or the voice of another world sounding its claim on him. He stood near, listening, and his heart surged, surged to rise and submit. Then it shrank back and stayed aloof. He could not move. A denial was upon him, as if he could not deny himself. He must, he must be himself. 
"'Look at the silly blue caps, my beauty,' she crooned, holding up the infant to the window, where shone the white garden and the blue tits scuffling in the snow. "'Look at the silly blue caps, my darling, having a fight in the snow. Look at them, my bird, beating the snow about with their wings and shaking their heads. Oh, aren't they wicked things, wicked things! Look at their yellow feathers on the snow there. They'll miss them, won't they, when they're cold later on?' "'Must we tell them to stop? Must we say stop it to them, my bird?' "'But they are naughty, naughty. Look at them.' Suddenly her voice broke loud and fierce. She rapped the pane sharply. "'Stop it!' she cried. "'Stop it, you little nuisances! Stop it!' She called louder and rapped the pane more sharply. Her voice was fierce and imperative. "'Have more sense!' she cried. "'There, now they're gone. Where have they gone, the silly things?' "'What will they say to each other? "'What will they say, my lambkin? "'They'll forget, won't they? "'They'll forget all about it "'out of their silly little heads "'and their blue caps.' "'After a moment she turned her bright face "'to her husband. "'They were really fighting. "'They were really fierce with each other,' she said, "'her voice keen with excitement and wonder, "'as if she belonged to the bird's world, "'were identified with the race of birds. "'Eh, they'll fight with blue caps,' he said, "'glad when she turned to him with her glow from elsewhere. "'He came and stood beside her, "'and looked out at the marks on the snow where the birds had scuffled, "'and at the yew-tree's burdened white and black branches. "'What was the appeal it made to him? "'What was the question of her bright face? "'What was the challenge he was called to answer? "'He did not know. "'But as he stood there he felt some responsibility "'which made him glad but uneasy.' as if he must put out his own light, and he could not move as yet. Anna loved the child very much, oh, very much, yet still she was not quite fulfilled. She had a slight expectant feeling, as of a door half opened. Here she was, safe and still in Cassette, but she felt as if she were not in Cassette at all. She was straining her eyes to something beyond, and from her Pisgah mount which she had attained, what could she see? A faint gleaming horizon a long way off, and a rainbow like an archway, a shadow door with faintly colored coping above it. Must she be moving thither? Something she had not, something she did not grasp, could not arrive at. There was something beyond her, but why must she start on the journey? She stood so safely on the Pisgah Mountain. In the winter, when she rose with the sunrise, and out of the back windows saw the east flaming yellow and orange above the green glowing grass, while the great pear-tree in between stood dark and magnificent as an idol, and under the dark pear-tree the little sheet of water spread smooth in burnished yellow light, she said, It is here. And when at evening the sunset came and a red glare through the big opening in the clouds, she said again, It is beyond. Dawn and sunset were the feet of the rainbow that spanned the day, and she saw the hope, the promise. Why should she travel any further? Yet she always asked the question. As the sun went down in his fiery winter haste, she faced the blazing close of the affair in which she had not played her fullest part, and she made her demand still. What are you doing making this big shining commotion? What is it that you keep so busy about that you will not let us alone? She did not turn to her husband for him to lead her. He was apart from her with her, according to her different conceptions of him. The child she might hold up. She might toss the child forward into the furnace. The child might walk there amid the burning coals and the incandescent roar of heat as the three witnesses walked with the angel in the fire. Soon she felt sure of her husband. She knew his dark face and the extent of its passion. She knew his slim, vigorous body. She said it was hers. Then there was no denying her. She was a rich woman, enjoying her riches. And soon again she was with child, which made her satisfied and took away her discontent. She forgot that she had watched the sun climb up and pass his way, a magnificent traveller surging forward. She forgot that the moon had looked through a window of the high dark night and nodded like a magic recognition signalled to her to follow. Sun and moon travelled on and left her, passed her by, a rich woman enjoying her riches. She should go also. 
but she could not go when they called, because she must stay at home now. With satisfaction she relinquished the adventure to the unknown. She was bearing her children. There was another child coming, and Anna lapsed into vague content. If she were not the wayfarer to the unknown, if she were arrived now, settled in her builded house, a rich woman, still her doors opened under the arch of the rainbow, her threshold reflected the passing of the sun and moon, the great travellers. Her house was full of the echo of journeying. She was a door and a threshold, she herself. Through her, another soul was coming to stand upon her as upon the threshold, looking out, shading its eyes for the direction to take. End of chapter 6「Chapter Seven of the Rainbow. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Rainbow by D. H. Lawrence. Chapter Seven The Cathedral. During the first year of her marriage, before Ursula was born, Anna Brangwen and her husband went to visit her mother's friend, the Baron Skrebensky. The latter had kept a slight connection with Anna's mother, and had always preserved some officious interest in the young girl, because she was a pure Pole. When Baron Skrebensky was about forty years old, his wife died and left him raving, disconsolate. Lydia had visited him then, taking Anna with her. It was when the girl was fourteen years old. Since then she had not seen him. She remembered him as a small, sharp clergyman who cried and talked and terrified her, whilst her mother was most strangely consoling in a foreign language. The little baron never quite approved of Anna, because she spoke no Polish. Still, he considered himself in some way her guardian, on Lenski's behalf, and he presented her with some old, heavy Russian jewellery, the least valuable of his wife's relics. Then he lapsed out of the Brangwen's life again, though he lived only about thirty miles away. Three years later came the startling news that he had married a young English girl of good family. Everybody marvelled. Then came a copy of The History of the Parish of Briswell by Rudolf Baron Skrebensky, Vicar of Briswell. It was a curious book incoherent, full of interesting exhumations. It was dedicated to my wife, Millicent Maud Pierce, in whom I embrace the generous spirit of England. "'If he embraces no more than the spirit of England,' said Tom Brangwen, "'it's a bad lookout for him.' But paying a formal visit with his wife, he found the new baroness a little creamy-skinned insidious thing with red-brown hair and a mouth that one must always watch, because it curved back continually in an incomprehensible strange laugh that exposed her rather prominent teeth. She was not beautiful, yet Tom Brangwen was immediately under her spell. She seemed to snuggle like a kitten within his warmth, whilst she was at the same time elusive and ironical, suggesting the fine steel of her claws. The baron was almost dotingly curious and attentive to her. She, almost mockingly, yet quite happy, let him dote. Curious little thing she was. She had the soft, creamy, elusive beauty of a ferret. Tom Brangwen was quite at a loss, at her mercy, and she laughed, a little breathlessly, as if tempted to cruelty. She did put fine torments on the elderly baron. When, some months later, she bore a son, the Baron Skrebensky was loud with delight. Gradually she gathered a circle of acquaintances in the county, for she was of good family, half Venetian, educated in Dresden. The little foreign vicar attained to a social status which almost satisfied his maddened pride. Therefore the Brangwens were surprised when the invitation came for Anna and her young husband to pay a visit to Briswell Vicarage, for the Skrebenskys were now moderately well off, Millicent Skrebensky having some fortune of her own. 
Anna took her best clothes, recovered her best high school manner, and arrived with her husband. Will Brangwen, ruddy, bright, with long limbs and a small head like some uncouth bird, was not changed in the least. The little baroness was smiling, showing her teeth. She had a real charm, a kind of joyous coldness, laughing, delighted, like some weasel. Anna at once respected her and was on her guard before her, instinctively attracted by the strange childlike surety of the baroness, yet mistrusting it, fascinated. The little baron was now quite white-haired, very brittle. He was wizened and wrinkled, yet fiery, unsubdued. Anna looked at his lean body, at his small, fine, lean legs and lean hands as he sat talking, and she flushed. She recognized the quality of the male in him, his lean, concentrated age, his informed fire, his faculty for sharp, deliberate response. He was so detached, so purely objective. A woman was thoroughly outside him. There was no confusion, so he could give that fine, deliberate response. He was something separate and interesting. His hard, intrinsic being, whittled down by age to an essentiality and a directness almost death-like, cruel, was yet so unswervingly sure in its action, so distinct in its surety, that she was attracted to him. She watched his cool, hard, separate fire, fascinated by it. Would she rather have it than her husband's diffuse heat, than his blind, hot youth? She seemed to be breathing high, sharp air, as if she had just come out of a hot room. These strange Skrebenskys made her aware of another freer element, in which each person was detached and isolated. Was not this her natural element? Was not the close Brangwen life stifling her? Meanwhile, the little baroness, with always a subtle light stirring of her full, lustrous hazel eyes, was playing with Will Brangwen. He was not quick enough to see all her movements, yet he watched her steadily, with unchanging, lit-up eyes. She was a strange creature to him, but she had no power over him. She flushed and was irritated, yet she glanced again and again at his dark, living face, curiously, as if she despised him. She despised his uncritical, unironical nature. It had nothing for her, yet it angered her as if she were jealous. He watched her with deferential interest, as he would watch a stoat playing. But he himself was not implicated. He was different in kind. She was all lambent, biting flames. He was a red fire, glowing steadily. She could get nothing out of him. So she made him flush darkly by assuming a biting, subtle class superiority. He flushed, but still he did not object. He was too different. Her little boy came in with the nurse. He was a quick, slight child, with fine perceptiveness and a cool transitoriness in his interest. At once he treated Will Brangwen as an outsider. He stayed by Anna for a moment, acknowledged her, then was gone again, quick, observant, restless, with a glance of interest at everything. The father adored him and spoke to him in Polish. It was queer— the stiff, aristocratic manner of the father with the child, the distance in the relationship, the classic fatherhood on the one hand, the filial subordination on the other. They played together in their different degrees, very separate, two different beings, differing, as it were, in rank rather than in relationship. And the baroness smiled, 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 always smiled, showing her rather protruding teeth, having always a mysterious attraction and charm. Anna realized how different her own life might have been, how different her own living. Her soul stirred. She became as another person. Her intimacy with her husband passed away. The curious, enveloping Brangwen intimacy, so warm, so close, so stifling, when one seemed always to be in contact with the other person, like a blood relation, was annulled. She denied it, this close relationship with her young husband. He and she were not one. His heat was not always to suffuse her, suffuse her through her mind and her individuality, till she was of one heat with him, till she had not her own self apart. She wanted her own life. 
He seemed to lap her and suffuse her with his being, his hot life, till she did not know whether she were herself or whether she were another creature, united with him in a world of close blood intimacy that closed over her and excluded her from all the cool outside. She wanted her own old sharp self, detached, detached, active but not absorbed, active for her own part, taking and giving but never absorbed, whereas he wanted this strange absorption with her, which still she resisted. But she was partly helpless against it. She had lived so long in Tom Brangwen's love beforehand. From the Skrebenskys they went to Will Brangwen's beloved Lincoln Cathedral, because it was not far off. He had promised her that one by one they should visit all the cathedrals of England. They began with Lincoln, which he knew well. He began to get excited as the time drew near to set off. What was it that changed him so much? She was almost angry, coming as she did from the Skrebenskys. But now he ran on alone. His very breast seemed to open its doors to watch for the great church brooding over the town. His soul ran ahead. When he saw the cathedral in the distance, dark blue lifted watchful in the sky, his heart leapt. It was the sign in heaven, it was the spirit hovering like a dove, like an eagle over the earth. He turned his glowing ecstatic face to her, his mouth opened with a strange ecstatic grin. "'There she is,' he said. The she irritated her. Why she? It was it. What was the cathedral, a big building, a thing of the past, obsolete, to excite him to such a pitch? She began to stir herself to readiness. They passed up the steep hill, he eager as a pilgrim arriving at the shrine. As they came near the precincts, with castle on one side and cathedral on the other, his veins seemed to break into fiery blossom. He was transported. They had passed through the gate, and the great west front was before them, with all its breadth and ornament. "'It is a false front,' he said, looking at the golden stone and the twin towers, and loving them just the same. In a little ecstasy he found himself in the porch, on the brink of the unrevealed. He looked up to the lovely unfolding of the stone. He was to pass within to the perfect womb. Then he pushed open the door, and the great pillared gloom was before him, in which his soul shuddered and rose from her nest. His soul leapt, soared up into the great church. His body stood still, absorbed by the height. His soul leapt up into the gloom, into possession. It reeled, it swooned with a great escape, it quivered in the womb, in the hush and the gloom of fecundity, like seed of procreation in ecstasy. She, too, was overcome with wonder and awe. She followed him in his progress. Here the twilight was the very essence of life. The colored darkness was the embryo of all light and the day. Here the very first dawn was breaking, the very last sunset sinking, and the immemorial darkness whereof life's day would blossom and fall away again re-echoed peace and profound immemorial silence. Away from time, always outside of time, between east and west, between dawn and sunset, the church lay like a seed in silence, dark before germination, silenced after death, containing birth and death, potential with all the noise and transition of life, the cathedral remained hushed, a great involved seed, whereof the flower would be radiant life, inconceivable but whose beginning and whose end were the circle of silence. Spanned round with the rainbow, the jewelled gloom folded music upon silence, light upon darkness, fecundity upon death. As a seed folds leaf upon leaf, and silence upon the root and the flower, hushing up the secret of all between its parts, the death out of which it fell, the life into which it has dropped, the immortality it involves, and the death it will embrace again. Here in the church, before and after were folded together. All was contained in oneness. Brangwen came to his consummation. Out of the doors of the womb he had come, putting aside the wings of the womb, and proceeding into the light. 
Through daylight and day after day he had come, knowledge after knowledge and experience after experience, remembering the darkness of the womb, having prescience of the darkness after death. Then, between while, he had pushed open the doors of the cathedral and entered the twilight of both darkness, the hush of the twofold silence where dawn was sunset, and the beginning and the end were one. Here the stone leapt up from the plain of earth, leapt up in a manifold clustered desire each time, up, away from the horizontal earth, through twilight and dusk and the whole range of desire, through the swerving, the declination, ah, to the ecstasy, the touch, to the meeting and the consummation, the meeting, the clasp, the close embrace, the neutrality, the perfect swooning consummation, the timeless ecstasy. There his soul remained at the apex of the arch, clinched in the timeless ecstasy, consummated. And there was no time, nor life, nor death, but only this, this timeless consummation, where the thrust from earth met the thrust from earth, and the arch was locked on the keystone of ecstasy. This was all, this was everything, till he came to himself in the world below. Then again he gathered himself together, in transit, every jet of him strained and leaped, leaped clear into the darkness above, to the fecundity and the unique mystery, to the touch, the clasp, the consummation, the climax of eternity, the apex of the arch. She too was overcome, but silenced rather than tuned to the place. She loved it as a world not quite her own. She resented his transports and ecstasies. His passion in the cathedral at first awed her, then made her angry. After all, there was the sky outside, and in here, in this mysterious half-night, when his soul leapt with the pillars upwards, it was not to the stars and the crystalline dark space, but to meet and clasp with the answering impulse of leaping stone, there in the dusk and secrecy of the roof, the far-off clinching and mating of the arches, the leap and thrust of the stone, carrying a great roof overhead, awed and silenced her. But yet, yet she remembered that the open sky was no blue vault, no dark dome hung with many twinkling lamps, but a space where stars were wheeling in freedom, with freedom above them always higher. The cathedral roused her, too, but she would never consent to the knitting of all the leaping stone in a great roof that closed her in, and beyond which was nothing, nothing. It was the ultimate confine. His soul would have liked it to be so. Here, here is all, complete, eternal, motion, meeting, ecstasy, and no illusion of time, of night and day passing by, but only perfectly proportioned space and movement, clinching and renewing, and passion surging its way into great waves to the altar, recurrence of ecstasy. Her soul, too, was carried forward to the altar, to the threshold of eternity, in reverence and fear and joy, but ever she hung back in the transit, mistrusting the culmination of the altar. She was not to be flung forward on the lift and lift of passionate flights, to be cast at last upon the altar steps as upon the shore of the unknown. There was a great joy and a verity in it, but even in the dazed swoon of the cathedral she claimed another rite. The altar was barren, its lights gone out. God burned no more in that bush. It was dead matter lying there. She claimed the right to freedom above her, higher than the roof. She had always a sense of being roofed in. So that she caught at little things which saved her from being swept forward headlong in the tide of passion that leaps on into the infinite in a great mass, triumphant and flinging its own course. She wanted to get out of this fixed, leaping, forward-traveling movement, to rise from it as a bird rises with wet, limp feet from the sea, to lift herself as a bird lifts its breast and thrusts its body from the pulse and heave of a sea that bears it forward to an unwilling conclusion, tear herself away like a bird on wings, and in open space where there is clarity, rise up above the fixed, surcharged motion a separate speck that hangs suspended, moves this way and that, seeing and answering before it sinks again, 
having chosen or found the direction in which it shall be carried forward. And it was as if she must grasp at something, as if her wings were too weak to lift her straight off the heaving motion, so she caught sight of the wicked, odd little faces carved in stone, and she stood before them, arrested. These sly little faces peeped out of the grand tide of the cathedral like something that knew better. They knew quite well, these little imps, that retorted on man's own illusion, that the cathedral was not absolute. They winked and leered, giving suggestion of the many things that had been left out of the great concept of the church. However much there is inside here, there's a good deal they haven't got in, the little faces mocked. Apart from the lift and spring of the great impulse towards the altar, these little faces had separate wills, separate motions, separate knowledge, which rippled back in defiance of the tide, and laughed in triumph of their own very littleness. "'Oh, look!' cried Anna. "'Oh, look how adorable the faces! Look at her!' Brangwen looked unwillingly. This was the voice of the serpent in his Eden. She pointed him to a plump, sly, malicious little face carved in stone. "'He knew her, the man who carved her,' said Anna. "'I'm sure she was his wife.' "'It isn't a woman at all. It's a man,' said Brangwen curtly. "'Do you think so?' "'No, that isn't a man. That is no man's face.' Her voice sounded rather jeering. He laughed shortly and went on, but she would not go forward with him. She loitered about the carvings, and he could not go forward without her. He waited, impatient of this counteraction. She was spoiling his passionate intercourse with the cathedral. His brows began to gather. "'Oh, this is good!' she cried again. "'Here is the same woman. Look, only he's made her cross. Isn't it lovely? Hasn't he made her hideous to a degree?' She laughed with pleasure. "'Didn't he hate her?' He must have been a nice man. Look at her. Isn't it awfully good? Just like a shrewish woman. He must have enjoyed putting her in like that. He got his own back on her, didn't he? It's a man's face, no woman's at all. A monk's clean-shaven, he said. She laughed with a poof of laughter. You hate to think he put his wife in your cathedral, don't you? She mocked with a tinkle of profane laughter, and she laughed with malicious triumph. She had got free from the cathedral. She had even destroyed the passion he had. She was glad. He was bitterly angry. Strive as he would, he could not keep the cathedral wonderful to him. He was disillusioned. That which had been his absolute, containing all heaven and earth, was become to him as to her, a shapely heap of dead matter, but dead, dead. His mouth was full of ash. His soul was furious. He hated her for having destroyed another of his vital illusions. Soon he would be stark, stark without one place wherein to stand, without one belief in which to rest. Yet somewhere in him he responded more deeply to the sly little face that knew better than he had done before to the perfect surge of his cathedral. Nevertheless, for the time being his soul was wretched and homeless, and he could not bear to think of Anna's ousting him from his beloved realities. He wanted his cathedral, he wanted to satisfy his blind passion, and he could not any more. Something intervened. They went home again, both of them altered. She had some new reverence for that which he wanted. He felt that his cathedrals would never again be to him as they had been. Before he had thought them absolute, but now he saw them crouching under the sky with still the dark, mysterious world of reality inside, but as a world within a world, a sort of sideshow, whereas before they had been as a world to him within a chaos, a reality, an order, an absolute within a meaningless confusion. He had felt before that could he but go through the great door and look down the gloom towards the far-off concluding wonder of the altar, that then, with the windows suspended around like tablets of jewels emanating their own glory, then he had arrived. Here the satisfaction he had yearned after came near, towards this, the porch of the great unknown, all reality gathered, and there, 
The altar was the mystic door, through which all and everything must move on to eternity. But now, somehow, sadly and disillusioned, he realized that the doorway was no doorway. It was too narrow. It was false. Outside the cathedral were many flying spirits that could never be sifted through the jeweled gloom. He had lost his absolute. He listened to the thrushes in the gardens, and heard a note which the cathedrals did not include, something free and careless and joyous. He crossed a field that was all yellow with dandelions on his way to work, and the bath of yellow glowing was something at once so sumptuous and so fresh that he was glad he was away from his shadowy cathedral. There was life outside the church. There was much that the church did not include. He thought of God and of the whole blue rotunda of the day. That was something great and free. He thought of the ruins of the Grecian worship, and it seemed a temple was never perfectly a temple till it was ruined and mixed up with the winds and the sky and the herbs. Still he loved the church. As a symbol he loved it. He tended it for what it tried to represent rather than for that which it did represent. Still he loved it. The little church across his garden wall drew him. He gave it loving attention. But he went to take charge of it, to preserve it. It was as an old sacred thing to him. He looked after the stone and woodwork, mending the organ and restoring a piece of broken carving, repairing the church furniture. Later he became choir master also. His life was shifting its center, becoming more superficial. He had failed to become really articulate, failed to find real expression. He had to continue in the old form, but in spirit he was uncreated. Anna was absorbed in the child now. She left her husband to take his own way. She was willing now to postpone all adventure into unknown realities. She had the child. Her palpable and immediate future was the child. If her soul had found no utterance, her womb had. The church that neighbored with his house became very intimate and dear to him. He cherished it. He had it entirely in his charge. If he could find no new activity, he would be happy cherishing the old dear form of worship. He knew this little whitewashed church. In its shadowy atmosphere he sank back into being. He liked to sink himself in its hush as a stone sinks into water. He went across his garden, mounted the wall by the little steps, and entered the hush and peace of the church. As the heavy door clanged to behind him, his feet re-echoed in the aisle. His heart re-echoed with a little passion of tenderness and mystic peace. He was also slightly ashamed, like a man who has failed, who lapses back for his fulfillment. He loved to light the candles at the organ, and sitting there alone in the little glow, practiced the hymns and chants for the service. The whitewashed arches retreated into darkness. The sound of the organ and the organ pedals died away upon the unalterable stillness of the church. There were faint ghostly noises in the tower, and then the music swelled out again, loudly, triumphantly. He ceased to fret about his life. He relaxed his will and let everything go. What was between him and his wife was a great thing, if it was not everything. She had conquered, really. Let him wait and abide, wait and abide. She and the baby and himself, they were one. The organ rang out his protestation. His soul lay in the darkness as he pressed the keys of the organ. To Anna, the baby was a complete bliss and fulfillment. Her desires sank into abeyance. Her soul was in bliss over the baby. It was rather a delicate child. She had trouble to rear it. She never for a moment thought it would die. It was a delicate infant, therefore it behooved her to make it strong. She threw herself into the labor. The child was everything. Her imagination was all occupied here. She was a mother. It was enough to handle the new little limbs, the new little body, hear the new little voice crying in the stillness. All the future rang to her out of the sound of the baby's crying and cooing. She balanced the coming years of life in her hands as she nursed the child. The passionate sense of fulfillment of the future germinated in her, made her vivid and powerful. 
all the future was in her hands, in the hands of the woman, and before this baby was ten months old she was again with child. She seemed to be in the fecund of storm life. Every moment was full and busy with productiveness to her. She felt like the earth, the mother of everything. Brangwen occupied himself with the church. He played the organ, he trained the choir boys, he taught a Sunday school class of youths. He was happy enough. There was an eager, yearning kind of happiness in him as he taught the boys on Sundays. He was all the time exciting himself with the proximity of some secret that he had not yet fathomed. In the house he served his wife and the little matriarchy. She loved him because he was the father of her children, and she always had a physical passion for him. So he gave up trying to have the spiritual superiority and control, or even her respect for his conscious or public life. He lived simply by her physical love for him, and he served the little matriarchy, nursing the child and helping with the housework, indifferent any more of his own dignity and importance. But his abandoning of claims, his living isolated upon his own interest, made him seem unreal, unimportant. Anna was not publicly proud of him, but very soon she learned to be indifferent to public life. He was not what is called a manly man. He did not drink or smoke or arrogate importance. But he was her man, and his very indifference to all claims of manliness set her supreme in her own world with him. Physically she loved him, and he satisfied her. He went alone and subsidiary always. At first it had irritated her. The outer world existed so little to him. Looking at him with outside eyes, she was inclined to sneer at him, but her sneer changed to a sort of respect. She respected him that he could serve her so simply and completely. Above all, she loved to bear his children. She loved to be the source of children. She could not understand him, his strange dark rages and his devotion to the church. It was the church building he cared for. And yet his soul was passionate for something. He labored cleaning the stonework, repairing the woodwork, restoring the organ, and making the singing as perfect as possible. To keep the church fabric and the church ritual intact was his business. To have the intimate sacred building utterly in his own hands, and to make the form of service complete. There was a little bright anguish and tension on his face, and in his intent movements. He was like a lover who knows he is betrayed, but who still loves, whose love is only the more intense. The church was false, but he served it the more attentively. During the day, at his work in the office, he kept himself suspended. He did not exist. He worked automatically till it was time to go home. He loved with a hot heart the dark-haired little Ursula, and he waited for the child to come to consciousness. Now the mother monopolized the baby, but his heart waited in its darkness. His hour would come. In the long run he learned to submit to Anna. She forced him to the spirit of her laws, whilst leaving him the letter of his own. She combated in him his devils. She suffered very much from his inexplicable and incalculable dark rages, when a blackness filled him, and a black wind seemed to sweep out of existence everything that had to do with him. She could feel herself, everything, being annihilated by him. At first she fought him. At night, in this state, he would kneel down to say his prayers. She looked at his crouching figure. "'Why are you kneeling there pretending to pray?' she said harshly. "'Do you think anybody can pray when they are in the vile temper you are in?' He remained crouching by the bedside, motionless. "'It's horrible,' she continued, "'and such a pretense. "'What do you pretend you are saying? "'Who do you pretend you are praying to?' He still remained motionless, seething with inchoate rage, when his whole nature seemed to disintegrate. He seemed to live with a strain upon himself, and occasionally came these dark, chaotic rages, the lust for destruction. She then fought with him, and their fights were horrible, murderous, and then the passion between them came just as black and awful. But little by little, as she learned to love him better, she would put herself aside, 
and when she felt one of his fits upon him would ignore him, successfully leave him in his world while she remained in her own. He had a black struggle with himself to come back to her, for at last he learned that he would be in hell until he came back to her. So he struggled to submit to her, and she was afraid of the ugly strain in his eyes. She made love to him and took him. Then he was grateful to her love, humble. He made himself a woodwork shed in which to restore things which were destroyed in the church, so he had plenty to do. His wife, his child, the church, the woodwork, and his way journeying all occupying him. If only there were not some limit to him, some darkness across his eyes. He had to give in to it at last himself. He must submit to his own inadequacy, aware of some limit to himself, of something unformed in his own black, violent temper, and to reckon with it. But as she was more gentle with him, it became quieter. As he sat, sometimes very still, with a bright, vacant face, Anna could see the suffering among the brightness. He was aware of some limit to himself, of something unformed in his very being, of some buds which were not ripe in him, some folded centers of darkness which would never develop and unfold whilst he was alive in the body. He was unready for fulfillment. Something undeveloped in him limited him. There was a darkness in him which he could not unfold, which would never unfold in him. End of chapter 7
His heart strained and stood on guard against the whole universe. But he waited for the dread of these days to pass. He saw the joy coming. He saw the lovely, creamy, cool little ear of the baby, a bit of dark hair rubbed to a bronze floss, like bronze dust. And he waited for the child to become his, to look at him and answer him. It had a separate being, but it was his own child. His flesh and blood vibrated to it. He caught the baby to his breast with his passionate, clapping laugh, and the infant knew him. As the newly opened, newly dawned eyes looked at him, he wanted them to perceive him, to recognize him. Then he was verified. The child knew him. A queer contortion of laughter came on its face for him. He caught it to his breast, clapping with a triumphant laugh. The golden brown eyes of the child gradually lit up and dilated at the sight of the dark, glowing face of the youth. It knew its mother better, it wanted its mother more, but the brightest, sharpest little ecstasy was for the father. It began to be strong, to move vigorously and freely, to make sounds like words. It was a baby girl now. Already it knew his strong hands, it exulted in his strong clasp. It laughed and crowed when he played with it. And his heart grew red-hot with passionate feeling for the child. She was not much more than a year old when the second baby was born. Then he took Ursula for his own. She, his first little girl, he had set his heart on her. The second had dark blue eyes and a fair skin. It was more a Brangwen, people said. The hair was fair, but they forgot Anna's stiff blonde fleece of childhood. They called the newcomer Gudrun. This time Anna was stronger and not so eager. She did not mind that the baby was not a boy. It was enough that she had milk and could suckle her child. Oh, oh, the bliss of the little life sucking the milk of her body. Oh, 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 the bliss as the infant grew stronger of the two tiny hands clutching, catching blindly yet passionately at her breast, of the tiny mouth seeking her in blind, sure, vital knowledge, of the sudden, consummate peace as the little body sank, the mouth and throat sucking, 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 drinking life from her to make a new life, almost sobbing with passionate joy of receiving its own existence, the tiny hands clutching frantically as the nipple was drawn back, not to be gainsaid. This was enough for Anna. She seemed to pass off into a kind of rapture of motherhood, her rapture of motherhood was everything. So that the father had the elder baby, the weaned child. The golden-brown, wondering, vivid eyes of the little Ursula were for him, who had waited behind the mother till the need was for him. The mother felt a sharp stab of jealousy, but she was still more absorbed in the tiny baby. It was entirely hers. Its need was direct upon her. So Ursula became the child of her father's heart. She was the little blossom. He was the sun. He was patient, energetic, inventive for her. He taught her all the funny little things. He filled her and roused her to her fullest tiny measure. She answered him with her extravagant infant's laughter and her call of delight. Now there were two babies. A woman came in to do the housework. Anna was holy nurse. Two babies were not too much for her, but she hated any form of work now her children had come, except the charge of them. When Ursula toddled about, she was an absorbed, busy child, always amusing herself, needing not much attention from other people. At evening, towards six o'clock, Anna very often went across the lane to the stile, lifted Ursula over into the field with a, "'Go and meet Daddy!' Then Brangwen, coming up the steep round of the hill, would see before him on the brow of the path a tiny, tottering, wind-blown little mite with a dark head, who, as soon as she saw him, would come running in tiny, wild, windmill fashion, lifting her arms up and down to him, down the steep hill. His heart leapt up. He ran his fastest to her, to catch her, because he knew she would fall. She came fluttering on wildly, with her little limbs flying, and he was glad when he caught her up in his arms. Once she fell as she came flying to him. He saw her pitch forward suddenly as she was running with her hands lifted to him, and when he picked her up her mouth was bleeding. He could never bear to think of it. 
He always wanted to cry, even when he was an old man and she had become a stranger to him. How he loved that little Ursula! His heart had been sharply seared for her when he was a youth, first married. When she was a little older, he would see her recklessly climbing over the bars of the stile in her red pinafore, swinging in peril and tumbling over, picking herself up and flitting towards him. Sometimes she liked to ride on his shoulder, sometimes she preferred to walk with his hand. Sometimes she would fling her arms round his legs for a moment, then race free again, whilst he went shouting and calling to her, a child along with her. He was still only a tall, thin, unsettled lad of twenty-two. It was he who had made her her cradle, her little chair, her little stool, her high chair. It was he who would swing her up to table, or who would make for her a doll out of an old table leg, whilst she watched him, saying, "'Make her eyes, Daddy, make her eyes!' and he made her eyes with his knife. She was very fond of adorning herself, so he would tie a piece of cotton round her ear, and hang a blue bead on it underneath for an earring. The earrings varied with a red bead, and a golden bead, and a little pearl bead, and as he came home at night, seeing her bridling and looking very self-conscious, he took notice and said, "'So you're wearing your best golden and pearl earrings to-day?' "'Yes. I suppose you've been to see the Queen?' "'Yes, I have.' "'Oh, and what had she to say?' "'She said, she said, you won't dirty your nice white frock.' He gave her the nicest bits from his plate, putting them into her red, moist mouth, and he would make on a piece of bread and butter a bird out of jam, which she ate with extraordinary relish. After the tea things were washed up, the woman went away, leaving the family free. Usually Brangwen helped in the bathing of the children. He held long discussions with his child as she sat on his knee and he unfastened her clothes, and he seemed to be talking really of momentous things deep moralities. Then suddenly she ceased to hear, having caught sight of a glassy rolled into a corner. She slipped away and was in no hurry to return. "'Come back here,' he said, waiting. She became absorbed, taking no notice. "'Come on,' he repeated with a touch of command. An excited little chuckle came from her, but she pretended to be absorbed. "'Do you hear, my lady? She turned with a fleeting, exulting laugh. He rushed on her and swept her up. "'Who was it that didn't come?' he said, rolling her between his strong hands, tickling her. And she laughed heartily, heartily. She loved him, that he compelled her with his strength and decision. He was all-powerful, the tower of strength which rose out of her sight. When the children were in bed, sometimes Anna and he sat and talked desultorily, both of them idle. He read very little. Anything he was drawn to read became a burning reality to him another scene outside his window, whereas Anna skimmed through a book to see what happened. Then she had enough. Therefore they would often sit together, talking desultorily. What was really between them they could not utter. Their words were only accidents in the mutual silence. When they talked, they gossiped. She did not care for sewing. She had a beautiful way of sitting musing, gratefully, as if her heart were lit up. Sometimes she would turn to him laughing, to tell him some little thing that had happened during the day. Then he would laugh, they would talk a while, before the vital physical silence was between them again. She was thin, but full of color and life. She was perfectly happy to do just nothing, only to sit with a curious languid dignity, so careless as to be almost regal, so utterly indifferent, so confident. The bond between them was undefinable, but very strong. It kept everyone else at a distance. His face never changed whilst she knew him. It only became more intense. It was ruddy and dark in its abstraction, not very human. It had a strong, intent brightness. Sometimes, when his eyes met hers, a yellow flash from them caused the darkness to swoon over her consciousness, electric, and a slight strange laugh came on his face. Her eyes would turn languidly, then close as if hypnotized, and they lapsed into the same potent darkness. He had the quality of a young black cat, intent, unnoticeable, and yet his presence gradually made itself felt, stealthily and powerfully took hold of her. He called, not to her, 
but to something in her which responded subtly, out of her unconscious darkness. So they were together in a darkness, passionate, electric, forever haunting the back of the common day, never in the light. In the light he seemed to sleep, unknowing. Only she knew him when the darkness set him free, and he could see with his gold-glowing eyes his intention and his desires in the dark. Then she was in a spell. Then she answered his harsh, penetrating call with a soft leap of her soul. The darkness woke up, electric, bristling with an unknown, overwhelming insinuation. By now they knew each other. She was the daytime, the daylight. He was the shadow, put aside, but in the darkness, potent with an overwhelming voluptuousness. She learned not to dread and to hate him, but to fill herself with him, to give herself to his black sensual power that was hidden all the daytime. And the curious rolling of the eyes, as if she were lapsing in a trance away from her ordinary consciousness, became habitual with her, when something threatened and opposed her in life, the conscious life. So they remained as separate in the light, and in the thick darkness married. He supported her daytime authority, kept it inviolable at last, and she, in all the darkness, belonged to him, to his close, insinuating, hypnotic familiarity. All his daytime activity, all his public life, was a kind of sleep. She wanted to be free, to belong to the day, and he ran avoiding the day in work. After tea he went to the shed to his carpentry or his wood-carving. He was restoring the patched, degraded pulpit to its original form. But he loved to have the child near him, playing by his feet. She was a piece of light that really belonged to him, that played within his darkness. He left the shed door on the latch, and when, with his second sense of another presence, he knew she was coming, he was satisfied. He was at rest. When he was alone with her, he did not want to take notice, to talk. He wanted to live unthinking, with her presence flickering upon him. He always went in silence. The child would push open the shed door, and see him working by lamplight, his sleeves rolled back, his clothes hung about him carelessly, like mere wrapping. Inside his body was concentrated with a flexible, charged power all of its own, isolated, from when she was a tiny child, Ursula could remember his forearm, with its fine black hairs and its electric flexibility, working at the bench through swift, unnoticeable movements, always ambushed in a sort of silence. She hung a moment in the door of the shed, waiting for him to notice her. He turned, his black curved eyebrows arching slightly. "'Hullo, Twitter, miss!' and he closed the door behind her. Then the child was happy in the shed that smelled of sweet wood and resounded to the noise of the plane or the hammer or the saw, yet was charged with the silence of the worker. She played on, intent and absorbed, among the shavings and the little nogs of wood. She never touched him. His feet and legs were near. She did not approach them. She liked to flit out after him when he was going to church at night. If he were going to be alone, he swung her over the wall and let her come. Again she was transported when the door was shut behind them, and they too inherited the big, pale, void place. She would watch him as he lit the organ candles, wait whilst he began his practicing his tunes. Then she ran foraging here and there like a kitten, playing by herself in the darkness with eyes dilated. The ropes hung vaguely, twining on the floor from the bells in the tower, and Ursula always wanted the fluffy red and white or blue and white rope grips but they were above her. Sometimes her mother came to claim her. Then the child was seized with resentment. She passionately resented her mother's superficial authority. She wanted to assert her own detachment. He, however, also gave her occasional cruel shocks. He let her play about in the church. She rifled footstools and hymn-books and cushions like a bee among flowers, whilst the organ echoed away. This continued for some weeks. Then the charwoman worked herself up into a frenzy of rage to dare to attack Brangwen, and one day descended on him like a harpy. He wilted away and wanted to break the old beast's neck. Instead he came glowering in fury to the house and turned on Ursula. "'Why, you tiresome little monkey! Can't you even come to church without pulling the place to bits?' 
His voice was harsh and cat-like. He was blind to the child. She shrank away in childish anguish and dread. What was it? What awful thing was it? The mother turned with her calm, almost superb manner. What has she done, then? Done? She shall go in the church no more, pulling and littering and destroying. The wife slowly rolled her eyes and lowered her eyelids. What has she destroyed, then? He did not know. I've just had Mrs. Wilkinson at me, he cried, with a list of things she's done. Ursula withered under the contempt and anger of the she as he spoke of her. "'Send Mrs. Wilkinson here to me with a list of the things she's done,' said Anna. "'I am the one to hear that.' "'It's not the things the child has done,' continued the mother, "'that have put you out so much. "'It's because you can't bear being spoken to by that old woman. "'But you haven't the courage to turn on her when she attacks you. "'You bring your rage here.' "'He relapsed into silence. "'Ursula knew that he was wrong. "'In the outside upper world he was wrong.' Already came over the child the cold sense of the impersonal world. There she knew her mother was right, but still her heart clamored after her father, for him to be right, in his dark, sensuous underworld. But he was angry and went his way in blackness and brutal silence again. The child ran about absorbed in life, quiet, full of amusement. She did not notice things, nor changes, nor alterations. One day she would find daisies in the grass, another day apple blossoms would be sprinkled white on the ground, and she would run among it for pleasure because it was there. Yet again birds would be pecking at the cherries. Her father would throw cherries down from the tree all round her on the garden. Then the fields were full of hay. She did not remember what had been nor what would be. The outside things were there each day. She was always herself. The world outside was accidental. Even her mother was accidental to her, a condition that happened to endure. Only her father occupied any permanent position in the childish consciousness. When he came back, she remembered vaguely how he had gone away. When he went away, she knew vaguely that she must wait for his coming back. Whereas her mother, returning from an outing, merely became present, there was no reason for connecting her with some previous departure. The return or the departure of the father was the one event which the child remembered. When he came, something woke up in her, some yearning. She knew when he was out of joint or irritable or tired, then she was uneasy, she could not rest. When he was in the house, the child felt full and warm, rich like a creature in the sunshine. When he was gone, she was vague, forgetful. When he scolded her even, she was often more aware of him than of herself. He was her strength and her greater self. Ursula was three years old when another baby girl was born. Then the two small sisters were much together, Gudrun and Ursula. Gudrun was a quiet child who played for hours alone, absorbed in her fancies. She was brown-haired, fair-skinned, strangely placid, almost passive, yet her will was indomitable, once set. From the first she followed Ursula's lead. Yet she was a thing to herself, so that to watch the two together was strange. They were like two young animals playing together, but not taking real notice of each other. Gudrun was the mother's favorite, except that Anna always lived in her latest baby. The burden of so many lives depending on him wore the youth down. He had his work in the office, which was done purely by effort of will. He had his barren passion for the church. He had three young children— also at this time his health was not good, so he was haggard and irritable, often a pest in the house. Then he was told to go to his woodwork, or to the church. Between him and the little Ursula there came into being a strange alliance. They were aware of each other. He knew the child was always on his side, but in his consciousness he counted it for nothing. She was always for him. He took it for granted. Yet his life was based on her, even whilst she was a tiny child, on her support and her accord. Anna continued in her violent trance of motherhood, always busy, often harassed, but always contained in her trance of motherhood. She seemed to exist in her own violent fruitfulness, and it was as if the sun shone tropically on her. Her color was bright, her eyes full of a fecund gloom, her brown hair tumbled loosely over her ears. She had a look of richness, 
No responsibility, no sense of duty troubled her. The outside public life was less than nothing to her, really. Whereas, when at twenty-six he found himself father of four children, with a wife who lived intrinsically like the ruddiest lilies of the field, he let the weight of responsibility press on him and drag him. It was then that his child Ursula strove to be with him. She was with him, even as a baby of four, when he was irritable and shouted and made the household unhappy. She suffered from his shouting, but somehow it was not really him. She wanted it to be over. She wanted to resume her normal connection with him. When he was disagreeable, the child echoed to the crying of some need in him, and she responded blindly. Her heart followed him as if he had some tie with her, and some love which she could not deliver. Her heart followed him persistently in its love. But there was the dim childish sense of her own smallness and inadequacy, a fatal sense of worthlessness. She could not do anything. She was not enough. She could not be important to him. This knowledge deadened her from the first. Still, she set towards him like a quivering needle. All her life was directed by her awareness of him, her wakefulness to his being, and she was against her mother. Her father was the dawn wherein her consciousness woke up, but for him she might have gone on like the other children, Gudrun and Teresa and Catherine, one with the flowers and insects and playthings, having no existence apart from the concrete object of her attention. But her father came too near to her. The clasp of his hands and the power of his breast woke her up almost in pain from the transient unconsciousness of childhood. Wide-eyed, unseeing, she was awake before she knew how to see. She was wakened too soon. Too soon the call had come to her, when she was a small baby and her father held her close to his breast, her sleep-living heart was beaten into wakefulness by the striving of his bigger heart, by his clasping her to his body for love and for fulfillment, asking as a magnet must always ask. From her the response had struggled dimly, vaguely, into being. The children were dressed roughly for the country. When she was little, Ursula pattered about in little wooden clogs, a blue overall over her thick red dress, a red shawl crossed on her breast and tied behind again. So she ran with her father to the garden. The household rose early. He was out digging by six o'clock in the morning. He went to his work at half-past eight, and Ursula was usually in the garden with him, though not near at hand. At Easter time one year she helped him to set potatoes. It was the first time she had ever helped him. The occasion remained as a picture, one of her earliest memories. They had gone out soon after dawn. A cold wind was blowing. He had his old trousers tucked into his boots. He wore no coat nor waistcoat. His shirt sleeves fluttered in the wind. His face was ruddy and intent in a kind of sleep. When he was at work he neither heard nor saw. A long, thin man, looking still a youth, with a line of black moustache above his thick mouth, and his fine hair blown on his forehead, he worked away at the earth in the grey first light alone. His solitariness drew the child like a spell. The wind came chill over the dark green fields. Ursula ran up and watched him push the setting peg in at one side of his ready earth, stride across, and push it in the other side, pulling the line taut and clear upon the clods intervening. Then, with a sharp cutting noise, the bright spade came towards her, cutting a grip into the new soft earth. He struck his spade upright and straightened himself. "'Do you want to help me?' he said. She looked up at him from out of her little woolen bonnet. "'Eh,' hey, he said, "'you can put some taters in for me. "'Look, like that, these little sprits standing up, so much apart, you see?' and stooping down he quickly, surely, placed the spritted potatoes in the soft grip where they rested separate and pathetic on the heavy cold earth. He gave her a little basket of potatoes and strode himself to the other end of the line. She saw him stooping, working towards her. She was excited and unused. She put in one potato, then rearranged it to make it sit nicely. Some of the sprits were broken, and she was afraid. 
The responsibility excited her like a string tying her up. She could not help looking with dread at the string buried under the heaped-back soil. Her father was working nearer, stooping, working nearer. She was overcome by her responsibility. She put potatoes quickly into the cold earth. He came near. Not so close, he said, stooping over her potatoes, taking some out and rearranging the others. She stood by with the painful, terrified helplessness of childhood. He was so unseeing and confident. She wanted to do the thing, and yet she could not. She stood by, looking on, her little blue overall fluttering in the wind, the red woolen ends of her shawl blowing gustily. Then he went down the row relentlessly, turning the potatoes in with his sharp spade cuts. He took no notice of her, only worked on. He had another world from hers. She stood helplessly stranded on his world. He continued his work. She knew she could not help him. A little bit forlorn at last, she turned away and ran down the garden, away from him, as fast as she could go away from him, to forget him and his work. He missed her presence, her face in her red woolen bonnet, her blue overall fluttering. She ran to where a little water ran trickling between grass and stones. That she loved. When he came by, he said to her, "'You didn't help me much.' The child looked at him dumbly. Already her heart was heavy because of her own disappointment. Her mouth was dumb and pathetic, but he did not notice. He went his way. And she played on, because of her disappointment persisting even the more in her play. She dreaded work, because she could not do it as he did it. She was conscious of the great breach between them. She knew she had no power. The grown-up power to work deliberately was a mystery to her. He would smash into her sensitive child's world destructively. Her mother was lenient, careless. The children played about as they would all day. Ursula was thoughtless. Why should she remember things? If across the garden she saw the hedge had budded, and if she wanted these greeny, pink, tiny buds for bread and cheese to play at tea-party with, over she went for them. Then suddenly, perhaps the next day, her soul would almost start out of her body as her father turned on her, shouting, "'Who's been trampling and dancing across where I've just sowed seed? I know it's you, nuisance. Can you find nowhere else to walk but just over my seed beds? But it's like you, that is, no heed but to follow your own greedy nose.' It had shocked him in his intent world to see the zigzagging lines of deep little footprints across his work. The child was infinitely more shocked. Her vulnerable little soul was flayed and trampled. Why were the footprints there? She had not wanted to make them. She stood dazzled with pain and shame and unreality. Her soul, her consciousness, seemed to die away. She became shut off and senseless, a little fixed creature whose soul had gone hard and unresponsive. The sense of her own unreality hardened her like a frost. She cared no longer. And the sight of her face, shut and superior with self-asserting indifference, made a flame of rage go over him. He wanted to break her. "'I'll break your obstinate little face,' he said, through shut teeth, lifting his hand. The child did not alter in the least. The look of indifference, complete glancing indifference, as if nothing but herself existed to her, remained fixed. Yet far away in her the sobs were tearing her soul— and when he had gone she would go and creep under the parlour sofa and lie clinched in the silent, hidden misery of childhood. When she crawled out, after an hour or so, she went rather stiffly to play. She willed to forget. She cut off her childish soul from memory so that the pain and the insult should not be real. She asserted herself only. There was not nothing in the world but her own self. So very soon she came to believe in the outward malevolence that was against her, and very early she learned that even her adored father was part of this malevolence, and very early she learned to harden her soul in resistance and denial of all that was outside her, harden herself upon her own being. She never felt sorry for what she had done. She never forgave those who had made her guilty. If he had said to her, "'Why, Ursula, did you trample my carefully made bed?' That would have hurt her to the quick, and she would have done anything for him. 
but she was always tormented by the unreality of outside things. The earth was to walk on. Why must she avoid a certain patch just because it was called a seed-bed? It was the earth to walk on. This was her instinctive assumption, and when he bullied her she became hard, cut herself off from all connection, lived in the little separate world of her own violent will. End of chapter 8, part 1《She was always relapsing on her own violent will into her own separate world of herself. This made him grind his teeth with bitterness, for he still wanted her. But she could harden herself into her own self's universe, impregnable. He was very fond of swimming, and in warm weather would take her down to the canal, to a silent place, or to a big pond or reservoir, to bathe. He would take her on his back as he went swimming, and she clung close, feeling his strong movement under her, so strong as if it would uphold all the world. Then he taught her to swim. She was a fearless little thing when he dared her, and he had a curious craving to frighten her, to see what she would do with him. He said, would she ride on his back whilst he jumped off the canal bridge down into the water beneath? She would. He loved to feel the naked child clinging on to his shoulders. There was a curious fight between their two wills. He mounted the parapet of the canal bridge. The water was a long way down, but the child had a deliberate will set upon his. She held herself fixed to him. He leapt, and down they went. The crash of the water as they went under struck through the child's small body with a sort of unconsciousness. But she remained fixed. And when they came up again, and when they went to the bank, and when they sat on the grass side by side, he laughed and said it was fine, and the dark dilated eyes of the child looked at him wonderingly, darkly, wondering from the shock, yet reserved and unfathomable. So he laughed almost with a sob. In a moment she was clinging safely on his back again, and he was swimming in deep water. She was used to his nakedness and to her mother's nakedness ever since she was born. They were clinging to each other and making up to each other for the strange blow that had been struck at them. Yet still, on other days, he would leap again with her from the bridge, daringly, almost wickedly, till at length, as he leapt once, she dropped forward on to his head and nearly broke his neck, so that they fell into the water in a heap and fought for a few moments with death. He saved her and sat on the bank quivering, but his eyes were full of the blackness of death, it was as if death had cut between their two lives and separated them. Still, they were not separate. There was this curious, taunting intimacy between them. When the fair came, she wanted to go in the swing boats. He took her, and standing up in the boat, holding on to the irons, began to drive higher, perilously higher. The child clung fast on her seat. "'Do you want to go any higher?' he said to her. And she laughed with her mouth, her eyes wide and dilated. They were rushing through the air. Yes, she said, feeling as if she would turn into vapor, lose hold of everything and melt away. The boat swung far up, then down like a stone, only to be caught sickeningly up again. Any higher, he called, looking at her over his shoulder, his face evil and beautiful to her. She laughed with white lips. He sent the swing-boat sweeping through the air in a great semicircle till it jerked and swayed at the high horizontal. The child clung on, pale, her eyes fixed on him. People below were calling. The jerk at the top had almost shaken them both out. He had done what he could, and he was attracting censure. He sat down and let the swing-boat swing itself out. People in the crowd cried shame on him as he came out of the swing-boat. He laughed. The child clung to his hand, pale and mute. In a while she was violently sick. He gave her lemonade, and she gulped a little. "'Don't tell your mother you've been sick,' he said. 
There was no need to ask that. When she got home, the child crept away under the parlor sofa like a sick little animal, and was a long time before she crawled out. But Anna got to know of this escapade, and was passionately angry and contemptuous of him. His golden-brown eyes glittered. He had a strange, cruel little smile, and as the child watched him, for the first time in her life a disillusion came over her, something cold and isolating. She went over to her mother. Her soul was dead towards him. It made her sick. Still she forgot, and continued to love him, but ever more coldly. He was at this time, when he was about twenty-eight years old, strange and violent in his being, sensual. He acquired some power over Anna, over everybody he came into contact with. After a long bout of hostility, Anna at last closed with him. She had now four children, all girls. For seven years she had been absorbed in wifehood and motherhood. For years he had gone on beside her, never really encroaching upon her. Then gradually another self seemed to assert its being within him. He was still silent and separate, but she could feel him all the while coming near upon her, as if his breast and his body were threatening her, and he was always coming closer. Gradually he became indifferent of responsibility. He would do what pleased him and no more. He began to go away from home. He went to Nottingham on Saturdays, always alone, to the football match and to the music hall, and all the time he was watching, in readiness. He never cared to drink, but with his hard golden-brown eyes, so keen, seeing with their tiny black pupils, he watched all the people, everything that happened, and he waited. In the Empire one evening he sat next to two girls. He was aware of the one beside him. She was rather small common, with a fresh complexion and an upper lip that lifted from her teeth, so that when she was not conscious her mouth was slightly open, and her lips pressed outwards in a kind of blind appeal. She was strongly aware of the man next to her, so that all her body was still, very still. Her face watched the stage, her arms went down into her lap, very self-conscious and still. A gleam lit up in him. Should he begin with her? Should he begin with her to live the other, the unadmitted life of his desire? Why not? He had always been so good. Save for his wife, he was a virgin. And why, when all women were different? Why, when he would only live once? He wanted the other life. His own life was barren, not enough. He wanted the other. Her open mouth, showing the small, irregular white teeth, appealed to him. It was open and ready. It was so vulnerable. Why should he not go in and enjoy what was there? The slim arm that went down so still and motionless to the lap, it was pretty. She would be small. He would be able almost to hold her in his two hands. She would be small, almost like a child, and pretty. Her childishness wetted him keenly. She would be helpless between his hands. That was the best turn we've had, he said to her, leaning over as he clapped his hands. He felt strong and unshakable in himself set over against all the world. His soul was keen and watchful, glittering with a kind of amusement. He was perfectly self-contained. He was himself, the absolute. The rest of the world was the object that should contribute to his being. The girl started, turned round. Her eyes lit up with an almost painful flash of a smile. The color came deeply in her cheeks. "'Yes, it was,' she said quite meaninglessly and she covered her rather prominent teeth with her lips. Then she sat looking straight before her, seeing nothing, only conscious of the color burning in her cheeks. It pricked him with a pleasant sensation. His veins and his nerves attended to her. She was so young and palpitating. "'It's not such a good program as last week's,' he said. Again she half turned her face to him, and her clear bright eyes, bright like shallow water, filled with light, frightened, yet involuntarily lighting and shaking with response. "'Oh, isn't it? I wasn't able to come last week.' He noted the common accent. It pleased him. He knew what class she came of. Probably she was a warehouse lass. He was glad she was a common girl. He proceeded to tell her about the last week's program. She answered at random, very confusedly. The color burnt in her cheek. Yet she always answered him. The girl on the other side sat remotely, obviously silent. He ignored her. All his address was for his own girl, 
with her bright shallow eyes and her vulnerably opened mouth. The talk went on, meaningless and random on her part, quite deliberate and purposive on his. It was a pleasure to him to make this conversation, an activity pleasant as a fine game of chance and skill. He was very quiet and pleasant-humoured, but so full of strength. She fluttered beside his steady pressure of warmth and his surety. He saw the performance drawing to a close. His senses were alert and willful. He would press his advantages. He followed her and her plain friend down the stairs to the street. It was raining. "'It's a nasty night,' he said. "'Shall you come and have a drink of something? A cup of coffee? It's early yet.' "'Oh, I don't think so,' she said, looking away into the night. "'I wish you would,' he said, putting himself, as it were, at her mercy. There was a moment's pause. "'Come to Rollins?' he said. "'No, not there.' "'To Carson's, then.' There was a silence. The other girl hung on. The man was the centre of positive force. "'Will your friend come as well?' There was another moment of silence, while the other girl felt her ground. "'No, thanks,' she said. "'I've promised to meet a friend.' "'Another time, then,' he said. "'Oh, thanks,' she replied. "'Very awkward.' "'Good night,' he said. "'See you later,' said his girl to her friend. "'Where?' said the friend. "'You know, Gertie,' replied his girl. "'All right, Jenny.' The friend was gone into the darkness. He turned with his girl to the tea-shop. They talked all the time. He made his sentences in sheer almost muscular pleasure of exercising himself with her. He was looking at her all the time, perceiving her, appreciating her, finding her out, gratifying himself with her. He could see distinct attractions in her. Her eyebrows, with their particular curve, gave him keen aesthetic pleasure. Later on he would see her bright, pellucid eyes, like shallow water, and know those— and there remained the open, exposed mouth, red and vulnerable, that he reserved as yet. And all the while his eyes were on the girl, estimating and handling with pleasure her young softness. About the girl herself, who or what she was, he cared nothing. He was quite unaware that she was anybody. She was just the sensual object of his attention. "'Shall we go, then?' he said. She rose in silence, as if acting without a mind, merely physically— he seemed to hold her in his will. Outside it was still raining. "'Let's have a walk,' he said. "'I don't mind the rain. Do you?' "'No, I don't mind it,' she said. He was alert in every sense and fibre, and yet quite sure and steady and lit up, as if transfused. He had a free sensation of walking in his own darkness, not in anybody else's world at all. He was purely a world to himself. He had nothing to do with any general consciousness— just his own senses were supreme. All the rest was external, insignificant, leaving him alone with this girl whom he wanted to absorb, whose properties he wanted to absorb into his own senses. He did not care about her, except that he wanted to overcome her resistance, to have her in his power, fully and exhaustedly to enjoy her. They turned into the dark streets. He held her umbrella over her and put his arm round her. She walked as if she were unaware— but gradually, as he walked, he drew her a little closer, into the movement of his side and hip. She fitted in there very well. It was a real good fit to walk with her like this. It made him exquisitely aware of his own muscular self, and his hand that grasped her side felt one curve of her, and it seemed like a new creation to him, a reality, an absolute, an existing tangible beauty of the absolute. It was like a star— Everything in him was absorbed in the sensual delight of this one small firm curve in her body that his hand and his whole being had lighted upon. He led her into the park, where it was almost dark. He noticed a corner between two walls under a great overhanging bush of ivy. "'Let us stand here a minute,' he said. He put down the umbrella and followed her into the corner, retreating out of the rain. He needed no eyes to see— all he wanted was to know through touch. She was like a piece of palpable darkness. He found her in the darkness, put his arms round her and his hands upon her. She was silent and inscrutable, but he did not want to know anything about her. He only wanted to discover her, 
and through her clothing what absolute beauty he touched. "'Take your hat off,' he said. Silently, obediently, she shook off her hat and gave herself to his arms again. He liked her. He liked the feel of her. He wanted to know her more closely. He let his fingers subtly seek out her cheek and neck. What amazing beauty and pleasure in the dark! His fingers had often touched Anna on the face and neck like that. What matter? It was one man who touched Anna, another who now touched this girl. He liked best his new self. He was given over altogether to the sensuous knowledge of this woman, and every moment he seemed to be touching absolute beauty, something beyond knowledge. Very close, marveling, and exceedingly joyful in their discoveries, his hands pressed upon her so subtly, so seekingly, so finely and desirously searching her out, that she too was almost swooning in the absolute of sensual knowledge. In utter sensual delight she clenched her knees, her thighs, her loins together. It was an added beauty to him. But he was patiently working for her relaxation. Patiently, his whole being fixed in the smile of latent gratification, his whole body electric with a subtle, powerful, reducing force upon her. So he came at length to kiss her, and she was almost betrayed by his insidious kiss. Her open mouth was too helpless and unguarded. He knew this, and his first kiss was very gentle and soft and assuring, so assuring, so that her soft, defenseless mouth became assured, even bold, seeking upon his mouth. And he answered her gradually, gradually, his soft kiss sinking in softly, softly, but ever more heavily, more heavily yet, till it was too heavy for her to meet, and she began to sink under it. She was sinking, sinking. His smile of latent gratification was becoming more tense. He was sure of her. He let the whole force of his will sink upon her to sweep her away. But it was too great a shock for her. With a sudden horrible movement she ruptured the state that contained them both. Don't! Don't! It was a rather horrible cry that seemed to come out of her, not to belong to her. It was some strange agony of terror crying out the words. There was something vibrating and beside herself in the noise. His nerves ripped like silk. "'What's the matter?' he said, as if calmly. "'What's the matter?' She came back to him, but trembling, reservedly this time. Her cry had given him gratification, but he knew he had been too sudden for her. He was now careful. For a while he merely sheltered her. Also there had broken a flaw into his perfect will— he wanted to persist, to begin again, to lead up to the point where he had let himself go on her, and then manage more carefully, successfully. So far she had won, and the battle was not over yet. But another voice woke in him and prompted him to let her go, let her go in contempt. He sheltered her and soothed her and caressed her and kissed her, and again began to come nearer, nearer. He gathered himself together. Even if he did not take her, he would make her relax. He would fuse away her resistance. So softly, softly, with infinite caressiveness, he kissed her, and the whole of his being seemed to fondle her, till at the verge, swooning at the breaking point, there came from her a beaten, inarticulate, moaning cry, Don't! Oh, don't! His veins fused with extreme voluptuousness. For a moment he almost lost control of himself and continued automatically, but there was a moment of inaction, of cold suspension. He was not going to take her. He drew her to him and soothed her and caressed her, but the pure zest had gone. She struggled to herself and realized he was not going to take her, and then, at the very last moment when his fondling had come near again, his hot living desire despising her against his cold sensual desire, she broke violently away from him. "'Don't!' she cried, harsh now with hatred, and she flung her hand across and hit him violently. "'Keep off of me!' His blood stood still for a moment. Then the smile came again within him, steady, cruel. "'Why, what's the matter?' he said, with suave irony. "'Nobody's going to hurt you. "'I know what you want,' she said. "'I know what I want,' he said. "'What's the odds?' "'Well, you're not going to have it off me, aren't I? "'Well, then I'm not. "'It's no use crying about it, is it?' 
"'No, it isn't,' said the girl, rather disconcerted by his irony. "'But there's no need to have a row about it. "'We can kiss good-night just the same, can't we?' "'She was silent in the darkness. "'Or do you want your hat and umbrella to go home this minute?' "'Still she was silent. "'He watched her dark figure as she stood there on the edge of the faint darkness, "'and he waited. "'Come and say good-night nicely, if we're going to say it,' he said. "'Still she did not stir.' He put his hand out and drew her into the darkness again. "'It's warmer in here,' he said, "'a lot cozier. His will had not yet relaxed from her. The moment of hatred exhilarated him. "'I'm going now,' she muttered, as he closed his hand over her. "'See how well you fit your place,' he said, as he drew her to her previous position, close upon him. "'What do you want to leave it for?' and gradually the intoxication invaded him again. The zest came back. After all, why should he not take her? But she did not yield to him entirely. "'Are you a married man?' she asked at length. "'What if I am?' he said. She did not answer. "'I don't ask you whether you're married or not,' he said. "'You know jolly well I'm not,' she answered hotly. "'Oh, if she could only break away from him, if only she need not yield to him.' At length her will became cold against him. She had escaped, but she hated him for her escape more than for her danger. Did he despise her so coldly? And she was in torture of adherence to him still. "'Shall I see you next week, Saturday?' he said, as they returned to the town. She did not answer. "'Come to the Empire with me, you and Gertie,' he said. "'I should look well going with a married man,' she said. "'I'm no less of a man for being married, am I?' he said." "'Oh, it's a different matter altogether with a married man,' she said, in a ready-made speech that showed her chagrin. "'How's that?' he asked. But she would not enlighten him. Yet she promised, without promising, to be at the meeting-place next Saturday evening. So he left her. He did not know her name. He caught a train and went home. It was the last train. He was very late. He was not home till midnight, but he was quite indifferent.' He had no real relation with his home, not this man which he now was. Anna was sitting up for him. She saw the queer, absolved look on his face, a sort of latent, almost sinister smile, as if he were absolved from his good ties. "'Where have you been?' she asked, puzzled, interested. "'To the Empire. Who with?' "'By myself. I came home with Tom Cooper.' She looked at him and wondered what he had been doing. She was indifferent as to whether he lied or not. "'You have come home very strange,' she said, and there was an appreciative inflection in the speech. He was not affected. As for his humble good self, he was absolved from it. He sat down and ate heartily. He was not tired. He seemed to take no notice of her. For Anna the moment was critical. She kept herself aloof and watched him. He talked to her, but with a little indifference, since he was scarcely aware of her. So then she did not affect him. Here was a new turn of affairs. He was rather attractive, nevertheless. She liked him better than the ordinary mute, half-effaced, half-subdued man she usually knew him to be. So he was blossoming out into his real self. It piqued her. Very good. Let him blossom. She liked a new turn of affairs. He was a strange man come home to her. Glancing at him, she saw she could not reduce him to what he had been before. In an instant she gave it up, yet not without a pang of rage which would insist on their old beloved love, their old accustomed intimacy, and her old established supremacy. She almost rose up to fight for them, and looking at him and remembering his father, she was wary. This was the new turn of affairs. Very good. If she could not influence him in the old way, she would be level with him in the new. Her old defiant hostility came up. Very good. She too was out on her own adventure. Her voice, her manner changed. She was ready for the game. Something was liberated in her. She liked him. She liked this strange man come home to her. He was very welcome indeed. She was very glad to welcome a stranger. She had been bored by the old husband. To his latent cruel smile she replied with brilliant challenge. He expected her to keep the moral fortress. Not she. It was much too dull a part. She challenged him back with a sort of radiance, very bright and free opposite to him. 
He looked at her, and his eyes glinted. She, too, was out in the field. His senses pricked up and keenly attended to her. She laughed, perfectly indifferent and loose as he was. He came towards her. She neither rejected him nor responded to him. In a kind of radiance, superb in her inscrutability, she laughed before him. She, too, could throw everything overboard. Love, intimacy, responsibility. What were her four children to her now? What did it matter that this man was the father of her four children? He was the sensual male seeking his pleasure. She was the female ready to take hers, but in her own way. A man could turn into a free lance. So then could a woman. She adhered as little as he to the moral world. All that had gone before was nothing to her. She was another woman, under the instance of a strange man. He was a stranger to her, seeking his own ends. Very good. She wanted to see what the stranger would do now, what he was. She laughed and kept him at arm's length, whilst apparently ignoring him. She watched him undress as if he were a stranger. Indeed, he was a stranger to her. And she roused him profoundly, violently, even before he touched her. The little creature in Nottingham had but been leading up to this. They abandoned in one motion the moral position. Each was seeking gratification, pure and simple. Strange his wife was to him. It was as if he were a perfect stranger, as if she were infinitely and essentially strange to him, the other half of the world, the dark half of the moon. She waited for his touch, as if he were a marauder who had come in, infinitely unknown and desirable to her, and he began to discover her. He had an inkling of the vastness of the unknown sensual store of delights she was, with a passion of voluptuousness that made him dwell on each tiny beauty in a kind of frenzy of enjoyment he lit upon her, her beauty, the beauties, the separate several beauties of her body. He was quite ousted from himself and sensually transported by that which he discovered in her, he was another man reveling over her. There was no tenderness, no love between them any more, only the maddening sensuous lust for discovery and the insatiable exorbitant gratification in the sensual beauties of her body. And she was a store, a store of absolute beauties that it drove him to contemplate. There was such a feast to enjoy, and he with only one man's capacity. He lived in a passion of sensual discovery with her for some time. It was a duel. No love, no words, no kisses even, only the maddening perception of beauty consummate, absolute through touch. He wanted to touch her, to discover her. Maddeningly, he wanted to know her. Yet he must not hurry, or he missed everything. He must enjoy one beauty at a time, and the multitudinous beauties of her body, the many little rapturous places, sent him mad with delight, and with desire to be able to know more, to have strength to know more, for all was there. He would say during the daytime, "'Tonight I shall know the little hollow under her ankle where the blue vein crosses,' and the thought of it and the desire for it made a thick darkness of anticipation. He would go all the day waiting for the night to come, when he could give himself to the enjoyment of some luxurious absolute of beauty in her. The thought of the hidden resources of her— the undiscovered beauties and ecstatic places of delight in her body, waiting, only waiting for him to discover them, sent him slightly insane. He was obsessed. If he did not discover and make known to himself these delights, they might be lost for ever. He wished he had a hundred men's energies with which to enjoy her. He wished he were a cat to lick her with a rough, grating, lascivious tongue. He wanted to wallow in her, bury himself in her flesh, cover himself over with her flesh. And she, separate, with a strange, dangerous, glistening look in her eyes, received all his activities upon her, as if they were expected by her, and provoked him, when he was quiet, to more, till sometimes he was ready to perish for sheer inability to be satisfied of her, inability to have had enough of her. Their children became mere offspring to them, they lived in the darkness and death of their own sensual activities. Sometimes he felt he was going mad with a sense of absolute beauty, perceived by him in her through his senses. It was something too much for him, and in everything was the same almost sinister, terrifying beauty. 
but in the revelations of her body, through contact with his body, was the ultimate beauty, to know which was almost death in itself, and yet for the knowledge of which he would have undergone endless torture. He would have forfeited anything, anything, rather than forgo his right even to the instep of her foot, and the place from which the toes radiated out, the little miraculous white plain from which ran the little hillocks of the toes, and the folded dimpling hollows between the toes, he felt he would have died rather than forfeit this. This was what their love had become, a sensuality, violent and extreme as death. They had no conscious intimacy, no tenderness of love. It was all the lust and the infinite maddening intoxication of the sense, a passion of death. He had always, all his life, had a secret dread of absolute beauty. It had always been like a fetish to him, something to fear, really, for it was immoral and against mankind. So he had turned to the Gothic form, which always asserted the broken desire of mankind in its pointed arches, escaping the rolling absolute beauty of the round arch. But now he had given way, and with infinite sensual violence gave himself to the realization of this supreme, immoral, absolute beauty in the body of woman. It seemed to him that it came to being in the body of woman, under his touch. Under his touch, even under his sight. It was there, but when he neither saw nor touched the perfect place, it was not perfect, it was not there, and he must make it exist. But still the thing terrified him. Awful and threatening it was, dangerous to a degree, even whilst he gave himself to it. It was pure darkness also. All the shameful things of the body revealed themselves to him now with a sort of sinister tropical beauty. All the shameful natural and unnatural acts of sensual voluptuousness which he and the woman partook of together, created together, they had their heavy beauty and their delight. Shame? What was it? It was part of extreme delight. It was that part of delight of which man is usually afraid. Why afraid? The secret shameful things are most terribly beautiful. They accepted shame and were one with it in their most unlicensed pleasures. It was incorporated. It was a bud that blossomed into beauty and heavy fundamental gratification. Their outward life went on much the same, but the inward life was revolutionized. The children became less important. The parents were absorbed in their own living. And gradually Brangwen began to find himself free to attend to the outside life as well. His intimate life was so violently active that it set another man in him free, and this new man turned with interest to public life to see what part he could take in it. This would give him scope for new activity, activity of a kind for which he was now created and released. He wanted to be unanimous with the whole of purposive mankind. At this time education was in the forefront as a subject of interest. There was a talk of new Swedish methods, of handwork instruction, and so on. Brangwen embraced sincerely the idea of handwork in schools. For the first time he began to take real interest in a public affair. He had at length, from his profound sensual activity, developed a real purposive self. There was talk of night schools and of handicraft classes. He wanted to start a woodwork class in Cossete to teach carpentry and joinery and wood carving to the village boys two nights a week. This seemed to him a supremely desirable thing to be doing. His pay would be very little, and when he had it he spent it all on extra wood and tools, but he was very happy and keen in his new public spirit. He started his night classes in woodwork when he was thirty years old. By this time he had five children, the last a boy. But boy or girl mattered very little to him. He had a natural blood affection for his children, and he liked them as they turned up, boys or girls, only he was fondest of Ursula. Somehow she seemed to be at the back of his new night school venture. The house by the yew-trees was in connection with the great human endeavor at last. It gained a new vigor thereby. To Ursula, a child of eight, the increase in magic was considerable. She heard all the talk. She saw the parish room fitted up as a workshop. The parish room was a high stone, barn-like ecclesiastical building, standing away by itself in the Brangwen's second garden across the lane. 
She was always attracted by its age and its stranded obsoleteness. Now she watched preparations made. She sat on the flight of stone steps that came down from the porch to the garden, and heard her father and the vicar talking and planning and working. Then an inspector came, a very strange man, and stayed talking with her father all one evening. Everything was settled, and twelve boys enrolled their names. It was very exciting. But to Ursula everything her father did was magic. Whether he came from Ilkston with news of the town, whether he went across to the church with his music or his tools on a sunny evening, whether he sat in his white surplice at the organ on Sundays, leading the singing with his strong tenor voice, or whether he were in the workshop with the boys, he was always a centre of magic and fascination to her. His voice, sounding out in command, cheerful, laconic, had always a twang in it that sent a thrill over her blood and hypnotized her. She seemed to run in the shadow of some dark, potent secret of which she would not, of whose existence even she dared not, become conscious. It cast such a spell over her, and so darkened her mind. End of chapter 8